And then you saw, then you went in the house and saw Mr. Depp in the foyer, correct? Yes, correct. And Mr. Depp was trying to urinate in the foyer, wasn't he? No. You didn't know what could cause damage to Mr. Depp's hand while you were there on March 8th, correct? Dr. Kipper told me he sustained an injury on uh, one of his well, fingers. Well, uh, objection, hears, hearsay. Wait, you, you asked the question. But I remember, I'm gonna tell the whole story, how they got there. But before they got it, they went and get the keys, they come down, they say, somebody tried to get into my unit, they scratch on my door, and say, and like, oh, um, I'm really sorry, but who will think it's gonna get into your unit because there's still some scratches on the door, like, your lies have been exposed to the world multiple times, right? I haven't lied about anything I've been here to say. Again, I've heard a lot of people say a lot of things to be involved in the Johnny Depp show, but he wasn't there. He doesn't know. And he certainly doesn't know what happened behind closed doors. Hello and welcome back to Wish for Death Island, Population Me. And this time, I think this is my longest and wildest video to date. This is some mental shit. So basically, we're going through the entire trial and the gory details of the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp fiasco. I know this video is absolutely not going to be monetized and YouTube has age-restricted some random videos of mine recently, so I have no shame in shilling basically everything I have after making this behemoth and I don't do sponsors on this channel, so I kind of have to. Shit's at Linked in the description as per usual, and the pinned comment if you want to check out some happy mail via Patreon and the crafts that I do, which I also post on my shop channel. I do a lot of book binding and I sell a lot of the books that I make. The Patreon happy mails every month, including uh, October, I'm doing some spooky boxes for the store and for all the magical mail patrons. The footage in this video is a mix of me doing different things so that it's more interesting like, visually to watch and I can't just use a lot of court footage because it gets copyright claimed so I'm going to be pulling up clips for the footage that I need to mention of course, but other than that it's just going to be other random shit. Also quick update, in the middle of working on this video a house fire <laughs> happened um you can see my community posts for pictures and what the happenings and whatnot but regardless the video got delayed a lot and i'm back to normal now i haven't replaced everything but i'll get through it just kind of explaining why there was such a big delay and stuff like that anyways let's go so the best way to talk about this case is i think to actually talk about it as the trial unfolds it the interesting thing about having the full access of court footage is that you really get to see all of the stumbles and the different quirks that each person has when they do a long testimony on the stand. Whether it be people who are going completely mental, who probably are on meth, to people that openly cry because they really care about the people involved so much and the only human response to all of this overwhelming emotion is to weep a little bit. Really, I think I would be doing the story a disservice, including the voices of those involved, if I tried to even attempt to summarize any of this at the beginning. So, we're going to begin with day one of 24. On the first day, we have opening statements. Here, we see the people involved and the lawyers that you learn to love or hate. Amber Heard looks stone-faced, but in a way that looks forced. She has this kind of constipated and serious face, and over the course of the trial, she'll try her best to maintain this. Even though she clearly is about to laugh or look confused at certain points, she quickly pulls the mask back on. I guess it's something her PR team told her to do, but I don't think it really helps. In contrast, Johnny doesn't seem to give much of a shit and just smiles or laughs and scribbles or whatever else. He doesn't seem to have that much of a filter. Though I don't either, so I guess I can sympathize. This is a defamation trial. Amber made a lot of false allegations and it ruined Johnny's career. It cost him money, jobs, relationships, whatever else, and he is suing her for this. However, defamation trials are notoriously difficult. We are also going to learn the various tactics at play to try and either undermine this or at least try and get something through. Especially a factor about lying. See, you can have proof that the person wasn't telling the truth, but in something like a defamation trial, you specifically need proof that they knew they weren't telling the truth. They could always say that they were deluded into thinking that this is actually true and they were just reporting on the truth, but with someone like Amber, you really need to pin down that she knew she was lying and she was specifically lying about this. It's not impossible because, hey, spoilers, he wins the trial, but it's certainly difficult. Especially since you have the jury watching you. 
A lot of people who watch these cases seem to forget that, and it is easy to forget. We aren't supposed to be looking at them, we're supposed to be taking in the case, looking at the people and the lawyers. But remember, everything that you end up thinking, maybe the jury were thinking the same thing at the time. During the opening statements, Amber has this kind of smug look on her face. She tries to hide it sometimes, but it flickers across her features regardless. Like, her expressions are bubbling beneath the surface and push upwards when they reach a certain intensity that she's really trying to keep down. I don't really know what she's thinking, even during the testimony that comes up later. It's impossible to know what she's actually feeling, but whoever told her to keep this look up really isn't doing a good job. Two things to note in the op-ed that this defamation trial is about is that Amber defamed Johnny without using his name, but with using identifiers that are pretty clear at who she's talking about. But also, this came out right as Aquaman did, the movie that she had her starring role in. Amber also then got a restraining order on May 21st, when Depp had left on a tour so he wasn't there in the area, and he was also recently dealing with the death of his mother. He couldn't be there in court for it. And because of the allegations that came out at this time as well, she also picked this time to call 911 for her injuries. Officers later testify that they found nothing. A key point is that when she was in an elevator with her sister Whitney and laughed along as Whitney pretended to punch her, I don't think she knew that that was being recorded. Someone who was as traumatized and scared as she claims to be clearly would not do that. Like I said, these are only a few of the details, maybe like 5% of them, but I think that these specific ones are good to have up front, so you can know about them going in. As the opening statements start, we have Johnny's lawyers, a male and a female lawyer, who are the main ones in this case. Both of their microphones are really crappy, and I'm sorry, but if I had to deal with 120 plus hours of crappy audio, you're gonna have to deal with some of it too, okay? As they start reading the statements as well, there's already objections coming from the third team over there, as I'll call them. One of them was to something that Ben Chu said about Johnny never having any other allegations against women in his life besides Amber. With a woman. He had been in other long-term relationships. He had children. <laughs> okay. They're already off with an objection during opening statements. This is great. I wonder what the uh, what the objection is to him never having been accused of uh, violence against a woman. I wonder. I wonder what they're going. <laughs> what possible possible objection they could have to him saying that? Johnny's lawyer hands off to the female lawyer Camille Vasquez. Her mic is the worst thing ever. I'm sorry. With her, and even though he was a megastar, they had a quiet domestic life. In fact, she then goes into how he had a hard working life and loved his mom dearly even though she abused him so. From there, he learned to treat women well. And we're also gonna hear from some of his exes. He'd often run away because he wanted to try and de-escalate an argument and he would never try to react physically. The best thing to do for him was to hide in the bathroom or just leave the room entirely. She also brings up fake injuries that Amber took pictures of. And this is a very important thing because with defamation, they're going to use this to prove that she was lying and knew she was lying about these things. Because if you don't actually have any injuries, you're gonna try and photoshop them or fake them somehow. And that will show that you really do know that you're lying. Another key point is that as soon as the allegations came out, Amber was lifted among the Me Too movement. She was the ACLU ambassador for women's rights, while Johnny languished in purgatory, being called an abuser and all manner of awful things. Things he didn't do. After this, Amber's team starts their opening statements. This lawyer's name is Benjamin Rottenborn. Yes, it's spelled how you think it is. No, I don't know why. Both of them also have a woman come up afterwards, so there's a male and a female that you'll get to know very well on either side. And we're gonna start with Benjamin. He claims that all of the stuff from the article she wrote was free speech, and basically makes it sound like everything she said is true, and if you don't agree, you're not only against free speech, but I guess since she wasn't lying, you're, you're against women or something? I don't know. Their entire thing is about free speech, even though during the actual trial, thinking back on it now, they don't spend a lot of time on free speech. You would think that they would really get into the nitty gritty of the First Amendment, but they spend the entire time trying to prove that Johnny is an abuser, even though he's suing them for a an article that 
They're trying to make it sound like no one could have guessed that the article was about Johnny and that he's making this up and he's the one who's pointing at the article and saying it's about him when no one else could tell and it wasn't defamatory, but they don't spend a lot of time on that and they expect you to believe both that Johnny was an abuser and also that when Amber was talking about an abuser that she lived with and was married to, she's not talking about him? Who else then? I, I don't know what their argument is. The only time that they bring up First Amendment shit is like the opening and closing statements. It's funny how a lawyer acts like freedom of speech and defamation are not something that have differentials. Like, a defamation thing should be free speech, but you're a lawyer, so y y your whole thing is about random shit that, that and rules that are really, like, persnickety. Is this really a good look for you? He brings up the op-ed and also about how it's about the patriarchy and misogyny and the w women live in the misogyny. Yeah, it's one of those things. He then goes and reads the fucking article. She even brings up Trump. Like, it's a, it's about a domestic abuse. Why'd you bring up that guy? He doesn't know you. So after this, he goes on about the article a little bit more and talks about women things. Women fighting for me too. He, he says that Depp is trying to distract you from the truth in the article. And Johnny's career was untouched and hers took a downturn because of the article, because women speaking out are, like, punished in society or whatever. Even though we all know that the reality is if a man is simply accused of anything, it doesn't have to have proof. He's immediately tarnished by that for the rest of his life. Even if it's proven to not be true, everyone still thinks that it's true. There was once a case where a woman dreamed that she was raped by a man, and then he got sent to jail for many, many years. This, this is the kind of world we live in. This is why I made this video. I have nightmares about the men in my life getting into something like this where some crazy woman tries to accuse them of something and no matter how hard I try to help them, they're just immediately treated like perpetrators for the rest of their lives and harmed and abused by this because we never treat men seriously in these. It's a huge issue. This whole thing is whining about misogyny, but misandry is the real underpinning of this. And I'm, I know that you'll understand what I mean as we go through this. It is really important, but I'm getting distracted and we're not even through the opening statements yet. Rottenborn then goes on the cringy Titanic metaphor that Amber brought up in her article and basically made it sound like it's all a conspiracy against her. All of the witnesses are lying, all of the camera footage is photoshopped or out of context or whatever. Then the cat lady Karen takes the stand. This lady's name is Elaine, though I will be calling her Karen, as you will understand. This lady goes on about how the details in the case prove that Amber was right, and this is supposed to be her opening statement, that she goes on for a while, a while of basically reading shit that she probably found from like gossip websites, and talking as if she's like, you're going to visit that auntie that you don't like and she's like giving you some shitty tasting coffee and just like ranting on and on and on and on. Her entire thing is like, you're gonna see some crazy ass bullshit. Johnny's making some weird noises too and he gets drunk a couple times. Oh my god, welcome to TMZ. It's so detail intensive, it doesn't even have a point. It like loses its point after the first five minutes and your eyes just start glazing over. She's also trying to imply that the UK trial results somehow are good to bring up here, which calls for a legal conclusion and isn't good to bring up here. And that one was basically that Johnny was suing that one guy who wrote for The Sun for defamation and the UK laws are really retarded because, you know, free speech basically isn't a thing there. So it's stupid to bring that up anyway because we didn't get to see that trial. We didn't get to see any of the mistreatment that anyone got from the trial and what they accepted as evidence. Thankfully, this is being recorded and it's very important to be recorded because his story needs to be told and we all need to see the way that lawyers treat witnesses and how cross-examinations work and who's being treated unfairly and whether or not the judge is treating anyone unfairly. What is happening? We need to see that stuff and for a lot of high-profile cases that we need to know about, we don't get to see any of it. This is a small start, yes, but I think it is important, and especially if people want to see more cases like this that the public should know about, especially ones about politicians and whatnot, it's a good precedent to set and it's a good example to cite. Anyway, after the opening statements are done, we now get officially into the trial. The very first witness is Johnny's sister, Christy Zembrowski. She's his older sister by two and a half years, and she goes on a bit about family life because they want to establish what Johnny was dealing with in terms of women in his life and the way that his mom and dad reacted to each other and the dynamics because there was quite a bit of abuse in the household. 
Did your mother, Betty, ever get angry with your father? Yes. How would your mother express her anger toward your father? Mom would, she would scream, she would yell at him, would hit him, call him names. Did your father ever hit your mother back? No, dad, dad never reacted um, when mom would hit him. What, if anything, did you and Johnny do while your mother was hitting or attacking your father? We would, we would leave the area. We would run and hide. We would go to our, our room, uh, you know, either we would go to our room together or, you know, depending on where we lived, you know, our, if our room was close, um, we would sort of run off and get away from it. Did there come a time when your parents separated? Yes. Would you please tell the jury what happened? There was a, a our, our father one morning um, decided to uh, pack up everything and, and, and leave early in the morning. There's more objections to this, even though she's talking about him like as a toddler, as if him being a good boy as a toddler was somehow manipulative. Their mum was abusive towards both him and Christy, and especially their dad. None of them wanted to react because, one, it's just going to escalate the physical things about it and they would elicit a worse response and it was the quickest way to really get things over with when they were being verbally and physically assaulted by her. The dad, in particular, never hit back, and in, this is a key point because even if a woman is being abusive, oftentimes if a man tries to react physically and defend himself or try and push her off in some way, it'll be used against him as if he was the abuser, and a lot of people will naturally believe this because the men are often taller, even though they've gone through who knows how much emotional abuse to react a certain way. And the physical abuse is just kind of the thing that pushed them over the edge to try and defend themselves, it's kind of a shaky ground. Hauntingly, with the story that she's painting here, a lot of similar things unfold during the course of Amber and Johnny's marriage. This is also something discussed in the trial. Johnny would often view his dad as a bit of a coward for what he did next. One day, his dad just packed up and left. He went to work as if he was going in any other day, but he never came back. Then, his mother overdosed on some pills because she just wanted out. She was in agony after he left. Now, as much as I'd like to continue, this is one of the parts where Rottenborn randomly objects and annoys everyone because there's no reason to object to this. So keep in mind while I'm trying to weave the story together, just imagine in your head she's trying to talk about this and some idiot just gets up and goes objection, objection, objection constantly like someone's doing a Ace Attorney YTP. Christy then starts drawing a couple familiar stringers together in terms of the stuff that her mom and dad did and the habits Johnny developed that will resurface in the course of the abuse that he went through. She says that she would see him come back from the building that he stayed with with Amber and he would seem sadder and not quite himself. He would be quiet and more rushed. When she saw them on trips together, she had to make sure that they had an extra hotel room because he would have to somehow hide there after they argued lest Amber want to escalate and become more physical with her abuse. It was common for them to have arguments, and it was Christie's idea for the extra room to be arranged every time they took a trip because she saw the same patterns and behaviour from childhood and he needed to escape. She never had to book extra rooms for any other relationships, even when they would fight, it would never be something that he would have to run away from, like Amber. It seemed like he was always trying to make her happy and placate her, but her personality would often overpower his. When Johnny told Amber that he was in talks with Dior for a sponsor, Amber reacted by saying that Johnny didn't have any style and it was surprising that they wanted him, and as if he didn't deserve any of this. She would also say other things quite a lot, like calling him an old fat man and saying he wasn't worth anything. And throughout all of this, Chrissy says that she never once saw any bruises or marks on Amber. She wanted Johnny to reconsider the marriage. After all, it was quite rushed and they didn't have any success in prenup negotiation. After all, Johnny apparently wanted the prenup, but Amber didn't want to sign it. 
One time during a late dinner, Christy was trying to explain to Amber that so much fighting was a bad thing, especially with the whole marriage stuff. You don't want to start a toxic relationship and then keep it going to marriage. Amber told her to get off her high horse and that Johnny loved the fighting. He loved it. He was into the toxic relationship. On the May 21st incident, their mother passed away and it seemed like Amber had been fighting with him during this moment. Amber had filed a divorce during a really inappropriate time, right as his mother passed and he was dealing with that, and then followed it up with a restraining order and the allegations, especially because Depp wasn't even in the country and couldn't really defend himself. They then start talking about Amber's op-ed, which is important because it's the reason for the defamation case. Benjamin Roddenborn then decides to go mental. The director to answer that question again. Maybe you should ask it again. How has the publication of Ms. Hurd's op-ed, putting aside for a moment, how has it affected him personally? She's his sister, Your Honor. Foundation. I'll allow it. Go ahead. I am not a lawyer, obviously. I'm just someone who's interested in these things and think it's something that I would like to talk about, but. I would definitely say that you can tell the things that they really don't want the witnesses to talk about because they start objecting like wild. Because it makes it look like Johnny is the type of person that does those types of things and a lot of brands don't want any sort of proof. They just want to see which side the cultural zeitgeist or Twitter is on before they decide to destroy someone's career and drop brand deals and drop movies and basically destroy everything that they have. That's the way it works. So the op-ed and the following results clearly show that something fucky was going on, but, but uh, Team Turd doesn't want to talk about that. Now it's time for the cross-examination. Oh boy. Rottenborn immediately opens by going on about how she makes money from Depp and therefore she would be loyal to him because she's getting a paycheck from him as if it's some conspiracy. He also says that she is financially invested in the child doing well, so she wants to lie about it. And not only that, but he, he thinks that everyone who is saying the nicest things about Johnny, the smallest things about Johnny being innocent, are on his payroll. The entire half, more than half of the witnesses in the trial are just on his payroll. He says that Johnny's reactions to Hyde after a fight were only when he was a kid, as if that makes it irrelevant to him now. Him growing up in that severe abuse and developing these habits apparently are not relevant to when he gets into another abusive relationship and acts accordingly. He then says that the drugs and alcohol changed Johnny into a violent monster. But I guess when Amber drank nightly, it was okay. You can then see Christy starting to get a bit flustered and annoyed at this dumbass line of questioning. You'll see that quite a bit. You say, I think with anyone in that place, confrontation unfortunately doesn't help, and sometimes conversations can seem like confrontations. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Were you suggesting to Miss Heard that she shouldn't have a conversation with Mr. Depp about what drugs and alcohol did to him? She, she could be very, very vocal and so what I was trying to do was, if they were having a conversation, if it wasn't going well, I was trying to tell her that, you know, maybe, you know, sometimes conversations, if you're vocal, really loud, they're more confrontational. Mm -hmm. So when you said disagreeing, reasoning, nudging, all can seem like confrontations, were you telling Ms. Heard that she shouldn't voice any concerns about her significant other's drug or alcohol abuse? Have you ever disagreed with or reasoned with or nudged anyone? He then argues that she doesn't know anything about the way that they were running their relationship because she wasn't around them 24 seven and asked how she knew that they were fighting on May 21st because she wasn't there, was she? Christy then recounts how Amber didn't really want to go visit Johnny's mom. She would only kind of show up off before that she knew that he would show up or with him and would usually get kind of grumpy and, and it would be kind of tense. She never really saw Amber show up alone purely for the reasons of visiting a loved one. She would only show up alone if Johnny was coming shortly afterwards to meet up. She says this quite clearly, yet Rotten One seems to misunderstand what she means. I, I don't know if that's deliberate or not, but they spend a lot of time on this and he still doesn't get it. They also have a lot of boomer tech issues. For all the stuff that I'm talking about, there was like a million boomer tech issues and I was just sitting there trying to get through it. There's this specific text about coke. He says that he wants coke and 
Rottenborn, not getting the answer that he wants, starts boot looping and just, I don't know, he's looping. Something, something's wrong with him. Somebody needs to change the OS, he's boot looping again. Because she's trying to explain that it's not necessarily about drugs that he was consuming, it's just when you have somebody in duress or something, they can kind of vent. Like, if you're on a diet and you're like, man, I wish I could go for some chocolate right now or something, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get some. You might even say, like, bring me chocolate or something as a joke. That doesn't mean that you're gonna get any. It doesn't mean that you want any. It just means that you're kind of venting. And to be fair, she is very unclear with what she's saying at this specific point. I think she gets a bit muddled up and caught up in specifics, but it, it, kind of the gist of what she's saying is clear, but Benjamin just keeps boot looping and that's definitely not helping make it more clear. He then has the gall to say that just because she wasn't specifically looking for bruises on Amber, it doesn't mean that they weren't there, it was just... Like, if you look at someone and they're banged up, if you don't specifically look at them to study for bruises, you won't notice that at all. What kind of stupid argument is that? He then gets into when she saw some bruises and there was some fighting and whatnot, and the press should know about this stuff because the press would just blow up and start spreading it everywhere, and that would be really bad for the mental health of the people involved and all of the, the news about it and it would be spinning out of control and no one would know what the truth was. It was a very bad idea. You don't want to tell the press absolutely everything because there's personal issues involved. It's a serious thing. However, Rottenborn takes this to say that if you omit things from the press because you don't want them to know about personal issues, you're lying because you're on Johnny's payroll and therefore you're a, you're a paid shill in the courtroom. Right. Then he starts boot looping again and that's pretty much it for Chrissy. We then move on to Isaac. Isaac Baruch is a painter and one of Johnny's very close friends. They've known each other for a very long time, since like the 80s or something, and it, Isaac's a really likeable guy. He goes off on some funny tangents here and there, the way he speaks is very blunt, it's just what he means, and I think that that makes him a very credible person to listen to. Johnny also basically supported him from the start and gave him a place at the penthouses, which is a series of places in a building that Johnny owned, and he and a lot of Amber's friends would get to stay there rent-free. One time, he saw Amber and Johnny arguing on the phone. Amber was on the phone and she kept trying to call him again after Johnny would hang up, so Isaac walked up to the phone, hung it up, that conversation was gonna end there. He had no idea what they were talking about, but Amber was kind of goading Johnny on and making Johnny more mad, and Isaac thought it was very unproductive. You don't be- what are you- what are you doing, baby? And- and then- hang up the phone again. The third time it happens, I'm saying this, there's no solution in this conversation. I grabbed the phone from him and I says, hey, Amber, this is Isaac. Listen, this conversation is now over. And I hung up the phone. He was also once walking by in the hall and saw a broken glass. He didn't know what it was, possibly a sconce, possibly something that didn't even belong in the hall, like a cup. Whatever it was, it was on the floor. Isaac then mentioned that he didn't see any scars on Amber, and this is very important because he frequently saw her without any makeup whatsoever. The opposition then goes on about how violently he might have kissed her on the cheek. Um, I'm just gonna let this play for a little bit. Birthday? 22nd, Sunday, yes. Okay, so when you showed it the first time, you went like this, right? And then the next time when you said you did the kisses, you went like this. What's your typical way of kissing women when you greet them I say goodbye? Did, I'm not understanding any of what you just did. Okay, so when you, well, well I'll just leave it at Amber. When you, I take it that you would regularly kiss Amber on the cheek when you used to say hello and to say oh, goodbye? Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. And, and tell us how you did that. Did, did you have a different way of kissing her on the cheek? Different? And okay. That's that. So it's, it's, it's a pretty soft, it's kind of like a, almost a superficial one, or is it a really hard one on the cheek? They then bring up the broken glass, claiming that he said it was from a wall sconce when he didn't say that. It was purely a speculation of his. He had no idea what it was from, but they hammer on that detail for a while. Elaine, or Karen, starts getting into some shit about Amica cream and how he, even if she looked like she wasn't wearing makeup, she was wearing Amica cream, so the scars were miraculously vanished. I've been in the room, yeah, when she's putting, when makeup was getting put on her. Do you, are you familiar with Amica cream? Do you know what type of tint Ms. Heard used? Would it be fair to say that you, yourself, 
are not familiar with what type of makeup Amber Heard uses on a daily basis? I don't know what she uses on a daily basis. And you don't know whether she had applied Amica cream, correct? Now, to everyone watching, it's called Arnica cream, and if you've used any type of blemish or scar cream before, you know that they don't work that way. They take maybe months to work. As someone who has personal experience using blemish creams and whatnot, they don't work like that. They're very slow, even the effective ones, and oftentimes most of them aren't effective. Not only that, but the key point being that she got the name wrong. What are you doing, Karen? Isaac then was really confused and wasn't really giving her any of the answers that she wanted because he didn't know what the fuck was going on. See, one of the important things to them is proving that Amber had bruises but you couldn't see them because the makeup was covering them. However, as you can see from this exchange, it doesn't exactly go well. They go from saying that she she hid her bruises super super well because she was able to use makeup and Amica cream to cover them so that even someone who was looking for the bruises wouldn't see them at all. Yet, they continuously say that the reason why people couldn't see any bruises on Amber was because they weren't looking for them even though they were clearly on her face. So was the makeup hiding it or wasn't it? Do you want the witnesses to say that they didn't see anything or they just weren't looking even though the bruises were clearly on her face? I'm confused, and I'm not the only one who's confused. However, in reality, if you're trying to cover up a big bruise with makeup, you're going to really have to cake it on. And Isaac, being frequently up close with her as they were staying in the same building and they were friends for a while, he would have noticed this, especially because you don't need to be so close to someone to see that they're caking on makeup and it looking a bit abnormal. He was specifically quite close to her physically sometimes, so he would have definitely noticed something like that. Not only he, but also Christy saw her without makeup quite often as well. However, as soon as the route of makeup was not working, the turd team decides to go with Amica cream. These clowns really decide to act like cream would have just disappeared the scar. I have no idea why she keeps going on about it when she got the name wrong, and, and, and clearly he doesn't know what the fuck she's talking about, so I don't really know. I know sometimes... The lawyers like to fluster the witness a bit by constantly hammering one point home, but in this specific case it's clearly not working and Karen is the only one here who's getting flustered. But then we reach the part where he gets a bit emotional and I can definitely understand why. He wasn't being mean to Amber during this testimony at all. Even when he gets emotional, he specifically makes sure to mention that he wants both of them to heal. This is a man who clearly cares about both of them a lot. It's not just Johnny, he, he's not just biased towards Johnny. He really wants the best for everyone and the fact that he keeps dragging on and on is giving him a lot of turmoil. Anymore, I'm not, you know, I, what I am is tired and I want this all to end. Her to go heal, him to go heal. So, you know, it's, it's, so many people are, have been affected. It's gone out the door and around the world. And so I don't need, I, I can't even paint anymore. I've stopped painting for the last who knows how many years. I don't, I, I'm not angry at anybody. I want the best for her, for her to take her responsibility, heal and, 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 and move on, move on. And, and for Johnny, John, you know, it's, his family has been completely wrecked by all of this stuff. And it's not, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not fair. It's not right what, ha what she did and what happened for so many people to get affected from this. It's, it's insane and Mr. That's this, how this happened. It's quite a good and effective speech, purely because it's unplanned. You can tell he's actually feeling these emotions and he's not hiding them away, because he doesn't want to, he doesn't see the reason to. It's how he feels and what he thinks, which is what they're there to talk about and he knows it's the truth. In response to this, Karen goes off ranting and doesn't seem to know how to wrangle the examination back on topic, only she's very grumpy. All in all, Isaac did offer a lot of 
really good insight into living around their relationship, as of course he didn't see their intimate moments in the bedroom, but he did kind of see the aftermath of the fights, and perhaps the events leading up to the fights, even if he didn't know it at the time, it, it sticks in his memory because something was off. He was a bit hard to follow at times because of the way he speaks, but he does really care about them, and the way that he speaks does at least keep your attention. He also recalls the fake punch that I mentioned earlier, the joke punch Whitney, Amber's sister, did. F big old fake swing and they both laughed together. However, the lawyer decides that something more important, uh, aka I guess something that doesn't make Amber look as bad, is Johnny's venting dramatic texts about her corpse in a Honda Civic. Isaac is clearly confused with this line of questioning, but then... Karen decides that the best course of action to follow is to ask if Depp Ebbers suffered some delusion, like he's in Silent Hill or something. I don't know why that popped up. I don't- I still don't know. But, I mean, you, you do you, and Karen, just keep asking questions, see what happens. So we then get to the Miss James. So she was Amber's assistant for a while, personal assistant. She really doesn't like Amber. What were your job duties? Too many to mention. She's honestly really snappy to the team, the turd team that talks to her, but she's kind of nice to everybody else. Uh, the thing with video depositions is that they're cut up, so we don't know all of the stuff that was making her pissed off. We don't know how each side was treating her. We don't know any of that stuff because it's cut out, and oftentimes it's cut out pretty badly where you can hear someone start to say objection and then it was cut up. Video depositions are also one of the most boring things on the planet, but, thankfully, they're not super important, we can go over them fairly quickly. However, I would say that Miss James is one of the most important ones because of how much she hates Emma. She starts off with a very flippant tone, and the fucking boomers in the courtroom don't know how to press pause when they're talking about different things, so bear with me. The examination already happened, of course, as I said, so they're cut up into the important bits, and even then, they're incredibly boring to watch. But in this case, Miss James is very, very angry, and it's so great. Upset, correct? As I said, it just didn't make sense that she went to the shuttle instead of going home. That she actually wasn't upset, is that what you're saying? It's too much, I mean, I already answered once. There was nothing wrong with Miss Heard that day, and that she wasn't actually upset. I don't know if that answer. I mean, it's such a strange question. Like I said, you already asked me and I already answered. I'm asking to answer it again. I she was hired by Amber in 2012 through Amber's sister who placed an ad for assistance wanted. This woman had over a decade of experience at this point, and she had had a handful of clients, so she jumped right into it. Immediately, she discovered that Amber was a very demanding person, who wanted all her groceries and housekeeping and every single micromanagement done without question. With a normal salary, even. Even though that is also something that was considered underpaying because of the amount of work that was done. A normal salary for a personal assistant was something that wouldn't entail that much work, according to Miss James. It was initially $25 an hour until she screamed abuse at Miss James and relented to finally raising the salary. Occasionally, Miss James would get text messages complaining about Amber's mental state from Amber and other things that she didn't really know how to respond. She didn't really know about the fighting to a big degree because of course she wasn't there a whole lot of the time for the intimate moments, but she knew enough about it surrounding it by interacting with Amber through Amber's not so good moments. Talking about an alleged incident on a plane that we'll get back to, she heard about what happened afterwards and didn't really care about if Amber was okay or not and she's very blunt about this, which isn't exactly a good thing when you're in a testimony. <laughs> Did you think to ask her if she was okay? You know, I probably did because that's my role, to play a caregiver. That's all I can imagine. Amber had a bunch of friends with her and made Miss James go and get her swimsuit, which she thought was a bit weird. She says that Amber would sit around drinking and making her wait around all the time to give her orders on what to do. She then wanted Miss James to go and pack bags for her at like 10pm and Miss James has a son. She didn't want to go get up, leave her son and go and pack bags for Amber, but Amber got really mad at that. Afterwards, I think there's Cross and Rottenborn says, It's normal for people who went through trauma to hang around with friends afterwards, isn't it? And Miss James is just like, okay. 
would it be odd for someone who's experienced trauma to want to be around friends? You fuckhead. I love the sass, I really do, but there's a certain point where you gotta put the sass aside to properly answer the question because it'll just hamper your own credibility if you come across as too combatant. I think some points she really doesn't help herself too much by just not answering the question. I know it's annoying to have the same questions asked over and over again. I know we don't get to see all of the annoying parts of it because it's being cut out, but you just gotta do it. If you really do care about the person that you're representing, you'll do your best to answer your questions honestly and as clearly as possible. You, you don't want to just make it sound like you don't want to be there even though yeah you don't want to be there but you, you, you got to think about what the reason that you're here you know anyway she continues amber would talk about how unfair she thought the relationship was and sometimes cry to miss james and when the paparazzi was near she would have to stop crying because they didn't need to know what was going on she would have to be told to stop crying and i understand why people would think that this is would come across as like mean for miss james to be like stop crying the the paparazzi don't need to see you cry but the way that Rottenborn hems it in, as if she's some sort of monster, is kind of funny. And she would call me up crying. I remember one time she called me when she was alone in New York City and she was crying, walking around the street, crying. And he wasn't there, she was alone, but I said to her that she needed to go inside because I was watching. James never believed that Depp was abusive, and she says that she was there almost every day and saw no evidence of Amber having bruises on her. There was never any damage that she saw to the apartment, and though James wasn't entirely aware of the goings-on, she was there enough to have seen any aftermath, kind of like Isaac. Physical evidence and whatnot. Johnny had also made some stupid comments over text, and they're kind of funny. Johnny texts like a dramatic teenage girl. But just because he does, that doesn't mean that he actually means any of the things he's saying in a literal sense. <laughs> Trying to say that he does is just ridiculous. They pull up some speculation and act like it's a definitive answer, and look, I get that she's not being very helpful and being very clear with her answers, but that doesn't mean that you have to pull up speculation. Do you recall anything? Wow. Ms. James has vet experience, and Rottenborn goes on to say that because she has vet experience, she has no human medical experience, and I understand that that, that is kind of a thing, like, when it comes to like performing surgery or something that's very important but when it's just random shit that anyone would notice on someone having vet experience doesn't mean that you won't notice those things as well if i can identify a bruise and i have no experience medically whatsoever that means that someone who has medical experience with animals could probably do that too because you have to be qualified to point out someone's addictions or someone's bruises or something that you can obviously see. What are your medical experiences, Rottenborn? Can you do that? How can you be sure? Also, James or Amber drink like every single fucking time as well, so I think she would be able to infer certain things. Amber eventually needed to terminate the employment and did it without notice because she needed to support her mom instead. James wasn't super upset, I mean obviously having something cut off without notice is a bit, you know, annoying, but because of the reasons why, she didn't really pursue it or be super angry about it. She then insinuates that Amber lied about there being legit limitations to her being on Depp's payroll because of a prenup. Amber didn't want to sign the prenup, why are they making it sound like she did? There's also some like mortgage shit that kind of just went on over my head, I don't think it's that important. They kept asking if she's angry about being cut off without notice and she keeps saying that she's not. They just keep trying to hammer it even though it's not really getting the response that they want. Then they switch to, but you didn't love it, as if that insinuates that someone is fucking angry even though it just means that they could even just be indifferent about it. Didn't love it means that they could even still like it but just not love it all much. Stupid question. She also says that she would have to buy two copies of magazines every time that Amber was in a magazine and bring them to the garage because Amber didn't want Johnny to know that she was keeping these magazines, so she had to have them hidden. One time, as James didn't make it in time, she was on the way and she was holding the magazines and like getting there, but Amber saw her before she actually managed to hide the magazines and she was fucking mad and she molded, even though James didn't know why she had to do any of these things. Them for me and I would go approximately once a week to pick up whatever magazines Amber was featured in, two copies of each which I would then store in her garage. Why would you store them in Miss Hurd's garage? Because she didn't want Mr. Depp to see them. Did she tell you why she didn't want Mr. Depp to see them? 
No, she just got very angry with me one day because I hadn't quite made de- made it downstairs to put them in the garage when she came home and she went absolutely ballistic over that. When you say she went absolutely ballistic over that, can you please describe what you mean? Screaming, yelling, abuse. She was even around when Amber was getting undressed for fittings and whatnot, so she saw a lot of Amber's bare skin and she saw a lot of Amber without any sort of makeup whatsoever. She did not notice any bruises and she also noticed that Amber wasn't wearing makeup and whatnot, so there's no way that she could have covered up her bruises or used any Amica cream. This is particularly interesting because Isaac kind of said the same thing. Amber didn't wear makeup unless she was going out, so they would have seen any bruises in the full display, yet there wasn't anything to be seen. She also felt insecure when Johnny wasn't there, and she often cried from being insecure, and Miss James would hear a lot of this. It seemed that Amber had some weird issues with the idea of abandonment or something. She also vented that Johnny's friends were really boring because there were a bunch of old men sitting around playing guitars. James does seem very starstruck by Depp and mentioned that she'd never seen him mean or screams at people, which is, is valuable to, to know, but the way she says it, she seems very starstruck. But she also says that he was very passive and he was very nice. From April or May of 2020. What was your impression of Mr. Depp? He was very peaceful, very calm, almost shy, and uh, very quiet. And uh, I remember he was wearing red red suede shoes because I didn't know where else to look. I looked at his shoes. It was like, like a... <laughs> it's a weird recollection, I know. <laughs> Amber had blind rages and they would be incoherent because she just kind of wanted to lash out and didn't necessarily make sense at what she was saying or what she was lashing out at. Whitney had also apparently gotten some abuse, the screaming and the other types of verbal abuse. Her mother apparently got the same treatment. One of the things that she reiterates she mentions is seeing Amber drink a lot, a lot of wine. Amber did tell James that she had taken coke and mushrooms, but James herself never saw it personally. The lawyer at one point says, I'm just pointing her to the email, Mr. Rottenborn, which I think is really funny because it shows how trigger happy turd team is with the objections. <laughs> Even just moving your finger in a certain way will make Mr. Rottenborn want to jump up and object to your presence. So we have Laurel, Laura, I don't know. But this is a couples therapist. This is one of the most unprofessional therapists I have ever seen in my life. A couples counsellor who also does individual psychotherapy, but she doesn't keep her notes properly. So how the fuck does she do any of that? All her notes are written like she's writing gossip or like speculation, as if she's watching someone else do the therapy sessions in a video. It's like she's making video notes. Even my video notes aren't written like this. <laughs> Even that is so unprofessional compared to the random shit that I scribble when I talk in videos. <laughs> like, she does have some valuable things to say in trying to paint pictures of character, but she just comes across as so sus. I'm not the only one who thinks so either. Sometimes I watch Nick Ricada's footage because it was really helpful to hear like lawyer input and that kind of stuff, but it's just, ugh, oh my god. Just how bad the relationship is, just how mean they are to one another. Awesome. And at that point, I, because I'm typing quickly as they go along, I'm switching into a different voice, more about the process between them, where she has, I believe, interrupted him. He says no more about what she says about him. And it's just that they're fighting and she has a hard time. She, she bites the bait. She can't let him talk. Is, is my recollection and from this, th that's kind of what that is. As no one likes you, getting fame from me, falling out of love with you whore. Jay is Johnny Depp? Yes, but that was said by Ms. Hurd. So is it fair to say that Ms. Hurd was saying that Johnny said to her, Mr. Depp told you that Amber had hit him in the jaw. Did Amber respond in any way? Did she deny it? Did she admit it? Uh, I don't think she denied it, but what I believe from my notes was that they galloped, she galloped off in a new direction and they um, continued to talk and there was no more that Johnny Depp was going to say about 
I feel like she did less to help paint a picture in certain points. Like, Pad's word counts for essays? Like, when you're trying to say a lot of things but not actually, you know, say something. And she keeps making this, like, weird face. <laughs> the interesting things that she says are as follows. Amber is very fast and animated when she talks. She did report violence to Laurel, who says that she saw pictures, and she saw the pictures that showed Amber's eyes having marks around them. Then, she also says that she uses pronouns that don't necessarily match the gender of the person involved because she forgets to use the right pronouns. Normally when you bring up pronouns it's not very important, it's usually some like made up pronouns that people on Twitter use. I don't mean it in that way, I mean it in an actual important way, like she will look at Johnny and Amber. Someone who, when you're talking about them without using names, in order to differentiate, you will say he for Johnny, who's the man in the relationship, and she for Amber, who's the woman. So when you're making therapy notes, when you say she, you think that you're talking about Amber. But Laurel would confuse these. She would be like, oh, she, and then me, Johnny, for some fucking reason. I have never seen someone do this before in my life. How unprofessional and stupid do you have to be to get the pronouns mixed up and just be like, eh, no difference. Amber said that Johnny said that Amber is a whore who leeches fame and he's falling out of love with her or some shit. Johnny said that Amber hit him in the jaw and Amber did not deny this. But they were talking so fast that they didn't really address it afterwards. They were just like, yeah, okay, that happened, and then they rambled on and on. Amber would also frequently interrupt Johnny Depp a lot, but after that being pointed out, Amber did kind of make an effort to stop doing that in the therapy sessions. Amber also asked if she would have an advantage if she filed for abuse before the divorce started, whatever that means. Amber had apparently thrown a can at Depp. I hope it was Beans. Laurel also reported seeing bruising on Amber's face, which Amber had to directly point out to her, but she doesn't remember anything about the bruises, besides that she apparently saw them. She also didn't see anything of an altercation happen personally, she only heard it being relayed to her from them. But she also noted that the physical violence appeared to be mutual. Even though she had all of these issues with her notes, I don't even know if she knows that. She saw some small bruises and stuff like that, but she she seems to not remember and she tries to consult her notes, but she doesn't even know what the fuck she's saying. Then we have Gina. Gina is fucking useless. She tries to ramble on for a bit, but then they found out that she posted on social media that she was going to be in the court trials or something, and that she had been watching some of the court trials, which you're not supposed to do if you're in the trial, so she gets dismissed. Question for you. Have you been watching the trial this past week? Um, I've seen clips of it online, yeah. You've been watching, so you have seen parts of this trial? Yeah. Okay, and witness testimonies? Yeah, I've seen clips of it. You've seen it, please. Yeah. All right, does anybody have any follow-up questions? Excuse, ma'am, you can have your excuse. Okay. Thank you. My only question is, how did they find that out? Like, she posted on social media or something, and I, I just find it strange, like, Rottenborn... I, I, I believe Rottenborn when he says that he didn't know that she had posted about that stuff on social media or whatever. However they found out. Like, that's fine. I'm not going to try and allege shit against him. I don't know. It seems like he didn't know, but my whole question is like, how the fuck did they find out? Like, as she was getting up to go to the trial and, and sit on the stand, did she make a tweet that she was doing that stuff? Like, how did they find out? I don't know. That's weird. Anyway, we then move on to... Dr. Kipper, who was Johnny's personal doctor. He and someone called Lisa, I, I didn't know what her name was at the time and I swear he called her Lisa Bean. I don't- <laughs> I'm just gonna call her Lisa Bean. She had someone called Lisa Bean work for him and she was very unprofessional and inappropriate so we had to tell her off. She was apparently discriminatory to some degree and didn't like other staff and she quit after three years. He then moved on to Debbie Lloyd, who was a nurse that worked for him on addiction cases, and she was a contractor. There was another nurse who was there to also take care of things with if Debbie was unavailable. The stupid fucking idiots who edit the court videos don't edit out the dead air. Whenever a video deposition came on, I had to put it on like 1.75 speed just to get through this shit. These guys are worse than me when I made my first videos, and I was doing them offline on Windows Movie Maker to show my friends in school. <laughs> informing you that he was upset with Dr. Cowan. 
So the way that these video depositions work is, I know at the time they edit out things and agree to what's objected to and what's not, but they can also try and object to shit as they're watching the video and then the people will have to pause it and they'll have to try and talk it out, do a sidebar, shit like that. But I, I just think that video depositions are a bit messy because I guess you have to fast forward through the shit that they said, even though I isn't the shit that they said already agreed upon to be in the video. But th there's this one weird part where the plaintiff, even though it's his his testimony, the, the plaintiff is the okay, the plaintiff is Johnny's side, the defense is Amber's side, just to get that out of the way. But the plaintiff side start trying to object to to like medical documents, even though it's their own witness, so wouldn't you want the documents to be in court? I don't understand what's going on. I tried to watch like other videos about it and I still don't get it, but that that happens. Dr. Kipper helped with the substance abuse issues. Substance abuse, detoxifying, working with alcohol, benzos, just all of them. Johnny was high on that miracle flower, if you know what I mean. I'm also serving as his internist, managing some medical issues. And that, that's the nature of these concerns. You, you weren't concerned at all about Mr. Depp's uh, continuing with his uh, treatment plan for drug and alcohol use? You can't separate those two issues. They're not two distinct issues. But in order for me to assess how he was doing in general with his general health, these metrics that I- And Johnny had a serious opiate addiction at the time and he wanted Dr. Kipper to help him. Dr. Kipper also kept some progress notes as well as the notes that Debbie Lloyd, the nurse, and the other nurse had given him when they were reporting about what was happening. He also pointed out that Johnny had a lot of mood swings where he got depressed. Nurse Lloyd was going to be there on the islands to basically live on the islands with them. In Depp's property, she had to give him medications at a certain time, note his mood, the way that he was acting to being detoxified, whether or not it was going well, that kind of thing. The stuff that you do through treatment. But apparently there was a flood in the office, so a bunch of the files got fucked. And they don't keep digital files. Why the fuck not? Dr. Kipper. Johnny had a huge coke problem. He had also written a text about how Amber sucks and the world is a fuck. Johnny said that he'd had the top of his finger cut off and mentioned it to Kipper. And when Kipper went there, the house was a complete mess and they had to go and find the finger to reattach it. A lot of things were thrown around, broken, it was a huge deal. But when he was there, he did not see any bruises on Amber and he didn't see any on on her in general. And this is particularly important because Dr. Kipper and the nurses were there to stay on the island and they would have been there up close in person during these moments. When Johnny's finger had been cut off, he went out with his security guards and stood outside and they needed to get him treatment and they also needed to find the finger but they didn't want him to go back in there because Amber was in there and there was like a huge fight going on. When Dr. Kipper went into the house, he saw blood and he had to go find the finger and he saw a lot of shit smashed up. Amber had at one point alleged that her lip had gotten fucked up and she had a lot of broken bones from fighting with Johnny, yet Kipper writes in a report that he did not see anything of the sort on her. And this was only two days after the alleged incident, which means that it still would have been incredibly bad and even a lay person would have been able to see the horrible things that were done to her. Yet there was no evidence of the sort and Team Turd is really out here acting like two days is enough to heal. <laughs> a busted lip and some broken bones. Debbie Lloyd, who was the nurse that was mentioned, says that she never noticed the abuse. She doesn't fucking recall anything. She says she'd recall it if she reviewed her notes and then just stares at her notes and doesn't review them. On him. I'd have to review my notes. You are reviewing your notes. <laughs> You're literally doing it right now. We then have Sean Bett, who was Johnny's security guard. This man is very important as well because he has experience being a law enforcement officer and he knows how to speak in courtrooms. He knows how to face the jury properly, answer questions very efficiently and clearly. He knows all of this sort of stuff, so having him on board is a very good thing because you get like a professional doing the testimony and you really get a good picture of it. And he also is thinking about like the jury, he's thinking about answering his questions properly and honestly, he's thinking about what the lawyer is trying to ask him, he's thinking about all of those sorts of things. He says that he saw Johnny Depp drinking 
occasionally, and he says that when Johnny was on substances or got drunk, his demeanor would basically be the same, if not just more mellow and chill. Johnny would kind of get more tired and, and less likely to do physical things like that. And this is particularly important because the whole basis for Amber's argument is that Johnny would take substances and then become extremely violent and animated. But we're hearing a lot of people throughout the trial say that this is absolutely not the case. He had one day walked in and Amber was hurling abuse verbally at Depp, and because Sean was trying to assess the situation and step in, she decided to target him as well with the verbal abuse. The arguments also got way worse over the years of their relationship. He was the one who took pictures of Johnny's injuries, the pictures that you'll see throughout the case. There were some swollen upper reds, cheekbones, there's some scratches on his nose, which Sean calls lacerations, which I think is a bit of a strong word. It works. Well, we needed it as evidence. Mr. Bett, uh, what does this photograph show? It depicts a uh, swollen upper left cheekbone with uh, redness to it. On that specific day, no. Later in time, did you ever notice any other injuries on Mr. Depp? I did. Can you please describe what you recall? It was around uh, December of that same year, 2015. Um, he uh, got into an argument with Miss Hurd and she scratched him and he had injuries. Objection. Sustain the objection, only your observations sir. what you saw. Sure, um, there's a laceration on the left side of his nose. He remembers on the May 21st date, running in after hearing Amber screaming and thinking that there was something wrong. He then had walked in and this put him between Amber and Johnny. So Johnny was quite far away from Amber in the room, but Amber screamed, this is the last time you do this to me. They got Johnny out of there as quickly as possible and he looked, went to look for something in his own penthouse. Sean doesn't know what it is, but he knows that Johnny went in there and then went out. Rottenborn, during the cross, then argues that Sean didn't look closely enough to see if Amber had makeup on or not, so he couldn't know if there were bruises, even though their whole argument is that Amber doesn't look like she's wearing makeup when she does because she's doing it to not look like she's wearing makeup, and that's to hide the bruises from everyone. So, like, why are you asking? What What, what are you asking? Well, we were at a meeting. He, he did have a glass of wine in his hand, so I presume he was drinking. And when you arrived at the Eastern Columbia building, you can't say one way or the other whether Mr. Depp was carrying wine with him into the building, right? I can't remember. You and Mr. Judge led him into penthouse three and were in there for just a minute or two um, before you exited penthouse three, correct? Yes, give or take. And then you stayed outside in the hallway of penthouse three for a bit, right? A short period of time, correct. I I think you testified yesterday like 10 minutes, is that right? Yeah, give or two. Um, and then you, from there you went from the hallway outside of penthouse three to penthouse five, the, the storage area where you had a couch and a TV and that sort of thing you testified about, right? That's correct. Is that also known as the guard shack? A modified version of the guard shack. It's just a place for us, as I testified yesterday, to you know uh, rest or have lunch or some coffee. Sometimes called the cubby hole, is that right? And he was there less than a minute, as if being there less than a minute is somehow not enough to have, like, object permanence <laughs> and be able to figure some shit out. Like, if I walked into a room for about 30 seconds, that's less than a minute, but if I saw someone with a busted lip and a bunch of bruises, I would remember that. It doesn't take that long for me to register seeing someone horribly abused. She must have ninja makeup, I guess. After all, apparently him not remembering the specifics of her outfit means that he wouldn't remember if she had horrific bruises all over her face, as if those two are the same thing at all in terms of memory. We tend to remember really negative things that stick out to us and kind of forget some other details, so if I saw someone being abused, I would definitely notice that way more than what they were wearing. If anything, I probably wouldn't even take in what they were wearing because I'd be too busy looking at the bruises on their face. Stupid rotten bone. Bad. No biscuit. We then get to Sean Wyatt, who is a sound technician and someone who then became friends with Johnny and has worked with Johnny quite often. Also, the cross-examination for this is particularly funny, but bear with me, we have to get through the actual info that he gives first. 
He and Johnny would discuss the music to be played in Johnny's ears during his scenes. When you have an earpiece on in a film, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're forgetting your lines and having them fed to you. In fact, a lot of people use them for very different reasons. One for Johnny is that through his acting process, he liked to have music played in his ears that would be kind of aesthetic mood playlists depending on the character. So if someone was a certain type of personality, they'd be into a certain type of music in his head and he would like that played so he'd get more into the zone and, you know, this isn't the first time that I've heard people do that. Also, when you're doing acting and you're supposed to pretend that you're in the same room as someone, you need to sometimes have their lines fed to you so that you have something to respond to. So. For example, Marlon Brando was there before recording his lines and then he had to go. Johnny was supposed to be responding to him in a scene and to make this easier and make his acting more authentic, they had to have Marlon's lines being read to him so that in each pause he would know where to react and it would be better. So it's not that he forgot his lines or that he was anything like that, it was just they need to be there for a specific reason. Sometimes, yes, that does entail an actor needing to have their lines fed to them, but it doesn't necessarily mean that when they put an earpiece on, it's for the context of what's happening. He also said that he never saw any abuse happening in terms of Depp abusing people, and he was also on vacation with Johnny's family in his previous marriage, so he would have seen the way that, that Johnny interacted with his previous wife and other women in his life. And he says that he saw nothing like the abuse that Amber said. What any relationship do you have with Mr. Depp outside of your working relationship? Uh, we're close. Uh, I used to, uh, after a film, sometimes he'd call and would go on vacation with uh, he and his family. On what occasions do, would you go on vacation with Mr. Depp and his family? Uh, he would call after a, after a film, and he would be going away with the the kids and Vanessa, and he would say, "Hey, you know, we're going we're going to the island. Would you come with me and stuff? Or we're going to France. Would you come along?" And, sure. Why not? Would you please uh, give the jury Vanessa's full name? Uh, Vanessa Paradis. And would you please uh, tell the jury who she is? Uh, she is the mother of Johnny's two kids, Jack and Lily Rose. And Mr. Wyatt, uh, on how many occasions, if you can recall, did you accompany Mr. Depp, uh, Ms. Paradis, and Johnny's two children on vacation? Several times. Did, on those several occasions where you accompanied them on vacation, did you ever observe Mr. Depp and Vanessa interact with each other? Sure, yes. Would you please tell the jury what you observed? They were, they were a loving couple and everything was fine. Yeah, it was a family. Did you ever hear or see Mr. Depp yell or raise his voice at Vanessa Paradis, the mother of his children? Not that I recall. Did you ever on any occasion see Mr. Depp physically abuse Vanessa? Never. And I believe you testified, Mr. Wyatt, that Mr. Depp's and Ms. Paradis' children, Lily Rose and Jack, were there on those vacations. Is that correct? Yes. Did you have occasion to observe Mr. Depp's interactions with his children? Sure, yes. How, would you please describe for the jury very briefly Mr. Depp's interactions with his children, Jack and Lily Rose? He was a very loving father. He, he used to do stuff with the, the kids all the time. While they were on a flight once, and Keenan was on this flight so he directly saw these things happen, Amber was giving the cold shoulder to everyone on board. Keenan tried to talk to her to kind of break the ice a bit, and she snapped at him saying, How dare you speak to me? And Johnny then said, Don't speak to my friend that way, and there was a bit of a verbal fight come a time in May 2014 when you traveled with Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard by private plane from Boston to Los Angeles. Yes. Who else was on that Boston plane flight? Uh, it was Amber and Johnny, uh, Stephen, uh, Savannah, and Jerry Judge and myself. What, if any, alcohol or drugs did you see Mr. Depp take while on the car ride to the airport? On the car ride, I don't. I don't recall any anything being taken. We, uh, Johnny, I know, had called Jack during the car ride to talk to him, to tell him we were on our way. On the flight. Uh, at one point, I went up to her and said uh, something to the effect of, you know, he cares about you. And all of a sudden, she snapped and started yelling at me, how dare you talk to me? I went back to a seat and minded my own business. When she said those things to you, um, 
would you describe the tone of her voice if you remember it? She, she was abruptly loud. It was a quiet plane. All of a sudden, it got very loud. What happened next? Uh, Johnny had said something to her like, you know, don't talk to my friend that way. And I, I just stayed in my seat and finished the rest of the flight. And after you went back to your seat, to what extent, if any, were you able to see Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurt? Uh, it, it, I was able to see them very clearly. What, if any, violence or physical altercation did you observe between Mr. Depp <laughs> and Ms. Hurd once you've gone back to your seat? I, I, I've never seen Johnny be violent towards anybody. And now it's time for the cross-examination. Karen decides to take the stand for this one. She immediately gives him some images to look at. You put the exhibits in and they're like images of documents and pictures and stuff like that. You're supposed to ask the person if they're familiar with the image, if they've seen it before. She doesn't ask that. That's like the first thing that you ask. What's wrong with you? As his sound technician, correct? I don't know that. Okay, well, let's pull. Let's go to 633. Turn to page 16. She just fucks it up immediately. That That's gonna be a common theme with her. She then fumbles her way through asking if he's on Johnny's payroll. And then she asks if he was late to set and if he went on a binge with Marilyn Manson. Like, like not, not in a way that is like kind of one question leads onto the other or anything. It, it's just rapid fire. Like, did he get fucking drunk? Did he murder orphans in Mexico? Give me the details. You were in, what was your hotel accommodations? I was staying in a condominium that the rest of the crew was staying in. Okay, and how much were you getting paid on Pirates 5? Whatever the union minimum was for my job. I don't recall. I mean, he was late, yes. There were days he didn't show up at all, weren't there? Uh, could have been, I don't recall. And there were days that he didn't show up for six, seven hours, correct? Yes. Okay, and in fact, uh, he wasn't showing up before Amber ever got to Australia, isn't that correct? I don't, I don't know that. No. It, 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 when you say you don't recall, as you're sitting here today under oath, you honestly Object. can't remember if Mr. Depp was passed out when I mean, you was, left the plane. There was an answer, Your Honor. All right. I'll allow it this one time. Go ahead. You can answer. <laughs> this one time. One time. Good God. I mean, the only reason I remember this one. He says that he doesn't recall things, and she's like, so you're saying that you, you do recall? And, and then he's like, I don't recall what pills he was doing if he was doing any because I wasn't there and she'll be like so you don't recall that he was taking all the drugs and all the alcohol like that's not that's not what that means <laughs> she's just like attacking him I guess she's trying to do the tactic where you like fluster the witness a little bit or whatever but but she's not doing a good job she's just flustering herself she even cuts him off when he's trying to answer her and not like a they're rambling so you have to cut them off to try and get back on track kind of thing like he's straight up just trying to answer her question and she asked him to answer this question but she just cuts them off she also gets confused with the names of her own exhibits and doesn't ask him if he knows the images that she's putting up they take down 115 because he doesn't know what the fuck it is because she didn't ask him before she tried to question him about it they should have really he they should have objected to this more paid, object to correct? this Object. I don't know what's in his contract. Okay. Well, on this lack one, of foundation. Object. Fourteen twenty-eight per hour. Correct. Lack lack of foundation, Your Honor. He does not know. Well, he doesn't know this contract. If you Even though he was with them on vacations and whatnot, she says that because he's, you know, not standing in the room like a cuck while they're fucking, he can't possibly know if there were, like, secret moments where Depp was doing sneaky abuse. Because, you know, the only way to know if an, a relationship was abusive is if you're sleeping between them when they're in bed. She then brings up some prior shit, and she's like, argumentative as fuck as if like well you said that you didn't recall something on a random question that i asked so you don't know anything gotcha you got gamered it's fucking mental do you remember my question i, I didn't i don't recall all right i mean so i could have gotten off the plane and just left i don't know and mr depp could have kicked amber on that plane right Ronner asked an answer not that i saw okay and he could have passed out no, not that I recall. 
Keenan says that he doesn't know about any drugs and didn't see any sort of powders. He also had to correct her that he was the one that Amber yelled at on the plane and not Johnny because she's already forgotten the testimony that she's cross-examining him on. Then she's like, but didn't Depp say horrible things to Amber? And then Keenan's like, what? She brings up that they must have shared an oxy oxygen tank? What's going on? Depp was also apparently drinking bottles of champagne and passing out even though Keenan did not say anything of the sort. Like, is she reading gossip magazines on her phone before she gets up to do cross-examinations? What is she on? She repeatedly asks if Johnny was passed out because Keenan could have not just remembered this. She even says, even under oath? Like, what are you, a mob boss? He's already being consistent and telling you the consistent things that he's recalling from these events. I, I don't know what you think he you're gonna do. She even tries to say that he was fucking Christy, like, in a relationship, so he's gonna lie because the pussy got him acting strange. A relationship with Christy Dabrowski, didn't you? We're friends, yes. Yes, and you were more than friends for quite a few years. Your you Honor, know? relevance, may we approach? And it's impeachment. All right, all right let's get well, bias. Uh, bias. Yeah, approach, please. All of the questions that she asks were fucking useless. So then they do a redirect, which is after the cross-examination, the plaintiff will then come back on and say like, okay, so you got cut off and she prevented you from giving context to your answer at this specific question. Can you now give us that context? Stuff like that. To like re-establish the line of questioning. So the plaintiff asks, do you know why Johnny was late to Pirates 5? Which is a very important question because throughout this entire thing, the question that the cross-examination was kind of hinged on was, was he late to set? But when Keenan would try to establish the context for why Johnny was late to set, they would cut him off because they don't want you to know why. They want you to know that he was so that they can try and make up a context when in reality, there is a context that really just doesn't give you the picture that they want you to paint in your mind of Johnny. Keenan is finally asked to give context for why Johnny was late. The Karen tries to object because she doesn't want that answer coming out. Has Mr. Depp ever worn an earpiece in any of the many movies uh, in which you've worked with him? Yes. For what purpose are earpieces generally used by actors on set? Well, I've worked with he was late because Amber was arguing with him. And that is really important. And the, one of the good things about this testimony was they essentially countering the narrative that Johnny was so drunk that he couldn't function on the film set when really he was able to function and he was using an earpiece not for the reason that the turd team is alleging that he did. Time you used an earpiece with Mr. Depp. First time we used it was on uh, a movie he was directing called The Brave. Um, we were doing a scene with uh, Marlon Brando who wears an earpiece for receiving his dialogue. Objection. Objection? Uh, what? He, uh, Marlon uses an earpiece for, uh, for his dialogue and it was a long shooting day and we let uh, Johnny, as the director, let Marlon go after we shot Marlon's section of the film. And then to, for Johnny's character to act against something other than just a blank nothing, we put Marlon's performance in an earpiece in, into Johnny so he could act up against Marlon's performance. So now we finally get to Depp's first testimony. Johnny reiterates that Amber's accusations completely fucked his reputation and people treated it as if it was fact and it also affected his teenage children because they were affiliated with him and they had to go to school and there are a myriad of ways that people get fucked over, especially if they're men where people are more likely to believe that they're the perpetrator without any evidence, even if their name is clear that shit follows them forever. The People magazine article had featured Amber with a big bruise on the front cover, so I gotta wonder how it feels to have everyone associate you with what was proven to be an extremely exaggerated and possibly fabricated photo. People that I had spoken with, that I had met with over the years, who I, who maybe were in a not such a great position and they needed advice, and I gave them the best advice I could, um, all I could think of was that those people would 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 think that I um, was a fraud and that I had lied to them. And so I had to wait 
for my opportunity to um, address the charges that I could get to the point where I could speak um, has really taken this full six years. And it's been six years of trying times. It's very strange when one day you're uh, Cinderella, so to speak, and then in 0 0.6 seconds, you're Quasimodo. And um, I, 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 I didn't... Uh, he then goes on to talk about his childhood, which Chrissy has sort of mentioned before, but we really get into it now. His mom liked moving a lot, living in different places, and she was really mean and violent when she wanted to be, which was quite often. She'd beat them with high-heeled shoes and a lot of stuff like that, which is completely horrible. There was nothing else to do but run and hide to dodge the anger, because if you even fought back the slightest, it would just escalate things even more, and especially the running and hiding was definitely a sort of learned behaviour from the tactic that the father used. Their father was very quiet, shy, and he'd take all the abuse and punch a wall or something, he would never take it out on people. He would never try to react, he would just kind of absorb it and then let it out somewhere else when he had time to hide. His dad, this being, you know, quite a long time ago, would use a belt on them if they did something wrong, which was kind of common at the time, I suppose. One time, Johnny had insisted that he didn't do the thing that they said he did, that he was being punished for, and when he found out that Johnny hadn't in fact done it and Johnny was telling the truth, he apologised to Johnny. And Johnny brings this up by saying that, in contrast, his mom would never admit wrongdoings like that. When Johnny was 15, that was the time that his dad packed up one day and left. His mom knew something was up, seemingly on an instinct, way before they even found out that he was not coming back. This set her off. She became way more volatile and in agony, emotionally. One time, this culminated as he witnessed his mom almost die from swallowing pills in an overdose. His uncle and paramedics ended up saving her, and Johnny was witnessing this all the while. When describing his relationship beginning with Amber, he says, Miss Heard was too good to be true. She was kind and loving at first, but some things were off. Like, sometimes when he'd come home from work, there was a routine that they would establish. Like, when he would come home, she would take his boots off and hand him some wine. Sometimes he would want to just take his boots off himself because he would see that she was busy and he didn't want to really be a bother. When he would do this, she would get angry at him and say, You don't get to do that. That's my job. When he first was figuring out what his career was, he was doing a bunch of odd jobs, and then one day, he was filling out a job application with his friend, Nicholas Cage, and Cage said that they should get Cage's agent to get him into acting, which he wasn't really planning to do because he was more of a music guy, and he was also an introvert, so it felt really weird. And when Pirates 1 came out, he didn't even watch it. <laughs> he also says that he doesn't like saying his own name because he is the commodity of it in that sense. He also regrets what he wrote about Amber in terms of dark messages. And I understand how it must be awkward to hear these messages in court, but I feel like most people pretend that they don't write shitty messages when they're mad. A lot of people actually do, and I feel like it's not as bad as they're making it out to be. He goes back to his childhood saying that his mum would always make him get her nerve pills, which he only understood as them just being nerve pills because she would call them that and after she would take them, she would mellow out and seem to feel better. And him, being a child, just seemed to connect the dots, thinking this stuff makes her feel better, so maybe it can make me feel better because of the abuse situation I'm in. I really need something like that. And as a child, he didn't understand the negatives and what was really happening. So when he would get the nerve pills, he would start sneaking some to take himself. He then used the addiction to escape and has never taken them at a party to go mental or anything. Every time he had a substance abuse issue, he was doing it to try and feel normal and escape pain. He says that he thinks he was a target for Amber because Amber knew too much about him privately. She was collecting all of these bits of info that he would tell her during vulnerable moments to use against him later. 
He also hasn't abused substances on a film set, something that we will also get reiterated from witnesses further into the trial. He also felt a great pain from his spine when he was in Pirates 4 and was prescribed Roxycodone, and that is when he started getting addicted to what they call Roxies. He then goes on to talk about when he met Amber. Now, it's also important to mention that, listen, I'm still I'm summarizing these things and I'm trying my best to talk about these clearly, but the way that each of these witnesses speak is very different. Some of them kind of speak in the same way that I do. Some of them took incredibly long to try and put sentences together. Some of them included a lot of unnecessary detail. And this particular case, the way that Johnny speaks is very rambly. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's very good to sit down and listen to because the way that he speaks is quite interesting and he does paint interesting stories, but there's a lot of unnecessary information. I understand that some of it is painting a picture, but um, a lot of this stuff took a long time to, to get out. So the way that I'm talking about it to you is very, very much getting to the, the core of what he was saying. Though, as usual, I do recommend watching this yourself if you want to get like a full picture of it. But the rambling is especially a bit difficult for me because like I said I'm limited with the amount of clips that I can use because the court footage type of channels are very trigger happy with what they consider to be copyright infringement so I have to try and edit it in a way where it shows completely what he's saying but it also gets rid of some unnecessary dead air and shit that doesn't actually matter to what the quote is you know what I mean he met Amber in 2008 and he was looking at the rum diaries manuscript and he was he was specifically looking for a woman to pe play the leading female role and found Amber and immediately thought that there was something special about her for the role. They were doing the shower scene in the film and there was a kiss and he said that it really made him feel like something special was happening. The kiss felt special to him. Then the relationship began and some more oddities started to appear before things completely went downhill. When she would go to bed and he was still awake, he'd say he's maybe gonna stay up and watch some TV for a bit. She would get all pissy because that wasn't acceptable to her. He had to go to bed at the same time as her, and she got really, really controlling about really odd things. She got some headway on one thing and she managed to make him placate her. She would immediately take that as a sign that she needed to reach further to take even more. He found himself suddenly just wrong about everything, even things that she was wrong about, she'd never admit that she was wrong. He couldn't have any good moments without her bringing something up to ruin it. Explaining himself and trying to sort out the problem would only escalate her mood, so the only thing that he found himself doing that worked was running away. She wouldn't let him speak. She'd go on to a blind rage of insults and a barrage of verbal abuse, and he wasn't allowed to have a voice, and he was slowly realizing that he was in a relationship with his mother. Too specific, um... Miss Heard, in her frustration and in her rage and her anger, strike out. She would. It, it could begin with a slap. It could begin with a, a shove. Um, it could begin with you know throwing a TV remote at my head. It could be. It was a constant. Uh, it was there was a, a built-in list of, of. Um, as I said. My personal experiences, which I gave to Miss Heard, if I continued to to try to um, present my my version or my side of the story, um, when you when you when you were approached in in a um, in a kind of um, well, when you were approached with such uh, anger and hatred. It seemed like pure hatred for me. Um, if I stayed to argue that, eventually I, I was sure that it was going to escalate into violence and oftentimes it did. This particular statement is incredibly powerful and it kind of took me off guard with how blunt it was when I was first making these notes, but I really see what he's saying. With the stuff that he said about his mom and the stuff that he says about Amber, it's really easy for at least a random bystander who's researching this to kind of 
put the dots together. The more he opened up to her, the more she used what he said in his vulnerable moments as ammunition. He'd hide in the bathroom like he did as a kid because, well, he knew that it worked. Or he hoped it did. She knew that he really cared about being a good father, so she'd make him think that he was a terrible father by constantly putting him down and saying that his kids don't want to see him like this and he's a horrible dad and he his kids were ashamed of him. So then he'd go into a tailspin and, emotionally wrecked, try to do whatever to placate her and keep him with her because he felt alone. And he stayed with Amber regardless of all these things because it's complicated. Probably related to his dad at some point. He doesn't really know what her motives were, but the arguments got worse every day. He doesn't know why she wanted to argue like that, why she fought so much. He says that it must feed some sort of need she had for conflict. He thinks that she has a need for conflict and it just comes out of nowhere. He didn't understand why she was so wonderful at first and that it turned out to be this way, but he flashed back to his dad leaving and his mom attempting suicide every time he would think about leaving and it made him stay. Amber had often spoke about suicide on multiple occasions and used this as a manipulative weapon. He stayed because he quite frankly did not want to break her heart. When he tried to leave, she would cry and scream about how she can't live without him and he can't leave, making a scene if there were people around, as one example is in a parking lot in front of guards. He said that he first started recording their arguments, aka some of the evidence that you'll hear in the trial, because sometimes she'd insult him and abuse him verbally and it was like a huge blind rage, but after it was finished, she would act like it never happened and even outright deny what had happened, as if she just wasn't there. She was told that he was going to record it and he agreed. And his reason that he told her was that he wanted her to hear what she sounded like since she would deny that it happened. Then, he found out that this backfired because it was clear that she was simply performing for the tape. She was performing for the recording so that she would have something of ammunition again to hold over his head when he played it back for her, so it didn't work when she knew she was being recorded. And as as I said before, she said that she was completely fine with the recording and then decided that she would record without telling him. When she was on tape, uh, it, the first time it wouldn't, it, it, it escalated a bit, but she was, well, it was clear that she was performing for the tape because it was being recorded. So. That was uh, another clue that something was slightly rotten in the state of Denmark, as it were. There was a term that would float around between them and between the people they knew. Monster. She initially had used the word demon to explain what was coming out of her when she went into these blind rages, but the word monster is something that applied to him. She'd call him a monster and he wouldn't want to sit there and argue with her. To him, it became a kind of nickname. When he was little, his mom would give him a nickname based on things that he had been through to try and demean him, to make it an insulting nickname, and he would learn to just not react to it and not really feel anything about it. His, because he had an issue with his eye when he was born, she would call him One Eye to try and dig at him in that way, and Amber would then call him Monster. The, the back of the lens is spherical, uh, normally. Um, is spherical, so this eye isn't normal. This eye, I was born um, with a more conical uh, lens, so uh, my brain never learned to see out of my left eye. And they noticed when I was about uh, three, four, five, three, four, that I had a, a lazy eye, a wandering eye, and um, um, she would call me, she would call me cockeye, one eye, um, any, anything, anything she could get to, to, uh, uh, demean, humiliate. And this is just my opinion here, but it seems like there was a lot of gaslighting involved. They don't particularly bring up the term gaslighting a lot, but I'm going to use it because I really think that there is. Not only from Amber, but from Team Turd in the trial. Even when Johnny was off substances, she'd still call him monster to gaslight him. As for the substance usage, 
and Amber's behavior and the stuff that Chrissy was talking about, he confirms that they did have to get an extra hotel room for him to hide in. It broke him down, but yet the alcohol was still an escape to calm him down, to make the pain go away. He didn't do it to get excited, he did it to get by. So that kind of environment, he says, got him to keep running to alcohol to calm him and to help him and to placate, to decrease the violence. Verbally, she had told him to abstain from the substances and had been very blunt about it. Yet, through her actions, she seemed to think the opposite. Or maybe she was trying to goad him into taking substances again because she wanted to see him fail. She continued to drink wine and drink wine with him, and she really wasn't supportive in her actions to kind of go along with his detoxification. Now, at this point, it gets kind of funny because Rottenborn starts objecting like mad again, as he does, and Johnny starts getting sick of the objections, so he starts making fun of Rottenborn a little bit each time when he does it. I'm just gonna keep prattling on with the story to not try and interrupt too much, but when these things happen, I will play the clips because I think they're pretty funny. Apparently, she would drink two bottles of wine per night, and she was fond of that real expensive shit, like $500 per bottle. What he found is that when he was getting off the drugs, she asked if he could stop drinking, and then c she would continue drinking in front of him. He had one time shown up to support Christopher Lee for an award ceremony, and Lee was surprised that Johnny was there, and it was a good mood all around. Johnny had been doing very well with the alcohol control, and he had not had any, and he had not been drunk for a while. So, there was some champagne offered, and Johnny thought, well, I can handle it now, it's not gonna spiral into anything, it's not a big deal, it's just a small bit. You know, for social things, when you pose with the champagne and whatnot, tiny glass. He then picked up Amber for dinner, and was being honest about the fact that he had had a tiny bit of alcohol, but it wasn't a big deal. It was just literally for the picture, and he wasn't sitting there trying to drink a lot of it or anything. And she, at the time, was also sitting there and drinking lots of wine. She, hearing him say this, went into an absolute mental rage. So they had to leave the dinner place because she was trying to make a scene in front of everyone about how bad he was being. She then continued to go off about his mental alcoholic shit and that his kids would be disappointed in him. Johnny then asked if Amber would stop drinking in order to support him and his detox. She said that she didn't have a problem with alcohol, so she wouldn't stop drinking, and she was also doing other things like mushrooms, speed, MDMA, you name it. She then claimed that he had struck her after she commented on one of his tattoos, and this is one of the allegations that came out that she told the public, and he says that this is completely false. What had really happened is she had had an issue with his tattoo of a former girlfriend. He had kept the tattoo, because it's a tattoo, and he changed it a bit to be funny and to erase the name. It was originally Winona for Winona a writer and he had changed it to Wino. Amber had been very encouraging of getting a tattoo of her on his skin, and after that it started to get worse. The reason that they had met up with Dr. Kipper and started the whole detoxification thing is because Chrissy had read Kipper's book on addiction, and they had gotten contact, and the nurse Debbie had come over after this. Amber had been looking for a fight. By the time the plane incident had happened, he was also struggling with opiates, and there's a thing that he calls on the nod, where you kind of go into dreamland and function, but you don't remember anything. He was on the plane, drawing, and he was just kind of vibing in dreamland, so he wasn't entirely there. But he was also being verbally abused by her, and he decided to go and hide in the bathroom with a pillow to lie on the floor and kind of sleep it off until they land. After the plane ride, Amber was upset, and that might have been one of the reasons she went to stay at a chateau instead of be around him. She had to get out of there, I guess. He says that he would bypass some withdrawal symptoms by scalding water in the shower to distract his nerves from the withdrawal pain. It seemed like Amber would deny him medication when he needed it because she was just kind of there to get to see him in pain. Again, not necessarily what he said word for word, it was just something that I kind of cobbled together to think I think that's what's happening. Like with the word gaslighting, I think that that's pretty much what's going on, but not just in the exact phrasing. He would then ask for time away to get his detox over and done with, and this is because she clearly wasn't supporting him, yet she would make a big stink about this for him going away. But he then finally got her to leave her alone so he could detox in peace for a couple of nights. The sense that I got from some of the stuff in the story so far is that he had a rush to marriage with her to placate her, that he wasn't going to abandon her because of all of the times that she would cry and say that he was leaving her. At the wedding, all of her friends were doing MDMA. Just all of them were out of their fucking minds. Rottenborn objects to this because he could tell Johnny was about to say hearsay. He hasn't even said anything yet, but Mr. Psychic over here just had to object beforehand. You fuckhead. 
So they were talking about prenups, and she was going on and on about how she wasn't even in the will. To, you know, if in case you die, I'm not gonna get stuff from you, and that concerns me. Like, what the fuck? Amber was saying that this must be some trick to give her nothing if he were to die during the marriage. Which, bringing that up over and over again is just a bit mental, and he didn't trust her because of this. And, and him, you know, thinking it was weird to bring that up, to her, meant that he didn't trust her. He tried to remove himself from the situation, sensing a fight brewing, and she went mental again. This was in the house that he was staying in Australia for the Pirates 5 production, so he would run and lock himself into empty rooms that were available. One time, she was banging on the door of one of these rooms, and he heard her walk away. This was following an incident where she had lied about some lawyers abusing her, and he had yelled at these lawyers, but he then found out from them that she had lied about the incident. So she walks away after banging the door that he was hiding in, and he leaves the room he was locked into. He goes downstairs to the rec room area with the pool, table, and bar. He then decided to take a drink, and she found him there and went mental. She picked up a bottle and hurled it at him. It missed him by a bit and smashed into the wall behind him. He then took a large bottle of vodka, poured a shot, and then put the bottle back. She grabbed this heavy bottle and threw that one at him. This time, it hit. He was sitting and had his fingers along the edge of the bar countertop. The fingers were kind of hanging over the side because he was holding the edge of the countertop and leaning backwards. The bottle hit where his fingers were hanging over and because the bottle was so heavy, it just smashed, glass went everywhere and his finger came off. That I had uh, smashed it in, um, in, in these large accordion doors that it got caught in the accordion doors. Why would you lie about that? I didn't feel, I, I didn't want to disclose that it was, to disclose that it had been misheard, that it had thrown, the, thrown a vodka bottle out to get her in trouble. I didn't want to, I, I tried to uh, just keep things as copacetic and as, as easy as possible for everyone. I, I, did, I did not want to. Put her name in that in that mix. He didn't feel anything initially because he was just kind of in shock. It, there was a strange heat, but not pain. But there was a vague feeling of something dripping. The tip of his finger had been severed. He then had a nervous breakdown at this point and wrote in blood on the walls and started hiding around the house. Amber saw this and started yelling again, but he just couldn't tune into what anyone was saying at this point. It was just noise. He then lied to the doctor that his finger got caught in a door because he didn't feel like he wanted to disclose that it was domestic. Dr. Kipper was eventually told the story, however. After that, Johnny said he was done. He didn't want any argument or violence, he was just done. After you returned from the hospital, where did you go? I went to Malcolm Connolly's um, apartment uh, and uh, slept on his couch. And to the extent that you know, where was Miss Heard during this time? Um, Miss Heard uh, was. I, I wasn't there, but I, I had. A, it was clear that she had to. Uh, she needed to leave. And uh, I'd asked them to get her on a flight from Melbourne or Sydney or wherever back to Los Angeles. Why did you ask for that? I, I didn't want to see her. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to see her. I didn't want to have any more arguments i was uh for all intents and purposes i was just done during this moment as well amber had put a cigarette out on his face the picture that they show is horrible i can't show you this picture but if you were to watch the testimony you will definitely see it it's pretty bad. The following day, they found a surgeon to help attach the finger. He lied to the doctor. The doctor saw through this because the injuries weren't consistent with any other types of accidents. Rottenborn then objects to this. You fuckhead. Johnny had to keep on bandages and a oh, pin in his finger and a lot of stuff like that for a while because when you're reattaching a finger, it's a big deal. There's a lot of like medical shit going on. You got to change bandages a lot, a lot of different medications. And it's a very complicated issue, which means that it can get infected really easily. In Johnny's case, the pain seems to be getting a lot worse. It became a 12 out of 10, according to him. 
it was very hot, like a throbbing, and they found out that it was infected with a flesh-eating virus called the MRSA. That was some horrible shit, and he was in agony. They then show after she had punched him on the staircase, March 2015. This picture was one of the pictures taken by Sean Bett. There was a confrontation, and they were in Penthouse 5. Her office was at the top of the stairs, but it took place on the landing a bit below hand. She was trying to hit him, and Whitney had stepped in the way. Whitney, stepping in front of Amber, was facing Amber to stop her from hitting. Despite this, Amber managed to reach around Whitney and punch Johnny in the face. Penthouse 5 area, which was where uh, Ms. Hurd had her office at the top of the stairs. And so the, the stairs came down and then there was a, a landing and then another set of stairs went down the opposite direction. Uh, and uh, this took place on the landing um, where she was uh, coming out, you know, trying to uh, well, trying to get to me, trying to hit me, trying to do anything she could, and um, and then Whitney, her sister, was there who <clears throat> who stepped in the way. And uh, interesting thing that was was that inter what was interesting was that now is that Whitney stepped in front of Amber and was facing Amber to stop Amber and uh, and uh, when she was in between us Amber snuck in the she reached got the roundhouse in and then we get to the audio recordings. He's trying to ask if she remembers some horrible things that she did, and she keeps interrupting him to say that there were a lot of things going on and she was on Ambien, so it's not her fault. She's then trying to gaslight him, and she says like, why are you so upset? Why do you remember things differently and, and being a bitch? I'm, I'm telling you if, you, if you lost memory last night of kicking me out the door with the fucker hitting me, yeah, and you admit, and you're the next piece of audio is him trying to explain why he walks away from things, why he wants to hide, why he wants to de-escalate in the ways that he does. And she screams that he's hiding because he's hiding from them resolving issues. He's saying that she's only interested in fighting and that's why he runs away, but she's claiming that he's running away from any sort of solution to the problems. She then admits to throwing pots and pans and other things in other audio and gaslighting him and accusing him of gaslighting. She's talking so fucking fast. So there's a lot of stuff to get through, but she does admit that she was hitting him. This is some now infamous audio that I'm sure you've heard before, saying that you were not punched, you were hit, and I'm not sitting here and bitching about it, and then screams at him to grow the fuck up after he was hit by her. I noticed that also, through the rambling as he talks, he does stutter a whole lot when he's talking about more emotional things. Again, I'm no expert on anything, but I, I just, it's something that I noticed when I was watching the testimony. Think of that what you will, if that means anything. One time, he had been pushing the bathroom door, trying to close it. She was trying to bang on the door and open it, and he was trying to hide away, so he obviously didn't want her to get into the room. Suddenly, she yelped and cried that her toes were hurt. He stopped and kneeled down to make sure that she was okay because she was claiming that her toes had been run over by the door when he was trying to push it closed. Seeing him resurface to check on her, she then clocked him in the jaw. There's another picture of him covered in scratches, where she had gone at him with her nails. One time, he was walking around, and she started punching him from behind. So, he tried to get her into a bear hug to stop from being hit by her. It's not to hurt her, it's just to try and get her to stop hurting him. But even in that position, she was trying her best to kick him, hurt him, somehow, because she was in a blind rage. During the struggle, they touched foreheads briefly because they kind of bumped into each other. Remember, she's wiggling around trying to hit and hurt him, and he's trying to keep her away from him. Because of this light headbutt, Amber then accused him of breaking her nose, but there was no blood or bruising around the nose. He could see that her nose was not broken, but she then walked away and came back about eight minutes later with a red tissue that was on her nose. The tissue had a lot of red marks on it, and she was saying that it was blood because her nose was bleeding. He thought this was weird because he didn't actually hit her or anything, so how could that have happened? But he went into placation mode 
and just kind of dealt with it. Like, sure, okay. He wanted to see the nose to see if there was something that he could do and to assess the damage, but she was really defensive about it and wouldn't let him actually see her nose at all. He then waited for her to walk away and drop the tissue into a bin because something was off about this whole scenario and he didn't really want to ask her about it because he knew that it would set her off. He pulled out the tissue from the bin and it was nail polish. There was no blood on it. It was just red nail polish. The fights started getting worse. She was focusing on the verbal abuse aspect because she knew she had a lot of things in her arsenal to say against him that would hurt. On their island for a holiday, Johnny had set up an easel and some painting supplies. She sat down and then there was an escalating argument. She then threw a can of methylated spirits at him and it struck his nose. His children were around and apparently saw this happen and there was also some staff there that witnessed this. The staff that witnessed the altercation were also in view so he had seen them witness it as well. He then texted Amber saying that he's going to be late for her birthday dinner on the eve of her birthday. He kept apologizing over and over again but he had to be late because there was a very important meeting that he had to attend to. He left to get the birthday gift at the penthouse and then saw a text from Amber while he was on his way there saying to bring some wine. He then went to go and retrieve the wine and by the time that he was actually there, he was about two hours late. She then decided to get angry at him and would talk to her friends occasionally and lean in to give him an earful of why he was so horrible and she was so embarrassed about how late he was. He just placated her, smiled and got through it. She had been drinking some wine before he got there as well and she was continuing to drink. When everyone left, Amber got mental and said a bunch of abusive shit. Johnny was just done with everything and thought she was being childish and it felt unfair to be so mad about the kind of thing that he clearly had explained beforehand and it being important. He didn't want to argue though so he just went to bed to read. She then came in after she had gotten ready for bed and she was still in the mood for a fight. She came around to his side of the bed and he said he was leaving. She squared off at him in the doorway and he was like, what, gonna hit me? Hit me then. And Amber did so. Twice. He said, good, now you're done. And made her sit on the bed, grab some of his shit and left. Then he didn't see her until the May 21st incident. He was done. He'd said that he'd wanted to go down to the house to pick up some stuff while she was away at some Coachella thing because she wouldn't be there to accost him and he just wanted his stuff and to be done with it. But Sean Bett, who was there, said that... Johnny shouldn't come over right now, it's not a good time. Johnny asked why. Sean then showed him a picture of Amber's big shit that she had taken on the bed. She had gotten angry and pooped on his bed out of anger. He was even laughing a bit as he told the story because holy shit. Literally. It's hearsay. That was... According to the defense, anyway. Yes. Yeah, I was gonna say. I'm talking about his mother's nuts now. I'm grotesque. <laughs> Here it comes. And <laughs> cruel. Oh, um, and then I was shown a picture. Of <laughs> what was the problem. picture? I had gone to Mr. Bet and said, uh, she's, in Coachella. she's at Coachella. I think it's a good time to go downtown so that I can get some of my things, you know, and uh, get them out of there, especially the things that were uh, uh, precious to me, you know, children, things, things from friends. That's when you next saw her, not her Hunter, DNA. Thompson, whatever, things that were important to me. And he said, I don't think now's a good time to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's the perfect time. She's not going to be home for two days. What was the photograph of Mr. Depp? Yes. <laughs> say it. Say it. It was a. It was a. <laughs> he can't. There's no way to a photograph of the bed, our bed, um, and on my side of the bed. Um, <laughs> was human fecal matter. <laughs> um, so I Object, your honor, he's not a biologist. <laughs> to go down there. Now it's time for the intermission. To stop you from having a conniption from a horrifying court drama, have a break. I did a watch together with some friends, and here's a clip of it. Check out the links in the description. So I, I, it's fair enough to give it the third episode to, to wow me, to impress me. I give anime three episodes, even when they suck. 
and when oh, anime please. sucks, it really sucks. <laughs> I'll fucking put my head through the wall after this. <laughs> Are you the avatar? Do I gotta do that? <laughs> I'll figure something out. I always do. A veggies will hold a revolution. It tells me. Wait, I always do. Does he like? Does he do crime for money? <laughs> That, oh, will, no. that will be really interesting. Yeah, you know because what? That would be. So it doesn't happen. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> Spoilers! Like, every time you think, man, wouldn't it be interesting? Like, no, stop. <laughs> stop it. You're wrong immediately. On the 21st, he said goodbye to his mom for the last time, and she passed away. He was even able to forgive her for the abuse in his mind, because it was so a big moment for him, in terms of perspective. Talking to her as she was sick, and all of this kind of stuff was a major moment in his life. He decided that he was going to divorce Amber. Not mentioning any of the abuse, and just saying that he, they needed a divorce because he wanted to get things over with. He didn't want to go through any of the mess that would come with domestic abuse charges and any of the other stuff like that. He just wanted it done. But Amber wanted to talk things through. Amber tried to blame the shit on the bed on the dogs, but Johnny didn't believe it for a second because he knew those dogs. He had seen those dogs and the turds that the dogs produced were not big enough for the bed. He also had his security on hand to listen for if she wanted to start fighting because she had gotten into a fighting mood quite often and it was good to have security there to make sure nothing happened. He would also be able to then leave as well and they would be able to help him. One time she was screaming at someone on the phone and the dude had hung up so Amber got really riled up. Johnny had walked to the fridge and Amber was sitting on the couch. Rocky Pennington ran in and said, leave her alone, leave her alone, as if there was some sort of setup to catch him in the act of being abusive, even though he was far away from her and didn't do anything. Amber was on the phone to her friend and screaming that she was being hit, even though she wasn't at all. But it was though her friend, but it was so that her friend could hear her so being attacked, I guess. She was surprised that the bodyguards then came in to witness that Johnny was nowhere near her and she decided to start screaming that he had hit her before they came in, but now he was far away from her. So I, I, I guess they just didn't see the abuse, even though there were no marks on her. He also said that his kids didn't like Amber and didn't like the way that she treated him. On the 27th of May, he saw that Amber had went to a court and she was talking about the abuse with a brown mark on her face. It was also the same day that the Alice movie had been opening as well, so interesting time. He was in Europe, so he couldn't even get there, and she was just getting a restraining order while he wasn't there. In some text to Johnny, Amber said, I only filed the charges because I didn't know what to do, claiming that all of the abuse charges were just because, I don't know. They published the texts and, and Karen looks fucking mental. She really does not want those texts to be published. She had gone to a court, it was, I don't know, some court and there were paparazzi everywhere and her and a um, <clears throat> brown mark on her face. Um, About this. That it made no sense to me. It it, 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 it just didn't make any sense to me, especially about, well, as long as you don't file, nobody will know. Nah, it just didn't, I, again, I'm not all that familiar with these types of things, but if, uh, when he first saw those articles about the abuse, he told Chrissy and the kids and his band. He had to because it was all suddenly unraveling. He thought that he was leaving the stuff behind and he was the one being abused and he just wanted it over with, but now she was going to the public and telling everyone that he was a horrible person even though none of these things happened. But as these things go, people would believe it and he would have to confront the people that he knew to plead with them not to believe it and to say this is nonsense. As soon as he got the allegations, the calls for movies, the agents, everything stopped. All of the opportunities stopped because he was now a marked man. Then the Me Too movement exploded and it skyrocketed the horror. He said that as this was happening, he just broke down crying from the stress. Everyone around him was scrutinizing him, questioning him and marking him as a perpetrator for something that he didn't do. The divorce was finalized in January 2017. The proceedings were resolved. He did want to fight it because there was no truth to everything, but he didn't really know what he could do. 
She had wanted seven million dollars for the settlement, and he wasn't really given much of a choice. He had to pay it up. She said in the joint statement that she would be donating the money to a children's charity and also to the ACLU. She had made statements that the seven million dollars was going to be split up between the two, and she had said this to the press. This was a breach of their agreement, where she wasn't supposed to talk to the press, but she did it anyway. He then got his lawyers to make payments to the charities on Amber's behalf. And Amber got mad and said that he should have paid her the money because he was trying to avoid a tax break or something. The money was going to end up in charity anyway, so why did it matter that it went directly to them? But anyway, a couple days after this, Disney had removed him from their projects and he had not even learned about it from them directly. He had learned about it from an article where they had spoken about it. So he was not even involved in something that he should have been notified about. Now, with all of that out of the way, there comes the cross-examination. Rottenborn pulls up the op-ed again, the one that this in whole case is about, and he says some stupid shit that immediately sounds slimy as fuck. Have a listen. Do you see that? You see of Paul Bettany and, and the things, drugs that you did together, and there was a question, the question is, any sort of pills? And your answer is yes, there could have been Xanax, or if he needed, if he asked for Xanax or Adderall, whatever, I would of course give it to him. Question, so you would supply Paul Bettany with whatever medication or controlled drugs he asked for, is that right? Answer, if he was feeling anxious or if he was feeling unpleasant, I would give him what he asked for. Question, would you give him a Xanax? Answer, yes. Did I read that right? You certainly did, yes, sir. And you shared, um, the two of you shared an enjoyment of controlled drugs or alcohol at that time, right? Um... The two of us were making a film uh, together. Um, with, with respect, sir, that, that wasn't my question. My question was, the okay. two of you shared an, an enjoyment of controlled drugs. He's in the middle of asking about which version of the article, because there is an online version and an in-print version, which have several differences. And especially because the one in the exhibit that is being published is the printed one, not the online one. There is a very big difference and there needs to be an acknowledgement that there's a difference because they're questioning him about it. However, Rottenborn just cuts him off and acts like it doesn't fucking matter. Until later on in the court, it will matter. Rottenborn tries to argue that Johnny was not mentioned by name in the article and therefore no one could tell it was about him because I guess if you say every single detail besides someone's name, no one can put the dots together to figure it out. Depp mentions as such that this is ridiculous, but he gets steamrolled by Rottenborn, who's there on a mission. Every time Johnny tries to talk to add some context, Rottenborn shuts him down and says that he has to be respectful of the jury's time. Now, I partially agree, yes, Johnny does ramble a bit, but this is not about rambling, this is about context, and Rottenborn definitely does not want this context to come out because it will make Amber look bad, and he's using a very slimy reason of respecting the jury's time to justify cutting Johnny off in this manner. Depp then asks about what the difference between the article and the online article are, and Rottenborn proceeds to completely dodge the question, even though the differences are very important to establish when you're trying to question a witness. He then tries to make Johnny say that Johnny knew that he was going to be out of Pirate 6 before the op-ed was published, when that's not true. Her biographical experiences after she separated from you. Correct? I, I, I can't say that. Okay. Now, you're claiming that due to Amber's allegations of abuse, you can't be in Pirate 6. Correct? Um, I, I'm, I'm saying that after uh, everything had... Uh, um, basically hit its media targets and the hit pieces kept coming, it would be, I mean, I would be a real simpleton to not think that there was an effect on my career based on Ms. Hurd's words, whether they mentioned my name or not. You became aware prior to the publication of this op-ed that you were likely out for Pirate 6. The Disney was considering dropping or, or dramatically shrinking your role, correct? No. Johnny wasn't even aware of the article before this point, and it's weird that they said that they were going to remove him when they didn't even talk to him about this. Disney just said this and decided to make a decision without consulting the individual because they wanted to look good in the public. Not only that, but they still had his merchandise, the Jack Sparrow merchandise with his face on it and the Disney rides that featured his face. 
They still wanted to make money off of him, but they didn't want to associate with him beyond that because they wanted to be good and panda to the woke audience. This is just what Disney does. Disney is slimy, and we shouldn't expect anything better of them. Johnny was also advised by his attorneys to not fight until after the op-ed had been published. Rottenborn then acted like it was Depp's personal opinion, even though the document that it is in is attorney's opinion, not Depp's opinion. It was something the attorney had said. <laughs> this is not Depp's personal opinion. You're a lawyer, you're supposed to know these things. He then brings up the divorce document and says, did you sign this and it says no one made any claims for anything? So that means that it's all exactly as the document says. Trial where you could respond to Amber's accusations of abuse, did you? No, there were no charges pressed against you me. Chose she didn't not tell to... the police that I had done anything. She didn't mention my name. And, and you, didn't, you didn't have a California divorce judge decide these facts, did you? Objection has been answered. You, you, chose, objection. you chose not to try to clear your name at that time through any sort of legal proceeding, correct? Objection has been answered. I'll, I'll sustain the objection. Next and question. you chose to sign a divorce agreement in which you stated that Amber had not made any false statements about you for financial gain. We looked at that, correct? Object. Then he barely lets Johnny answer the question. And I also think that this is particularly interesting because if you think about it from Amber's perspective, Amber alleges that abuse did happen. So if Rottenborn is asking this about the document and saying, well, you said that no, no abuse happened from either party, so why are you saying abuse happened now? He'll have to admit the same thing for Amber. Why is she saying abuse happened when she signed the document that said no abuse happened from either party, Martin Bourne? He keeps cutting Johnny off and saying, yes or no, Mr. Depp, yes or no, for questions that need more of a answer than yes or no. Johnny has to clarify that Amber was mad and accusatory even when he was not on substances. When she thought he was on substances or wanted to accuse him of being on substances, that does not necessarily mean that he was on anything. It's a very important distinction. He then brings up Johnny's dramatic texts. They're, they're pretty cringe. <laughs> they're very cringe, actually. <laughs> but they're not important. None of them are important. And when Johnny tries to give any context that might be valuable for the text, he doesn't get to say anything. They bring up the infamous Marilyn Manson bender for like four seconds. <laughs> And then they bring up people who work with him. Like, oh yes, they these people try and get you drugs because they're all yes men. They're all yes men. They then bring up a statement that he made without any context to some random tabloid and say that this is proof that all of his, his people are yes men. Alright? They then pull up the drug picture. Ooh, spooky. Drugs. Rottenborn keeps bringing up the UK testimony, even though this is a completely different setting. The UK has completely different laws to America. That's why they're here. That's why they're live streaming. Th what are you doing? He tries to just assert that Johnny was drinking heavily without any evidence, and Johnny's like, were you there? The UK testimony didn't even contradict the, the statements, so I don't know what the point of this is. Shut up, Rottenborn. He tries to pressure Johnny into saying that there was a perception that his kids thought he wasn't there for them or something, which is just completely out of whack for the line of questioning. They then play a recording that doesn't really prove that she was constantly caring for him during his withdrawal. It's just a recording of her complaining. I think it's kind of funny because they know that Depp's team has so many recordings of Amber straight up admitting that she was hitting him, abusing him, and straight up abusing him in these recordings, yet they think that they can pull like a gotcha moment and have be like, well, we have recordings of our own. But all of their recordings are completely crappy. None of the recordings that they provide show anything that is good for their case. They pull up a picture of him passed out with ice cream <laughs> after he had worked a 16 hour day and had had some opiates as well. He had passed out on the sofa. Amber had took a picture of him spilling some ice cream because she, I, I don't know, she thought it was funny, I guess. Rottenborn is like, so, by taking this picture, she as was at fault for the picture being taken. And it's like, yes, <laughs> that's how that works. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> he then keeps trying to get Johnny to say that he doesn't get high off of the opiates. I don't know what this line of questioning is. I am so confused. They then bring up that he has said a few times that he struck couches and punched walls when he was frustrated. And this was specifically when he was younger. So I think it's very interesting that Rottenborn has brought it up because if you recall, he specifically said that Chrissy bringing up Johnny being a good boy as a child was not relevant to him as an adult. So why are they bringing up stuff about him 
punching couches when he was younger, when he's an adult now. Why does that matter, Rottenborn? He also wrote some jokey texts after having issues in his hotel room. You can see the people watching this smiling because they know that these are obvious jokes, but Rottenborn is trying his damnedest to make it sound like everything in here should be taken literally. I don't know why he thinks that's going to work. It's obviously not working. You can see the reactions from everyone. Remember how I said if you're thinking something, the jury might be thinking it as well? Same shit. They obviously aren't buying what Rottenborn is selling. They bring up some unrelated lawsuit about someone apparently suing Depp for some reason, but it doesn't really go anywhere. They kind of like sneak it between the wall punching and the hotel room stuff, just like, oh, here's the little piece of gossip for you. One time some lady was being overtly handsy and affectionate toward Amber on the plane, and Depp removed her hands and told her off. Just, you know, like you would if someone is trying to overtly flirt with your significant other, and you obviously don't want that to happen, and it's just whatever, normal. Yet, Rottenborn paints the situation as if he was yelling and being really aggressive towards some woman for no reason. One time Johnny punched a bathroom sconce during an ensuing argument, and they bring up some more texts that don't really prove anything, so, you know. If anything, throughout the trial, it shows that yes, Johnny is a flawed man, but he's not an abuser. <laughs> they also bring up that he was thinking that she was cheating on him with James Franco. Now, this is something that comes up later. I don't think it's entirely resolved. I think that the way that you would get answers for that is for some gossip sites or whatever, and since I'm only really dealing with the court case and stuff that is more put up for evidence, I don't really want to go into those types of things, but it does come up a couple times. This lawyer is so fast he can't even keep up with what he is saying, let alone Johnny. He's trying to paint Johnny as a raging blackout drunk during the plane incident that I talked about before when Johnny was hiding in the bathroom. And Johnny is trying to explain that he wasn't drunk, but Rottenborn keeps interrupting and putting words in his mouth. Johnny was also trying to clarify his answer and being pressured into saying yes to everything, because so much was being asked at once and Johnny was really tired, so he said, whatever, sure, whatever, and it's clearly that's what's being said in, in the piece of evidence that Rottenborn is citing, but Rottenborn's just like, but you said yes, that's all there is to it, you said yes. They then play some audio of him making funny noises. They're just playing lots of him making funny noises and something Amber said, I guess, but you can't really hear what she says. Johnny also clarifies that the noises weren't from the plane flight, so what is the point in playing them while you're discussing the plane flight? Did you just not remember when they were taken? Then Rottenborn tries to argue that maybe Amber was withholding drugs because she was maybe in contact with the doctors and it's the doctor's fault because they told her to withhold drugs. However, Johnny would see when she would contact the doctors she would be on the phone and over the radio and out loud saying these things, so he was there to witness that that was not the instructions given. Rottenborn says Johnny praising Amber during certain times when he had to placate her and whatnot means that everything is fine and she did nothing wrong. <laughs> Just openly stomping on any abuse victims anywhere who ever had to placate their abusers by saying nice things about them. <laughs> So Johnny had made a statement about how for 18 months straight at a certain point he had not been drunk at all and that was a really good thing because he was on his detox thing and you know. So Rottenborn then says that despite Johnny making this statement, Johnny's lying and then just asks another question and doesn't even have a point to, to saying that? I don't know where he was going. He answers the question himself and then moves on. He then brings up an exhibit and doesn't even ask Johnny if Johnny knows what it is. So the plaintiffs need a copy so they know what the fuck is going on and Rottenborn is being all impatient as if they don't need to see it. <laughs> Classy. They then try to present him as a depressed alcoholic who was lying on an official Disney document about his sobriety and they keep taking out the most tiny snippets of context that don't even necessarily prove anything. <laughs> they don't prove anything for or against Johnny, they're just irrelevant. They're reading out these emails as if they, as if they prove something. They, they do this with a bunch of texts that he said repeatedly, they just try and bring it out as if it means anything when it's just a waste of time. If anything, they just show that Johnny is a dramatic teenage girl. Rottenborn then flubs a bunch of dates and gets them wrong and there's this really confusing bit where everyone doesn't know what the fuck is going on including me. That was published on December 18th, 2018. Correct? Uh, uh, let's say December 19th on it. You, I 
the top of the page. Doesn't that say December 19th, 2018? Go ahead and I believe that, that the, the 2018 was the online, was it not? Okay, so December 18th, December 19th, this piece in the middle of the page is the opinion piece. Mr. Johnny at one point was asking for drugs in the text. It's like I said before, it's like a sort of exasperated, oh, I wish I could just have this thing that I'm not allowed to have type of thing. That he doesn't actually want it or he doesn't actually get it, but he's just venting a frustration about it. It also doesn't prove that he ingested anything. He says that he wants something, it doesn't mean that he's going to end up getting it. For some weird reason Rottenborn thinks that this is a gotcha moment. He also argues that Johnny's sliced finger was the only one thing that he maintained as an injury and there was no glass in the finger or something. They also get stuck on the finger painting on the walls for like way too long but the only interesting parts about that will come later so I'm kind of gonna skip over it for now. All of the impeachment is just shit that doesn't necessarily prove anything it's just like statements that need clarification or statements that don't actually contradict each other but they're being presented as if they do it's uh not very effective rottenborn then gets the page number wrong for one of the impeachment documents and the entire thing is just <laughs> it just derails from there they get super into when i cut my finger my finger was chopped off or something and listen when i first saw that and he said when i cut my finger off i thought that it sounded like that as well, but they also clarify that the way that Johnny was saying it was a bit fucky, so there's also evidence to show that his finger was cut off not by him, but by the bottle being thrown at him, so I understand why it's very confusing to get into, but there's not as much of a gotcha as Rottenborn thinks there is in that statement. Rottenborn then plays some audio and insists that the audio says something that Johnny does not agree it says. Rottenborn tries to steamroll him to agree what the recording says, but it doesn't happen. Rottenborn is also getting incredibly rattled and it's really starting to show. I think Johnny knows it too because he kind of ramps up the sass. There's a text to Amber's brother saying that it's just saying some crap. It's just crap. Rottenborn, what the fuck? They bring up instances where he called her a cunt as a term of endearment, mind you. Like, cunt and any other, like, you know, ooh, it's a bad word kind of thing means different things on the in the context, especially as an Australian I can say that because cunt can basically mean anything with the amount of times that I say it per day. And the way that they bring it up is really retarded because they're saying that, oh my god, he used the bad word, and then Johnny clarifies that this is used in a term of endearment kind of way. So it essentially disarms any other usage of him saying that. So if he were to call her a cunt in a mean way, it wouldn't seem as bad because of all the other times he's called her cunt. Good job, guys. They then play a video and they don't even give him a date for the video, so he kind of has to guess, but essentially it's this. There's a video of him being a bit grumpy and he's like slamming some glasses down and stuff like that. And he pours alcohol in the video, but he does not ingest any alcohol in the video. Not only that, but Amber is goading him on the entire time to try and get more of an aggressive reaction out of him. And during the part where she's trying to put the camera off and walk away, She's smirking. This is not helpful for her. If anything, it shows what Johnny is saying is true. There is this retarded text about a Honda Civic. It's basically him saying that he hopes a corpse is rotting in a Honda Civic. And uh, it's obviously just a retarded comment, but uh, they keep bringing it up. Like, let's talk about the Honda Civic. Like, oh, okay, I mean, do, do you just like the car or something? Oh, you think you have a point with that? I disagree. He thinks a blowjob innuendo text is a threat. They also try to paint him as a bigoted and offensive man for making a lesbian joke to his girlfriend who is bi. So, like, funny joke, haha. <laughs> I say worse shit to my friends, like, <laughs> I say worse shit to my dad, like, <laughs> what did they think was the point? No thank you, there's sperm on the pillows. This knife recording, I, d I don't even know what the point of this is. <laughs> we then get the testimony moving on to the next day. We're up to day eight now. And they bring up a more useless text. One time he called her a fat ass after she said put a cigarette out on someone else. And there's another couple recordings of her making claims at him. Roddenborn is just playing these without asking any questions. There's no like build up or foundation for questions. He's just like, let's play all of this and have a good time. And if anything, these recordings just make Amber sound like a shitbag. You know I have 
have a different side than you. And if I show them pictures and stuff, I'm sure they'll have even more different side. And in fact, if I tell them even more stuff, they'll have an even more clear picture of what I think are both sides. Maybe, but I, should you, show, maybe I should show but, them right. this. But you, that's true. You from can do the whatever you want. Uh, uh, you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever. Face. By the way, do it. I, I promise you, do it. Do whatever you, you want. You don't want me to do that. No, you only. There's this one time where he uses the term bloodbath. Now, obviously, as any person with a brain would think, bloodbath here is not being used to describe a literal bloodbath, it's being used to describe a nasty argument. And it's very clearly being used to describe a nasty argument. However, they go in on this as if it's proof that he, like, hit her and drew blood or something. I don't know exactly what they're going for. Either way, it's brought up way too much. Rottenborn is just going through playing every single instance of her clearly, metaphorically using the word hit when she says that Johnny hit her with something. And even if you isolate the recording and don't have context for it, it clearly just sounds like she's being metaphorical. Then they play snippets of him yelling in response to her yelling. And Rottenborn is insisting that Johnny agrees that she says get off me when Johnny doesn't agree and neither do I. He then interrupts Johnny in the middle of answering the fucking question. They're using it hitting the wall as if they're literally saying that she hit a physical wall instead of it being like, you know, a phrase that doesn't mean actually hitting someone. Like, all they're really doing here is establishing Establishing that Johnny is a drama queen. Their entire thing here is pretending that everything needs to be taken hyper literal. Like, you're not hitting the wall, you're actually being slammed into a physical wall. It's not working. Remember, what you're thinking is what the jury is probably thinking. If you can look at this text and say, this is definitely stupid shit and doesn't actually prove anything, congratulations, the jury was probably thinking that too. Rottenborn is like, you want to control her career, don't you? And starts going off about other people being bothered by Johnny being drunk or something. I don't know what's going on. There's no reason for the texts. Stop bringing up the text, no one fucking cares, Rottenborn! They then go back to the lesbian comment because it's just so offensive. It's so offensive, guys. Don't you know it's literal violence? There's a bunch of articles that they have, a big stack of articles, gossip mags, basically inflammatory headlines and essentially clickbait. You know how these things go, especially in the celebrity culture. But they're bringing it up as if this is somehow evidence against Johnny. Like, th these are just gossip mags. I don't understand why they think that this would matter. If anything, this shows that Johnny was heavily affected by the allegations because the gossip mags are all calling him an abuser. Rottenborn brings up The Sun, the newspaper that published an article specifically from one of their own journalists that said Johnny is an abuser. He sued them and he lost because the UK has different laws and whatnot. But this is a newspaper who is essentially having one of their own journalists write about him being an abuser. The incident with Amber that this whole trial is about is that she specifically wrote an op-ed that she then published using the Washington Post. The Washington Post, yes, they published it, but they aren't the ones who had a journalist, an in-house journalist, an employee, write it. It was specifically Amber, and it was Amber who continued to go to different publications and spew these false allegations. So, naturally, he's going to sue her. Rottenborn doesn't understand this very simple concept and decides to compare the two falsely as if they're the same thing. One of Johnny's assistants and friends was really disliking Amber because she made his son cry by bullying this man's son. Everything I hear about it just makes it sound worse. Oh, a uh, classic, classic moment. Classic Rottenborn Gamer moment when you object hearsay to your own question. Johnny also confirms that he runs away because he wanted to avoid any extremes, like the finger incident, which is what happened when he couldn't run away in time and he chose not to run away. It cost him his finger, basically. Johnny's response to Amber saying he vomited in his sleep every night is no, because yet again, it's another false allegation. There would be physical evidence and she would have sought some sort of medical attention if someone she knows was actually vomiting every single night. That is extremely alarming. They play more audio of her not letting him leave despite him saying he just wanted to leave to escape. I don't know why they thought that this would make Amber look good, it just makes Johnny look like he's telling the truth. She is screaming so much. She screams in every recording. Dear God, after I do this video, I'm gonna hear that in my sleep. In another recording, she says that he forced her to go and make an abuse accusation 
accusation, which I, I don't understand. And then she says the infamous, go tell the world that you were abused and no one will believe you. Quote. Again, I don't know why anyone would think that this makes her look good, but Benjamin's just built different. Johnny's first testimony is over. He will have a rebuttal later on, but we have to get through more witnesses for the plaintiff now. First up, we have Ben King, who is the house manager. He is very important because he was the one who found Depp's severed finger during the bottle incident, and he would be around the house a lot when he would see the aftermath of their abuse, the altercations, all of the stuff smashed on the floor, and he had pictures of these things. He also intimately knows the house because he manages it, so he's able to say what's out of place and how he knows it's out of place. He also has a lot of staff that he communicates directly with, and when they say something happened, he is able to then verify that information for himself. Very important witness. He'd interact with both Amber and Johnny on a daily basis when they needed to stay in his property, especially for Amber when Johnny was away. So Ben would often see Amber doing stuff on her own when Johnny was off at work. Amber would drink wine daily, and remember, this is not the first time we've heard this. He did witness Amber shouting something when they were getting ready to go out, but it was just some horrible noises and some loud footsteps. He didn't actually hear what she was saying. There was another argument where Amber yelled and Johnny walked away. Ben then says that Amber sounded like a spoiled teenage child, <laughs> especially with that being delivered in a British accent. That is brutal. He also began to observe a pattern where Amber would start screaming, Johnny would then walk away, and Amber would try to prevent him from doing so. Amber was also drinking a lot of wine, very frequently. He saw Amber in hysterics, crying, and Jerry Judge, Johnny's head of security, was trying to calm her down. The night that the finger incident happened, when Johnny's finger was severed, Ben, learning about this, had to go down to find the finger in the bar area, and everything was trashed. Directly at the end of the bar, the finger rested. It lay in a scrunched up piece of tissue paper. The vodka bottle was smashed, and bits of glass lay strewn around the area. He then put the finger on some ice in a bag to try and preserve it the best they could so they could get to the hospital and reattach it. Amber really did not want to go. She got super animatedly against it. She says, Ben, have you ever been so angry with someone that you just completely lost it with them? And Ben says no. Uh, Los An uh leave for Los Angeles. She was resistant to both of those suggestions, uh, very resistant. She really didn't want to go and said, I can't leave, I can't leave. You know, it'll be the end if I leave. She did say, um, Ben, have you ever been so angry with someone you just lost it with them? Um, uh, and I sort of said, uh, no, actually, I'm pretty calm, you know, even tempered guy. Um, but she did repeat it. She looked pretty incredulous that I hadn't, and she repeated Amber was apparently very surprised to hear that he didn't feel this way. Rottenborn, during the cross-examination of Ben King, is like, But you don't know everything, because you weren't fucking sleeping in between them at night 24-7, so you don't fucking know. Rottenborn then tries to make the case that Johnny was just fucking drunk. <laughs> and then he says, Johnny took his penis out, didn't he? <laughs> and Ben's like, you fucking what? <laughs> They're also trying to make the case that since Ben the property manager is very discreet with his more high-profile guests, as you would imagine, because of all of the press and the paparazzi who want the info about where these guests are staying and what they're doing, and Ben does have to be discreet about it. Uh, Rottenborn's trying to make the case that because Ben is being discreet, he's lying and he's on Johnny's payroll, I guess? Is that all you got, Rottenborn? Seriously? That's pathetic, man. Rottenborn keeps trying to impeach him with, again, non-contradictions gamer moment when you object to your own question. But either way, it just proves more of what you already think. Ben is obviously a credible witness and, and Rattenborn's mad. The next day, Roberts, who manages Johnny's private island, takes the stand. They show Johnny's house on the island. Why does this lady have a gaming chair? The Karen is the one who's objecting this time. I think she's on crack. Probably. Looks like it. At some point, they have to bring in more wines and whatnot for Amber because Amber is very fond of wine and she drank through a lot of it. So the manager says that she had to get staff to move some wine in there. She was also on the island as part of the staff during Johnny's detox when a lot of the arguments took place. She did observe an incident where everyone was packing up and Johnny was pacing around and being agitated. Then Amber comes in and says Johnny should come back to the house and that she was sorry for what happened. He then got into his car and Amber stood in 
in front of the car to prevent him from leaving. Roberts said that she went into the house after they drove off and they heard Amber verbally abusing Johnny and throwing the can at him. Amber then came out and was surprised to see the staff standing there having witnessed this. He proceeded to uh, walk back to the John Deere and um, she again walked, he was just sitting in the seat, he, Amber came up to him and was asking him to come back in the house, if she was sorry, please come back in the house. Um, and uh, he didn't come out of the seat and she was hugging and kissing him and I love you, I love you. She was telling him I loved you. Um, he didn't react, Johnny sat there. Um, eventually uh, got out of the John Deere um, and proceeded to start to walk away. At that time, Amber started to grab at him and his shirt and, and, and trying to pull him back to the house. Um, just basically viciously trying to pull him back. Johnny then comes out and Amber tries to hug him and tells him to come back inside because she's sorry and he, he just wouldn't re react. So, because of the lack of reaction, she started getting physical and pulling him viciously back inside, physically hurting him. The staff then removed Amber from the house. Roberts tended to the bruise on the bridge of Johnny's nose. She didn't notice any injuries on Miss Hurd, even though she did notice them on Johnny. The next morning, she noticed the cans of paint tipped over. Karen is the one doing the cross-examination, and I'm very excited because she is always a train wreck, and I find that really funny. Roberts does not even understand the crazy ramblings. Lady. <laughs> Summer of 2013, if we can. Do you have a recollection of Amber and Johnny, Lily Rose and Jack taking one final trip on the yacht? It was Amber and her friend in Lily Rose. Okay. And Jack decided at the last minute to stay back, correct? I don't know if he decided last minute he stayed. Okay. Do you recall Lily Rose telling you that she was upset because her father was drinking and trying to hide it from him? Objection. Uh -huh. Hearsay. Lady, don't try and speak, Karen. <laughs> it's it's pointless. Karen also doesn't understand how the salaries work because Roberts is trying to explain that she is working on a salary. Depp just isn't throwing random bits of money at her every now and then. She's specifically getting paid for managing the property and not directly by Johnny. She is working as a manager. She then gets into semantics about who had taken the videos of the house and goes on about why the entire house wasn't in one video. Why does it matter that no one asked her to videotape the bathroom? This uh, Karen is so aggressive. She and the entire defense's argument is that they don't spend 24 7 with the couple so they would have no idea about any abuse as if you have to sleep between a couple at night to truly understand them yes you won't know exactly what's going on if you're not the person you can only speculate just from what you see but you can still see plenty of evidence she then gets stuck on uh, christmas <laughs> she's like who cancelled for christmas why did they cancel for christmas tell me more about christmas but you see roberts wasn't there when johnny got his nose busted so you don't know anything maybe johnny did that himself because he's a psycho drunk loser karen then goes on to talk about a yacht and needing a helicopter to get off the island or some shit so karen objected to how the witness was feeling but now she can say how everyone else was feeling when she asks the questions Interesting. Karen then talks about the makeup that Amber was wearing. Like, you don't know for sure what type of makeup she was wearing, so obviously she was hiding bruises. We then get to my favorite person in this entire thing, Shannon Curry, mommy psychologist. <laughs> This woman is just straight up devastating for Amber. Everything she says is with authority, she says it clearly, she has all of her proof in order, she is just amazing. So Dr. Curry is very, very, very qualified, so they get through like 45 minutes of her just talking about how qualified she is. She also talks about the assessment of intimate partner violence, which she defines as various forms of abuse. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, preventing someone from leaving, starting fights, with her, you know the deal. She was asked to evaluate Amber and diagnosed Amber with borderline personality disorder, which will shorten to BPD, and histrionic disorders. This includes externalization of blame, aka nothing is your fault, everything is everyone else's fault, hostility, passive aggressiveness, explosive anger, distancing people, 
initially very charming but quickly not being that charming after a while, very much unstable in every aspect of the self and terrified of abandonment. I'm no expert in anything, like I said, but a lot like what we heard. <laughs> this results in very extreme behaviours and very public displays of these extreme behaviours. It's also what she calls administrative violence, like they try to keep the partner from leaving and there's a kind of two extremes that borderline personality people go between, aka they idolize their partner, their partner can do nothing wrong, there is this incredibly high and unrealistic pedestal that they put their partner on, but then it soon jumps way down and destabilizes so that everything their partner does is horrible and there's this extreme anger and histrionics because you put them on such a high pedestal, they obviously can't live up to that and then you immediately crash them down to way below anywhere the pedestal was before of stability. It's instability. And it's instability in personal relationships. It's instability in their emotions. It's instability in their behavior. And it's instability in their sense of self and their identity. And that instability is really driven by this underlying terror of abandonment. So one of the key features also of this disorder, and you, you, all of it is like pistons of an engine kind of firing off and igniting one another. But when somebody is afraid of being abandoned by their partner or by anybody else in their environment and they have this disorder, they'll make desperate attempts to prevent that from happening. And those desperate attempts could be physical aggression, it could be threatening, it could be harming themselves. She also says that Rocky Pennington, one of Amber's friends, got struck in the face while Amber was out shopping with her because Amber didn't like what Rocky was saying and it was some completely benign thing. Now, of course, Shannon didn't actually witness this, but she says that she got the story from Amber. Initial idealization comes with mimicking people's identities, so the way that they dress, the certain ways that they speak, the certain, maybe, you know, things that they've been through, she can co-opt and say that it's her own story now, and this is something that she does with a lot of people, apparently. And one of the important things Dr. Curry mentions is that when somebody is doing an assessment, they have to make sure that the person is not cheating the exam, so to speak. So someone who's coming in really, really trying to get diagnosed with PTSD might try their hardest to check off all of the symptoms of PTSD and make up or embellish certain things to really get the diagnosis. And it's the examiner's part to try and catch this out in a way. Not to, you know, try and have a gotcha card, but because they're here to help with mental health, so the best way to help is to actually get an accurate reading of what's going on. She needed to catch Amber out with the lie so that she would know how to actually help Amber and assess Amber properly. It's all part of the professionalism dealing with this. Shannon says that Amber was a bit suspect because she had vague dreams and other vague things that didn't necessarily point towards specific signs of PTSD. The test that she will use are designed to catch the feigning, to catch these false symptoms and things that Amber was trying to act like she had but she actually didn't, and they're all very important. We then get to the cross-examination. Karen immediately begins by attacking Dr. Curry's credentials and says, you've had dinner with Depp before, didn't you? When Dr. Curry clarifies that this is just a dinner meeting. It was an interview with the lawyers that dinner was served at. It's obviously a very necessary interview when you have someone who's going to be such a big part of your case that you need to talk to them beforehand and when people have meetings they often go to dinner or have drinks or some other thing going on because, you know, human beings. Yes. Camille Vasquez? Yes. Okay. And the dinner lasted approximately three to four hours, correct? Yes. And it included the interview. drinks, correct? Yes, dinner and I believe drinks were served. Okay. And this was before you were hired as an expert, correct? Yes, this was an interview so that they could make an informed decision as to whether or not to retain me. And don't you think that's a little odd that you're getting interviewed by Mr. Depp 
to decide whether you're going to testify and nevertheless karen presses on it acts like a lawyer interview is somehow some secret cabal where she and johnny are connected and she's on the payroll and this entire thing is a conspiracy it's quite ridiculous but we continue and honestly this is one of my favorite arcs of this entire thing because the way that karen just gets mad at everything that shannon does and shannon's so calm she's trying to explain everything and then karen's just like this is all a secret shadow cabal conspiracy made by lizard people and amber is the chosen one <laughs> it's quite entertaining it'll get even more entertaining for the part where they bring in their own hack me like psychologist lady who clearly doesn't know what she's talking about and her and shannon will kind of have like this war <laughs> against each other it's karen brings up that shannon knows who depp is because she has seen his movies and whatnot so people well, out uh, Duh, he's a celebrity. But she tries to say that Shannon's opinion formed on Amber before she even had an evaluation. And this is because of being starstruck, I guess. It's all a conspiracy. Everyone is lying but Amber. Everyone. They then try to impeach her with, again, things that don't contradict what she's saying. Keep trying, guys. I'm sure you'll get there one day. Karen tries to bring up some legal shit and Shannon is like, I'm not an attorney. I have no idea what you're talking about. But then Karen is like, Depp said in a recording years ago that Amber must have BPD. So is it a coincidence that you decided she has BPD? It's a coincidence? I think not. Is on an audio recording years earlier taunting Amber Heard that she has a borderline personality disorder? I was made aware of that in this case, yes. So you heard, did is actually that one of the audio not necessarily taunting, but I do recall hearing that Mr. Depp had used that phrase. So it's a coincidence that you now think she has those attributes. Shannon has to basically clarify that it's not sexist to say that women are diagnosed with BPD more than men because women simply display the symptoms way more than men. Women are more emotional than men because men and women have biological differences and yes, that doesn't mean that every single woman acts the same, but it does mean that they might have more issues that men don't because of biological differences. It's just the way it is. Emotional differences, processing things differently, it's quite normal, not sexist. <laughs> Nevertheless, Karen's whole argument is that it is sexist. I guess biology is sexist, all right. Karen then tries to impeach Shannon with more shit that doesn't make sense. They're struggling, struggling. I don't really understand what Karen's point is either because Shannon basically clarified that she made her opinion after the evaluation. She did a very professional thing of just doing the evaluations, making sure that everything is in working order, and then making her opinion based on the facts. Karen is trying to pass off the lawyer's documents as shit that Shannon wrote, even though sh the attorneys wrote that, and Shannon is not an attorney, so she does not understand what's going on, and doesn't know why this has anything to do with her professional opinion that is based on fact. Karen then doesn't allow her to explain herself. What a cunt! <laughs> and I don't mean that as a term of endearment, they keep asking the same questions over and over again with no context about, you know, oh, you've never been called as an expert in the intimate partner violence cases before, have you? So you, you, you have no credentials whatsoever and the lizard people are out to get me. Karen then brings up the dinner interview again and Shannon keeps saying that it was an interview, it is not fancy dinner, it is just something that the lawyers did. Karen then accuses her of resisting. It keeps fucking bringing it up. It's it's mental. Then we get to the muffin saga. The muffin saga is very long. This idiot is getting on my nerves. Excited <laughs> about being involved in this case that you told your husband, even though this was a highly confidential matter, that you were going to be conducting the examination of Ms. Heard, didn't you? That is not accurate. You not only told your husband, but you told Ms. Hurd that you told your husband, correct? Ms. Bredehoff, that is not accurate. What is accurate? You're incorrect. That is not correct. You, is your testimony today under oath that you did not tell your husband that you were going to be conducting the examination of Amber? That is my testimony. That was asked was because you brought muffins, you said, from your husband, right? You get, And you gave those to Ms. Hurd, correct? May I clarify what occurred so that we can stop talking about the muffins. So, the truth of the matter is Shannon, when she has high-profile cases, asks if 
she can go and pick up some muffins because, you know, it's nice to just have muffins in the office to offer to your client. It's, you know, one of those things. Because Shannon was running a bit late that morning and she knew that her husband was going out, she said, hey, can you just pick up the muffins for me? I got a high profile client, so just get the muffins, would ya? When Amber and Shannon were having the muffins during their interview thingy, Shannon said, well, I was running late, so we can thank my husband for going out to get the muffins for me because I couldn't make it in time. That's all it was, innocuous comment. Karen, however, paints this a very different way. She says, this, this turkey-necked bastard says that Shannon had told everyone about how she was gonna see Amber Heard as a client and it was so exciting for her that she went to get muffins so that I, I don't- I don't know. And Shannon doesn't really get to say many things here because as hard as you try to stay clear and professional, when someone's just not respecting you as a human and they're trying to steamroll you with accusations and random leading questions, it's very hard to do so. She doesn't even let Shannon clarify anything. Certain words are out of place in the things that she reads and certain questions are phrased a certain way that Shannon doesn't agree with but Karen just keeps interrupting her and steamrolling her because she thinks she can get away with it. They then bring up someone else's testimony as if Shannon isn't allowed to have her own professional evaluation because someone else disagrees with her. It isn't her fault they disagree. She spent over 12 hours in an evaluation with Amber to get these things correct and someone else disagreeing doesn't take all of that away. Karen goes on with this, trying to take stuff Shannon had mentioned from other doctors and Shannon tries to add the context because this shit is taken way out of context and then gets interrupted and has to basically wait for the plaintiffs to ask her to speak properly after Karen is done. Karen's entire argument is just based on basically giving someone else's testimony for them and not answering anything specific herself. She's just using another doctor's words, flat out testifying for someone else to the witness on the stand when the person she's testifying on the behalf of can't even say this shit themselves because they're not here. It's fucking ridiculous. She then gets mad at Shannon for bringing in extraneous things when Karen's entire speech is extraneous. She continues to get cranky at Shannon, like she's on coke or something, look at her. Karen starts asking about how bad someone must feel to be falsely accused, seemingly not aware that this entire line of questioning is incredibly good for Johnny's side because Johnny felt all of these things, especially because he was falsely accused. Karen then tries to say certain memory issues like what Amber expresses are common among sexual assault victims, even though she has no evidence for this whatsoever, and Shannon, the expert, has to explain that this is not the case. Even then, Karen Karen tries to steamroll her into the next topic because she doesn't want Shannon to correct anything that was said during this horrible cross-examination. Shannon even says there are some key differences and yet Karen does not want to hear what these are even though if she actually cared about the truth she would really want to hear what those differences are. So then we get to the redirect and we get some context for what Shannon was trying to say. She is able to qualify that Amber was experiencing the symptoms of bipolar disorder and not PTSD because they display very differently. What she means is that she was the examiner and yet a normal clinician is not going to look for the signs of the patient lying because they're here as an advocate. They're here to help the patient, take what the patient says at face value and get the patient through the specific pain. An examiner is supposed to specifically look for what's actually going on so that they can make a proper assessment. So if Amber lies to a therapist, the therapist is not going to know or investigate this because it's not really what they're going for. An examiner like Shannon will be able to root out the lies and she is able to see a bunch of different key things in behavior patterns that separate BPD from PTSD. We then get to two quick video depositions that I will just get out of the way because there are some things that I want to mention, but they're boring. There's Melissa Sines, the police officer. Uh, Karen takes so long to ask these questions, even though they're not even relevant. They ask her if she remembers Amber's clothing that night, as if that means that because she can't remember what Amber was wearing, she can't remember anything, which is again ridiculous, but she being called out when Amber made the 911 call says that she did not see any injuries on Amber whatsoever. There's also another cop after after this that basically says the same thing. They made reports that they could not see any injuries on Amber. He also says that yeah it was kind of dark when Amber called so he couldn't really see her face but Amber made no effort to actually come forth and show any bruises that she might have had. The cops testifying are all talking about the same incident and they're quite consistent on that fact. So that's them over and done with. We can go on with the other witnesses. 
Next up is Angelo Romero. This guy is so done. He doesn't remember shit as much as the others because he's not really involved. I guess they just brought him around because he's the food guy and he might have seen something. He's blunt yet honest that he doesn't know what the fuck is going on and he doesn't really have much of an interest. He starts vaping in his car and then just starts driving off doing random crap while they're trying to ask him questions. That there was pictures of wine, glass of wine and bottle of wine, wine stains on the floor outside of the, uh, in the hallway of the penthouse. Karen is trying her usual tactics and then Romero just shuts her down because he's like, what the fuck, lady? <laughs> He didn't notice any bruises because he didn't see nothing, okay? He didn't see nothing. They thought someone was going to break into the unit one time and Romero was telling them it was just the dogs walking around and he was kind of low-key making fun of them the entire time while he told this story and uh, nothing came of it. Next up is Christian Carino, the talent agent. Karen is trying to ask him over and over and over again what his job is and he's just smiling because he's like, I already fucking told you, you crazy bitch. There's also some construction noises or someone getting murdered or a donkey having an opera concert. I don't know what's going on and where this guy lives. I mean that... The, with somebody who is well known, people don't want he talks a bit about a statement he made where someone getting a lawsuit against them it does distract from their careers and all of the stuff that comes along with it so he's basically trying to i guess clarify the statements that he made that he does believe that it's defamation and i think he does a pretty good job like he's asked a lot of technical questions but i do understand why like law is a very persnickety kind of thing but i also understand why he's kind of exasperated because karen gets really shitty with her questions she's asking these ridiculous questions questions about random articles. There's also some lady that represented Depp during the divorce trial and she goes on about laws and stuff. So then there's a guy called Terence Doughty. There were some big tech issues, I just want to remind you, every single time there's a video deposition this happens. This is the ACLU's in-house lawyer who is going to testify about Amber's lack of donations. Amber paid $350,000 directly to the charity, then Johnny paid $100,000 on her behalf. The larger portion of the money was done on her behalf or credited to her instead of her doing it directly with the total sum of the money that was actually donated. She has not donated the amount that she stated publicly, which was $3.5 million. Neither did she do it to the children's hospital. They were aware that she was supposed to basically give half of her divorce settlement to them and the other half would go to the children's hospital. Her donations, the small parts that she did, arrived shortly after, but for mostly others on behalf. They go over some ACLU criteria of having experience in their chosen field and having a large audience when someone's about to be a, an ambassador and Amber was going to be one for the women's rights representation. Because Amber was speaking out about gender-based violence, another employee was looking at Amber's social media and saying that this was a good call to make. She said that ACLU ambassadors are people who are artists or influencers that are aligned with one or two ACLU <clears throat> policy issues. They also were involved with the publishing of the op-ed that this whole trial is about. They said that they got some legal people to review the op-ed before Amber published it to the Washington Post. The importance of this testimony is basically confirming that this is about Johnny without using his name, which is important. They specifically have recorded information on why a donation is given, by who, what context it is, what type of representation they have if they're doing it on behalf of someone else, all of the information that you basically need. Amber never signed the documents or scheduled for the payment of the remainder of the money that she said she would pay. She assured them that she would do these things but then just never did. So she really did not pay them what she promised. Her payment stopped after one installment. They only need to legally know what it's coming from or is associated with the donor advice fund which is where all the money is pulled in. So we don't actually know if the amounts that she paid directly were from her directly or on her behalf because someone dipped into the donor donor fund. The only proof that they have that she directly paid anything is from her own word of mouth. 
The emails are particularly important because they reveal that it was about Johnny in the op-ed. Specifically, she was talking about Johnny and they had to try and remove certain more damning things that would show it was about Johnny. It was also shown to, specifically on purpose, be published around her Aquaman release because she wanted as many eyes on it as possible. She also had to remove some more stark references to Johnny here and there and there were even emails afterwards saying, well, looks like people know it's about Johnny, so it specifically was about him. This is proof. Emails, testimony, whatever, it's proof. It was in US Today and um, specifically ties Amber's statements in her op-ed piece to Johnny Depp. And when Jessica White says so much for not mentioning JD, what did she mean? He also says that USA Today or whatever made the guess that Johnny was the subject of the article the day after the article was published, so it shows it's very clearly about Johnny, even to complete strangers in the media. This guy is also a little shifty. He's trying to give some waffly answers about why Amber makes the ACL you look bad, and, and he's like trying to do some PR shit. Like, I, I can't blame him, I guess. I just don't like the ACLU. During the cross-examination, Karen spends way too fucking long splitting hairs with the definition of pledge versus versus donate, saying that donate is the less, like, affirming term for the promise of donating money, so Amber could have just said that, but she didn't have to do anything because it's not legally binding. Like, look, I know it's not legally binding, but it just makes her look really shitty. She also acts like Amber is gonna pay, like, I, I guess the fucking, what, 10 year gap between the payments is just all, uh, all planned all along. She's gonna pay, like, tomorrow, guys. Ed White, the accountant, is up next. This is the accountant that Johnny was meeting with when he was late to Amber's birthday party. Ed White says that Johnny would call Amber to confirm that he was going to be late, so this shows that he did in fact call her and respected her time and told her, look, I'm going to be late, this is very important. Also, Johnny was not drinking or anything, he was actively listening and very attentive. Rottenborn then decides that he hasn't done an objection in a while and decides to keep doing it now. The accountant is saying, the stuff that he knows because he's the accountant. He has all of these files. He was there. He knows this shit. He can say these things. Apparently, Amber was continually asking for more and more money and demanded he pay more to his attorney. She was then acting like 14 billion from him was a reasonable amount to ask and then decided to ask for more because that apparently was not enough. There was also a plan for the charities to get the money directly, but Amber changed it adamantly because the money needed to go to her first with the promise that she would donate it to the charities. During the course of the negotiations, one of the demands, because the contract changed, was that the payments be made directly to Miss Heard. Did you have any personal uh, involvement with either the ACLU or the Children's Hospital? Yes, I did. With the testimony that we've just heard from the ACLU guy, this is especially suspect. He then says that he and Johnny did make some payments and whatnot directly to the charities, but then was chastised by Amber's legal team. 6.8 million total was made to Amber from Depp, and $500,000 for the legal team, and more. $13 million in total, and she wanted to pay absolutely nothing because she demanded that the payment be taxation free, so he had to pay the tax on all of it. And this is all from them being married for the grand total of 15 months. I think you all, me included, forget how short the marriage was with all of this shit that went down, all of the times that she abused him and whatever else, it all happened over a very short period of time. He also clarifies that Amber would in fact have like two wine bottles a night, each of them costing $500 because she had very expensive taste. She also ordered a fuck ton of wine whenever she had a party of any kind. During the cross-examination, Rottenborn's only real questions are about how if Johnny's having them on the payroll because everything is Johnny's conspiracy, he's paying every single person in this court. The judge really doesn't care that Rottenborn's basically badgering the witness. This guy can't even respond. He's getting bullied. Someone help him. He's a tiny old man. Yes, but you that, you that, that was you my need question. To find the term. I read that right, sir. Now, part of the services that you provide, that your firm provides... All Rottenborn has is that Johnny hired this guy at one point, so that means that they're on the payroll. Ed White is trying to define the terms with which he can answer the question, because this is very important for context. He's an accountant. He doesn't just do yes or no questions. Rottenborn then cuts him off and doesn't let him say anything. 
he's not allowed to answer the question. He completely then brushes off everything White said and acts like Johnny is a big spender because Ed doesn't know. Ed wasn't there 24-7 so, and, and he doesn't live inside Johnny's wallet, therefore he doesn't know anything. What is an accountant? Never heard of it. He tries to, in classic Rottenborn fashion, impeach a statement that does not contradict Ed so the impeachment doesn't make any sense. I don't know, is this this guy's like starting Pokemon move or something? Why does he do that? It's uh, impeachment that doesn't mean anything, uh, fucking boot looping, and objections. That's, that's the moves you got for this guy. Have fun with your Nuzlocke. He's like, you said that you didn't know Mr. Depp showed up late to the party, yet you got the text that someone was complaining that he did, so you must know this because someone else was complaining to you even though you didn't witness anything. What kind of a question is that? Rottenborn says, you've never seen nor known if Johnny abused Amber because you never met her. The next witness is a very important one. His name is Malcolm Connolly. I, he's a bodyguard and for some reason I wrote Officer of Dalor on my notes and I don't know why I did that. He saw everything. He says that everything was totally fine at first but then Amber would get more and more feisty and frosty at the drop of a hat. Johnny then got quieter. Amber got grumpier. He said that he could often hear Amber screaming and whatnot during arguments. One time he didn't know the context of the argument and saw a lighter thrown at Johnny's chest. He heard artwork smash and Johnny was already walking out with Malcolm to get away from Amber but Amber was just getting angry and trying to prevent this. He never saw physical injuries on Amber but he did see them on Johnny. Marks, scratches, and swelling, which is what Sean Bett said as well. They then pull up a picture that shows an injury and Malcolm says that he either walked into a door or a door walked into him. A bit into the trip that he went with Johnny and Amber, he noticed that Johnny wasn't having a lot of fun. He looked like he didn't really want to be there, he was quiet. He had also, on various occasions, seen Johnny do weed and he had never seen the coke but he suspected because Johnny would do the coke in the bathroom and then come out afterwards and like be a bit more mellow. He also says that Johnny has an incredibly high tolerance to substances in general and, and he like wasn't drinking that much. One time he was hearing Amber getting loud and nasty and Johnny was kind of bickering a bit in, in response but Amber was the one who was like yelling. He then describes some more screaming and shouting and whatnot as Johnny is trying to leave the situation and nursing one hand. Amber is shouting and irate and Johnny is not really fighting back. Malcolm says that Johnny needed to come out and walk away so as this is happening, Amber follows out and screams at them and verbally abuses Johnny right in front of Malcolm. They're trying to leave and Johnny's finger is gone so they're trying to, you know, figure out what to do and Amber shows up again. He describes her as crazy. During the cross-examination, they immediately ask about the payroll. <laughs> they also go on about Marilyn Manson, like what does this have to do with him? Malcolm has no idea what's going on so he's quite confused. Rottenborn then mislabels some evidence, classic Rottenborn. They also play Johnny screaming some stuff that has no context behind it and doesn't make him look like he assaulted Amber at all. He also tries to argue with the bodyguard about the fact that bodyguards jobs are to like scan around people constantly to see what's up in their surroundings. Rottenborn, you're not a bodyguard. What are you fucking doing? He also gets so fucking flustered. He brings up strangling Amber like, you don't know if that could have happened. You don't know if he was with Obama drone striking children in Iraq. You don't know. They're trying to argue either did not see the bruises because you didn't look closely enough or you didn't see the bruises because she has makeup on so there was no way you could have seen them. It's both of them at the same time even though they don't fit together. Anyways, after Malcolm there is another guard who says that Amber threw Johnny's phone out the balcony after Johnny did something with her phone or something and some homeless dude found it so the guard had to find it and pay the homeless dude for the phone. During the cross-examination they once again bring up the salary. Every single person is being, being paid by Depp. This is a shadow cabal. Unhoused person, you fucking cuck. You were only looking for Mr. Depp's phone. When you went when you went downstairs to the to the to uh, to try to you found it with a with an unhoused person you said correct. After this, we get to Travis, who is a security professional. He'd see the couple at least once a week in the Columbia building. This takes place. He said sometimes they'd be happy, sometimes they'd be arguing, but things did get more volatile with time. He'd get a text to come and stand by the door or the kitchen, and it typically when Johnny was trying to get out of the situation and needed some security to help him do so because Amber would be screaming at them and, and trying to push 
Johnny back into the room, either physically or just manipulating him verbally. Travis himself was also verbally abused by Amber for doing his job. He was kind of caught in the crossfire with some of the other security team, and when this would happen, she would direct some of her abuse at them as well. He reports that he did not see any injuries on Amber, and when Johnny Depp returned from Australia, his hand was fucked up. He also witnessed the can being thrown, I think it was a can of Red Bull or something, and she also spat at Johnny in one occasion. Johnny got uh, the injury and blamed Travis for not acting to get the fight diffused in time, and Travis agrees. There was a swollen red mark where she hit him. Johnny had not physically responded during the fight. Travis also is consistent about the phone incident that was described by the previous guard. He had seen it on a few occasions where she would try to push Johnny and prevent him from leaving, and he had also seen Johnny do weed and coke, but he once got to a point where he did it like once or twice. Coke was very, very rare, and weed was like every single day, but he was chilled out when he was on substances. Amber also drank fairly regularly. During the cross-examination, they say that he's on the payroll. <laughs> Rottenborn also tries to paint this picture that Whitney was between Amber and Johnny, and then Johnny pushed Whitney, and only then did Amber punch Johnny. But the Whitney wasn't pushed. Travis was there, and he says that none of that happened, but Rottenborn insists that it did, even though Rottenborn wasn't fucking there. Then we go to Wiggum, who's an agent. It only took a hit to Disney and Johnny's relationship when the op-ed and the allegations came out. So that's very important. During the cross-examination, however, Karen immediately is like, you don't have any piece of paper saying he was going to be in Pirate 6, so you don't don't know if he was dropped beforehand, even though I'm pretty sure, and I'm not the only one who thinks this, she knows exactly how proposals are made before documents are written, but she was acting like without a document none of this would ever happen. It's all a conspiracy, everyone's on Johnny's payroll. He also confirms that the testimony that the op-ed was catastrophic for Depp's Hollywood career, as other people have said. She also asks whether it was the online or newsprint article that he's talking about specifically, as if that would make a difference in this context, but when Johnny had been asking which article version they were talking about in his testimony, the lawyers didn't seem to give a shit if he knew which one they were talking about, even though there were minor differences. That's kind of interesting. Karen then just starts reading out article headlines and keeps doing it. Johnny is a wife beater and a horrible person, says random gossip mag. And then she's like, is there anything that they're saying that is correct in these gossip mags? And the guy's like, what? <laughs> I don't know what she's doing here. If anything, I think she's just showing the jury that Johnny was definitely affected by Amber's allegations. She talks about some shit in the UK trial and this guy doesn't know what the fuck is going on because he wasn't there. <laughs> this guy just came here to state that the Disney shit that they were talking about, how Disney dropped him and he didn't have movie opportunities and stuff, this stuff is true. That's what he's saying. He wasn't there for the other trials, he doesn't know what the fuck's going on. I don't know why she's doing this. Nevertheless, afterwards we have Richard Marks, who is basically a production guy. His job is to try and make the movie happen by doing, you know, talking to the right people and getting them to say yes to funding it stuff like that. He's a very good witness. He knows everything. He is an entertainment industry lawyer and was brought in to assess the damage that the op-ed had done. For an actor or someone involved in the movie had a morals clause that you did certain things and you could be fired for it. Uh, they wanted to protect their brand. In the Before the Me Too movement, that morals clause was fading out. Uh, People with leverage, people said, wait a second, you just can't get rid of us because you think this or that. With the Me Too movement, Harvey Weinstein, um, uh, Bill Cosby, if you will, the morals clause has come back and it is a demanded feature in every uh, entertainment uh, uh, employment agreement because the studios want that verbiage. They want those rights so that they can act quickly and decisively when there is a, a, a claim. And his assessment is that it did a fuck ton as well. He also brings up a really good example, Kevin Spacey, as an example of how even though with Kevin, it's very likely that he did do fucked up things, 
the way that it works is that they were trying their hardest to cut him out of House of Cards. After the allegations came out, they would come in and re-edit everything to try and take him out. They also had a Netflix movie where he was basically one of the main people in it, and because that movie could not be reshot, they did not want to publish it. They want actors removed so that the negativity isn't stacked on them. Whether or not the allegations are true, if someone is a target of, let's say, cancel culture or, let's say, allegations of some kind, the movie people want it gone. They don't care about if it's true or not because their whole thing is like, it's not their fault problem if whatever's going on isn't their problem. It's just they don't want it to look negatively on them and impact their profits. So his assessment is that yes, this did happen to Johnny, even though with Johnny it was purely allegations that had no weight behind them. It still happened to him because that's what these companies do. Next up, we have Doug Bania, who is an intellectual property and damages expert. He analyzes the Google search analytics and whatnot to show people did associate Johnny Depp with the abuse and the trends in the Google searches showed that he was branded an abuser by the media and the public after the op-ed and allegations came out. He did get defamed as shown by the data. And you can directly see who was searching what and the amount of people that were searching these terms before and afterwards. During the cross-examination, their whole argument is, do you know what he's suing Amber for? Did you see he's only suing for the op-ed and not any other incident? You don't know for sure what caused the spike in Google Trends and it's like, no, it, it's pretty clear. The expert is trying to say, listen, I don't know what the fuck kind of weird gossip you're talking about, I'm just saying that this is what the data shows, all right? <laughs> Rottenborn continues his impeachment tactic and he fails miserably and then tries his, you know, famous interrupting tactic even though the witness is trying to answer his question. Acted Mr. Depp's career, correct. Okay, and you're not offering an opinion as to how the op-ed for Ms. Heard in December 2018 impacted Mr. Depp's reputation. What I'm doing is I'm is it, It's a yes or no, are you doing? Are you offering an opinion to that or not? Uh, my opinion is related to his public image. You're not offering an opinion as to how the op-ed for Ms. Heard in December 2018 impacted Mr. Depp's reputation, correct? I'm not talking exactly about his reputation, correct? And you're not offering an opinion as to how the op-ed for Ms. Heard in December 2018 impacted Mr. Depp's public image, correct? I mean, I'm offering an opinion that after the 2018 it's a yes public or no, sir. image... It, or, it's a yes or no. You're not off He makes an argument that bots caused all of it. Like, everything is bots. Everyone I don't like is a Russian bot. During the recross, he gets a chance to say that he's specifically analyzing the scores before and after the events that are happening. And that is all he really needed to say. I think he's very credible and remember, if you're thinking something, maybe someone in the jury is thinking it too. We then get Aaron Folati, who was one of the nurses. This is a very quick note, but they, they pulled up some pictures and it doesn't really show a lot of bruises or anything. Some don't really show anything, it just looks like zits or tiny bug bites. And it shows that Amber's f bruised pictures are nothing like Johnny's, in terms of authenticity and just, you know. We next have Michael Spindler, the forensic accountant. This is another incredibly important testimony. He concluded that Johnny Depp lost 40 million in projects that he could have had and things that he got dropped from that he should have been on if he didn't get kicked from Disney and have his name smeared by the media. So that's two accountants, forensic accountants, saying that they analyzed his bookings and the events and the things that he got dropped from and the money that he was projected to make if he hadn't get, gotten dropped from those projects. The cross-examination immediately goes for the payroll excuse again. They're saying that he's just assuming it's from the op-ed and not looking at anything else. Even though he clearly shows that, no, he, he is. There's a motion to dismiss after this. This is entirely normal in cases like this, where the two sides basically make their arguments for why the other side has a weak case and we shouldn't go forward with the trial. Don't worry, obviously, like, have you looked at the video length? There is way more after this. When I was watching this in the trial, I was like, nice try guys, but there's like 50 hours left that I have to watch through. Rottenborn's only motion to strike is that Amber did not write the title. The judge didn't like that because there's evidence saying that, uh, no, she, she had a hand in it anyway. And he's saying that he has more evidence on the matter, but he only wants to show the evidence that he has. After they dismiss the trial, I, I'm confused. 
The judge is confused too. She's like, why wouldn't you just show the evidence during the trial? Why are you trying to dismiss it and show me the evidence afterwards, you fucking weirdo? Johnny's side is basically like, listen, we got a fuck ton of evidence of the abuse and shit that shows that he got defamed by her. Just, <laughs> lol, idiot. <laughs> There's like a really weak follow-up, but it doesn't matter. It's just, it's just the, the, the judge is like, no, we, we gotta continue this trial, you fucking idiots. Next up, we have... Donna Hughes, who is an unprofessional, shitty psychologist. She is actually on Team Tad's payroll because she and the other experts they have are revealed to have worked frequently with the lawyers in this case for other cases that they do. That's very interesting. She is one of the most unprofessional, biased psychologists I have ever seen. She's incredibly suspect. When she is basically arguing back and forth via, you know, cross-examinations and testimonies with what the amazing Shannon Curry said, you will see. She basically crumbles and has a meltdown because she doesn't know what to say. She instantly seems to dismiss any type of male victims, saying that a 120 pound woman pushing a man and hitting him isn't violent because he's 180 pounds. So, me, basically, pushing some random dude is not being violent apparently even though my actions against him are violent. It doesn't matter if he can resist me pushing him or not because he weighs more than me. It's the fact that I tried to commit a violent act against him. That's what matters. But she seems to think that just because you can defend yourself against someone, namely if a man can defend himself against a woman, her violent act doesn't matter. That makes it very difficult for a victim to extricate herself from that situation and from that relationship. And what would you say is the overarching dynamic of these relationships? So the overarching dynamic is the um, abuse of power and control of one person wanting to have dominance in that relationship, say over most things that the couple or that the uh, victim does or does not do. Does size and strength matter between the parties? Yes, very much so. Um, this is very well documented in the literature about violence and abuse in relationships. And, and that's, just, um, that's just physics. That's just proportional force. That if a 185-pound man is going to push a 120-pound woman, that's going to feel quite different than a 120-pound woman pushing a 185-pound man. And it's just about proportional force and the size and strength differential. Um, and that is why specifically, if you look at of wrestling or boxing, they match weight classes. She always uses she when referring to the victim and he when referring to the perpetrator. She does not try to use any gender neutral terms and seems to insist that males are the perpetrators and females are always the victims. Now, she will deny this later, saying that you don't think something versus clearly showing that you do repeatedly throughout like hours of testimony. There's some difference there in credibility. I'm more likely to believe what you you know, show while you don't realize that you're showing your bias versus what you actually just straight up tell me to try and make yourself look better. It's just, again, I'm coming back to this nightmare of how it must feel as a man to see these kinds of things, especially in such a high profile case. It's terrifying. For all of the Johnnies out there that got their high profile cases and were proven to be innocent, there are thousands and thousands, if not like hundreds of thousands of male victims of false accusations and domestic abuse that are just labeled as abusers themselves and have to quietly sit and rot with the public, everyone around them, thinking this because they don't have enough of a voice to talk about it. It's horrifying and if anything, I would have thought that this case would be such a big thing for people to start taking male victims seriously, but it seems like people just forgot about it as soon as it happened. As soon as it was, it was finished, people moved on to the next thing and it didn't make a difference. That has to change. I'll stop ranting. They aren't even acknowledging that Johnny Depp did not abuse anyone before he apparently abused Amber, so there's no pattern here, or that Amber did, in fact, and this is proven, abuse her partners, her sister, and the people around her. And she went to court for abusing the lesbian partner that we'll get to later. What are these patterns? Why are the patterns not on topic? You're a psych. You, you deal with intimate partner violence. Do you not? You talk about, like, patterns of abuse and whatnot. Is this not a pattern? 
She also used like 20 questions, basically. It, it's like a, just a sheet that you fill out like, oh yeah, I feel that symptom, I feel that symptom, I feel that symptom when she was diagnosing Amber. So Amber cheated on the, the exam, basically. But this is basically going against what Dr. Curry had said before, where she has to try and examine to, to make sure that the person that she's trying to diagnose is not trying to cheat the system or even if they're unknowingly cheating the system, Curry has to basically go forward and say, this doesn't quite look right, so I'm going to try and figure out what's actually going on for the benefit of the person involved. She's not going out there trying to act like, oh, this person's lying, they must be malicious. She's just thinking, well, something's not right, we have to get to the bottom of it. However, this person seems to think that random BuzzFeed quizzes are equivalent to doing all of their work, I guess. She cannot answer any questions without looking at her fucking notes. Every single one. Every single one. If I made a super cut of this, it would probably be like five fucking hours. She can't make any sort of answer without the notes, and Johnny's team doesn't even have a copy of them, so it, what? What is on them that she needs to look at for every single question if she apparently spent hours and hours with Amber? She then smirks like a villain and says that men are the perpetrators of domestic violence, like, oh, sure. Sure, okay, congratulations on being part of the problem, you fucking hack. She really hates Dr. Curry. She knows Dr. Curry is better than her. Her entire reasoning... Now, you need to remember this. I will remind you of this later. This person's entire reasoning for what she did is it's in the manual. The manual says this is okay to do. It's in the manual. Please remember, Donna Hughes says that her entire methodology is based on what the manual says, all right? If you need to write that down in a comment for people to remember, please remember it. So, then she switches to saying that that the man in the relationship criticizing her is abusive. She even brings up Johnny b abusing Amber sexually as if it's a fact. Other defamatory things that are just apparently facts to her, she just outright believes them. She's like gossiping on the stand like the lawyer Karen. She, the, both of them are basically doing the same thing. It's, it's a joke. During the cross-examination, Johnny's team immediately jumps on the gendered stereotypes. And as much as she tries to deny it, she definitely did them. She then says that yes, men and women could be either the victim or the perpetrator. Yet, he continues calling out how she uses she, her pronouns when talking about the victim exclusively and just continues to push it. You gotta push stuff like this because this woman is clearly biased and she's trying to deny it when her actions show that she is. All of the times that she was involved in court cases with a male victim, the perpetrator was a male. She specifically says this, it was a male against male whenever there was a male victim involved. She can't, she testified this, she cannot remember the last time that she had a male victim against female perpetrator time. She said this. This is how you do a proper impeachment. <laughs> she keeps bringing up man-on-man -man violence as if that somehow dodges the point, as, as if that somehow proves the point wrong, when if anything, it proves it correctly. She's willing to see that a man is a victim against another man, but she's not willing to see it against an, a woman. Then, the lawyer brings up a PowerPoint that she did where she was giving some talk on violence against women and is used as a professional in, in a case against d women specifically. There are several errors in the transcript that she did not bother to fix. She is also getting paid $500 an hour to do this, yet the evidence that she was writing in all of the research papers and things that she was supposed to bring for evidence has errors in it that she didn't care to fix. There are errors in all of these documents that she wrote while she was interviewing Amber, and she didn't bother to fix them. She then starts getting snappy at the lawyer because she can't weasel her way out of this. He doesn't cut her off either. He knows that letting her speak is the best thing that he can do to, like, attack her credibility. She's doing it herself. She specifically says that she compared Amber's account to the stuff that she has seen on domestic violence. She brings up data points as well, but she doesn't have any data points. So apparently, she was brought in by Amber's legal team in 2019 to do an interview with Amber about her domestic violence and give her a PTSD report. This interview did not include her for the legal position, kind of like the opposite of what Shannon was doing where she was interviewed by the legal team first. The reason why she wasn't interviewed is because they're familiar with each other. She is basically one of the people that they frequently bring on hand to talk about this kind of thing. Like I said, she is on their payroll. She even has the nerve to say that you can assess a relationship even if you've only met one of the people in the relationship. She has never met 
Johnny Depp, yet she claims that she can understand their relationship only through their testimonies and only through Amber having a direct conversation with her. She mentions a Dr. Cohen, who is one of the people that they're referencing in research papers, who did not diagnose Amber with BPD. She brings this up to say, well, this other doctor interviewed Amber and said that she wouldn't diagnose with BPD, but then sneakily does not bring up that Dr. Cohen does not do diagnoses, so Dr. Cohen wouldn't diagnose anyone with anything. Dr. Curry started doing her work on Amber before the lawsuit happened. However, this person only started working on Amber after the lawsuit was underway. She says that Johnny stormed out of a couples therapy session when that wasn't the testimony. The word stormed was not used in the testimony. The couples therapist said that she did not believe that Johnny was abusive either. How did this woman come to a conclusion when she did not talk to Erin, Depp, anyone but Amber, basically. She takes out the shit that she disagrees with with everyone else's reports and just keeps in the shit that she wants to and she directly admits this. Ben Chu then brings up the knife that Amber gave to Johnny. It says until death in Spanish on it and Amber apparently had testified that she had been in violent situations with Johnny beforehand so if she really believed that she would die and she feared for her life, why would she give him a big ass knife as a present? And uh, then the notes are brought up. These are the notes that Don Hughes wrote about Amber while they were having their interviews and when she was diagnosing Amber. She has James Franco under intimate relationships in her notes, along with other people that Amber has dated, like Elon Musk, and then claims that the only reason that she put it under intimate is because she didn't want to make header that said friends, I don't know, platonic and non-platonic even though that would have been way easier. Hughes then says that Amber committed low levels of violence and Johnny gave her longer and more severe levels of violence. So her hitting Depp was just okay because Depp was more violent, I guess, even though there's no evidence for that. She then uses notes of what Amber alleged for the headbutting as evidence that Amber was abused. Again, this goes back to the whole therapist versus examiner thing. The therapist is advocating for and believing the person involved, whereas the examiner is trying to figure out how the person actually feels and whether or not there's any sort of malingering, aka like falsifying any sort of symptoms involved. They're not like investigators, they're not trying to figure out the truth of what actually happened, they're just trying to work out how the person that they're examining actually feels and this is incredibly unprofessional to just be like, oh well I guess that's evidence, she said so, source, dude, trust me. She then goes off about psychological violence when this guy asked a completely different question. She also did not administer the gold standard test that every single examiner uses, aka the CAPS-5, which is what they'll call it, so I'll just call it that. That becomes very strong data to support that conclusion. Let's talk about some of that data. Sure. All right. Uh, you chose to conduct some collateral interviews. Correct. Right? Um, and you interviewed Dr. Bonnie Jacobs. Correct. And you, you looked at her notes. Correct. And, and you know that Miss Jacobs, Dr. Jacobs, uh, doesn't know anything about the version of what happened in Australia until Miss Heard had already been sued. Accurate and thorough information. I've been having done 12 tests with so many questions, I wanted to just be as accurate as possible. The, I'm sure my memory would miss some things that might be relevant. Uh, all right, so let's talk about the CTS-2. It's dated 9-26-2019, uh, 2019. Correct. All right, 9-26-2019. And it goes through and it asks a whole series of questions about what you've done and what your partner has done. That's correct. There was tons of these questions. Correct. And every single one of those questions is preceded by the same question, right? How often did this happen in the past year? Correct. You knew that as, uh, as of 9-26-2019, not a single one of the things that Ms. Heard identified happened to her in the last year. Correct. Right. She was oriented to a different time frame to get a checklist of those behaviors. Right. And one of the one of the the uh, although it says please, how often did this happen in the past year? One of the questions is. My partner used force to make me have oral or anal sex. 
Correct. She went with zero on that, right? I'd have to see if you'd like to. She also did not fill in the box you're supposed to fill in on the CAPS 5, even though you're supposed to do it and it says it in the manual, other people have read and understand it that you need to fill it in. The specific reason why is that even though you understand your notes, the person reading it who is not you will not understand it. It's basically like when you're programming, you have to use clear phrases so that future you understands exactly what you're meaning by certain things that you're saying and you can't just make everything garbled because especially if someone else is trying to read and then continue to work on your work, they need to know what those phrases are. They're not you. They don't understand what they mean. She expects everyone to just go through all of her other notes just to understand the things that she wrote in this, like, badly filled out CAPS 5 report. She then, when she's supposed to list specifics, writes a general phrase and just leaves it at that. She didn't check for new details or correct details or anything else, but then on some she continued to add details because I guess she disagreed with the other details that she failed to add. She didn't have any shit written down on the triggers or the recovery time. She also left a number of boxes blank and said she just told me, trust me bro, as why she didn't fill any of that shit in. She also wrote on the right side of the document, even though you're supposed to fill it in the boxes, in every other question, she added notes, and in any of the important ones about the evidence for the abuse, she didn't write anything. They also go through the instructions in the manual on the CAPS-5, and she makes excuses for why she didn't use them properly. You diagnosed Amber Heard with PTSD long before you made use of the gold standard test for PTSD. That is correct. And I make the diagnosis of PTSD in my clinical practice without using the CAPS all the time. All right, so just so you and I are on the same page, and I think we are, uh, this gold standard test that I'm referring to is the CAPS-5. That is correct. That's the one that Dr. Curry administered, correct? Correct. All right. Uh, you didn't administer the CAPS-5 until A, after you'd already diagnosed Amber Heard with PTSD, right? She had PTSD in 2019, she had PTSD in the beginning of 2021 when I evaluated her, and then she had PTSD in December 27, 2021 when I administered the CAPS, that's correct. All right, um, I think I asked a much more narrow question than that. Several times a month, then that's what the frequency is. And you didn't fill that frequency box in at all? because she told me it was frequently several times a month, which is one of the anchors encoding the CAPS. All right, let's look at the next one. It's called testing the limits. I went back to some of the um, questions where she answered in the affirmative and said, and is this also happening vis-a-vis -vis your childhood abuse? Are you also having intrusive thoughts and feelings about childhood? Are you avoiding thinking about things about childhood? Is that happening for you now as well? In another test, it says that her temper is high and she explodes. She also scores herself a zero on the anger violence item, even though she, before, had said that she explodes because her anger is really high. And Hughes is just fine with this, there's no contradiction in her mind. Also, it's kind of funny how she remembers Amber saying certain things word for word, yet when she actually needs to bring up anything, you know, has evidence, she needs her notes and she can't find it in her notes. I think that's kind of funny. One of the things about the way that she used the CAPS-5 and other things that is specifically weird is that it says any time in the last six months do you remember this? Any time in the last six months have you felt this? It's specifically the last six months. However, Don Hughes said that she put Amber's mind back to when the abuse was occurring in the marriage. So even though it says the last six months, they were using a different time frame. However, when Amber scores herself a zero on any sort of violence caused by her explosive anger, she says zero because she was only talking about the six months prior. Even though Don Hughes just said before that they weren't talking about the six months, they were talking about the abuse time frame. Yet, why is she allowing Amber to answer these questions within the six month time frame of the test? That doesn't make any sense. That's very unprofessional, isn't it? But that's enough about that. She'll come back later. We are now at Amber's testimony. This was painful to listen to. Amber comes to the stand and smiles awkwardly and says it's terrifying to be here today and very traumatizing. 
sure doesn't look like it. She's reliving everything, and this is the most painful and difficult thing she's ever done, which... I, is it worse than the abuse? My ex-husband is suing me uh, for an op-ed I wrote. And how do you feel about that? I, um, I st struggle to have the words. I struggle to find the words to describe how uh, painful this is. Um, this is horrible for me to sit here uh, for weeks and um, relive everything. Um, hear people that I knew, um, some well, some not. My ex-husband. She has a kind of weird delivery of talking very fast at times when she gets angry and then trying to deliberately slow her words down. I don't know. I guess she's trying to have some sort of charisma, but it's kind of strange because she was so stone-faced and constipated the entirety of the trial and when she's done with her testimony, she continues to have that same exact expression, yet she's able to kind of robotically display some sort of surface level emotions every now and again when she's testifying. It's like she's ticking off in her head that this is the time to pretend to cry even though not a single tear falls, or this is the time to smile a little bit and then immediately go back to being stone-faced. She says that he's suing her for an op-ed that she wrote. The entire time they're trying to make it sound like every single instance that it references Johnny is something that the the publicists and the people who were writing it for her did it, but she just admitted at the start that she wrote it herself, so um... She has the continued constipated scrunched up face and is trying to bring up truth as much as possible. She keeps saying, it was the hardest thing I ever had to do, referencing every single time she has to talk about the abuse. She sounds like she is reading a script, quite frankly. It gives me vibes like a politician trying to be relatable laughing and giggling at times to try and seem charming and then she'll turn on the waterworks just in time and then immediately when someone interrupts her or she has to get back on topic, it just shuts down completely. She also talks about her childhood and she brings up breaking in horses as if this is something to give her points for, you know, relatability and being quirky, but breaking horses is really mean. There are different ways to do it involving training them and trying to make it develop trust with them. You're not supposed to just break them. I know that it's not literally breaking them, but the practice that the term is coined for is not good. I don't agree with it. She describes the horses and she's like, the key is to not show fear and gives a nice long pause and looks at the audience. The only thing that she could have done to make it worse is look at the camera. And then she repeats it again for good measure. And what, if anything, did you learn from your father about how to react to the horses? Well, with training horses, um, I guess the key, the, the key things are to not show fear, not get intimidated, not show fear. She paints herself as a small town girl in a small town who was playing with horses and wanted to be a big deal when she grew up. She's working class. Guys, she's relatable. Believe her. She also claims that she did soup kitchen work and worked with children because she's such a charitable person. She even learned sign language by herself to be a translator at such a young age. I don't believe any of this. I hope it's true because at least someone is helping people, doesn't matter who it is. But it's, it reminds me of those, um, those, like, videos where YouTube pranksters will go film themselves giving money to homeless people. It's like, Listen, I'm glad that I guess the homeless people are getting money, no matter who it comes from, at least they're getting some kind of charity. When I look at the person who's doing it, I can still criticize them for doing it specifically to look good on camera. Like, there's two parts to it. The first part is I'm happy that someone got some charity, but I'm also not happy at the person involved for the motives that they did it by. And I think that if she's telling the truth in this matter, I can still be angry at her for talking about it like this. She starts talking about how she clicked with Johnny and how she had such a deep connection with him. She still has this kind of pleasant smile on her face as if she's reliving fond memories. And it's kind of strange because whenever she talks about something nice that he did, she laughs and smiles, but then as soon as she talks about anything else, she forces herself to look like she's crying and then immediately stops doing so. She met Johnny during the Rum Diaries, and after talking with him, he called her for the part. 
She talks about his deep voice with a smile that you'd think that the voice would be kind of triggering for her, if anything, after everything that she claims happened, but I guess not. She would smile and talk about the amazing shooting schedule and how dazzling he is. She says that the kisses felt real. She says that Johnny shared her love for red wine and she was going on about how she had poor people wine and she got him some poor people wine but he got her expensive wine. They had a flirtatious relationship on set but they didn't do anything else because they were both in relationships. She mentions feeling intimidated. After filming they went their separate ways and then one time he called her and invited her over under the pretense that they were doing movie stuff but it was clearly just to see her. She said she couldn't go. She got some gifts from him, one of them being a dress that she wore on the film that she really wanted, others being books and whatnot. They're trying to paint him as a groomer, I guess, even though she's an adult. And he loved bomb her, apparently. He attempted to send her guitars, but she didn't accept them. She also made some jokes and none of her emotions reach her eyes. It's honestly kind of creepy. So she did a press tour for the Brum Diary while she was separating from her former partner. At the end of the first day, Johnny invited her to drinks at his room with the director, but when she got there, he said that the director wasn't going to make it, so it was just the two of them. He asks her about her relationship status, and he said that he's also going through some rough separation. They both talked about it, drank red wine, and rekindled. Then they kissed, and they fell in love during the press tour for the movie. They started dating under the radar because his wife hadn't broken up publicly with him yet, so it would be bad for the media to see it, even though they were basically separated anyway. She then immediately starts to paint the picture that she would be blamed for everything if the press got out because she's a woman. He would spend days with her in secret, and they would have this charming, amazing romance, and then he would disappear, and then they would have those moments again when he reappeared. One day, they met up on his island while he was going through some health issues and he invited her to stay. He was drinking lots of tea, which she didn't question but she found quite strange. So, after this, they went back to their secrecy in the city. She can't remember what movie she was shooting, so the lawyer has to remind her of what her story is, but she says that she visited him during The Lone Ranger, and she'd stay at home and cook for him and be doting when he came back from work. It was the first time that she was told he had a liver issue, and that explained the tea. She would take off his boots to show love, and specifically says, but if he wanted to take off his own boots, he could. He gifted her daggers, and she says that he loved knives and guns. She got him the knife saying that engraved Spanish thing, because he apparently said that all the time. Starting early on, he was really gracious and generous to her parents. He suddenly also had a southern accent that just popped up, apparently. Instantly, he was giving them gifts and getting along. He wanted to buy her a horse. She said no, and then he talked to her dad about what type of horse she wanted, and then just one day showed her that he was getting her a horse. She had resisted up until this point, but now she suddenly had one. She says the relationship was always intense, and he was starting to disappear again, and he'd start drinking, and then he'd be different. Specifically, the substances brought out the difference. Music and reading poetry to me, or painting me, or, you know, just talking. Um, and then he would disappear. And there'd be just no way to get a hold of him, no way to contact him. At, at first, I didn't really think anything about it, but um, he disappeared uh, at one point uh, and then came back and said he was dealing with something, some health issue, and uh, would I join him in the Bahamas? And that I think that's when I learned he had an island. You, you know, did you see that thing? And he said, yeah, yeah, I think the whole world saw that kid. That's how they'll remember you. That's how the world will remember you. And I was like, oh, come on. I mean, it's like, but it, you know, I felt, I felt good in it. I felt good. And he said, yeah, kid, that's what you're putting out there in the world. No one will ever forget that. And that's all they'll see you as. That's what you, that's what you wanted. That's what you were going for, you know, my- He'd say something and then he'd accuse her of saying something else and, and was bothered at the clothing she wore and the fact that she was an independent woman that was working. He wouldn't want her to work and claim that she was whoring herself out every time she got a job and other actresses doing her role were just fame-hungry whores. She said that she felt dirty being an actor and dirty for pursuing her own job. When she'd walk out of the house, he'd say, That's what you're wearing, kid? I see. She'd feel pretty at a press event, and then she'd want him to say something about how pretty she looked, and he'd say, Yeah, kid, that's what you're putting out in the world, so that's all they're gonna see you as. Like, he's a pimp or something. Then, the blow-ups. The anger, the explosive anger. He'd throw something, smash something. He loves to smash up hotel rooms and apartments. She also tries to look like she's crying, and, yeah, it's not really working. 
She also recounts him hitting the wall beside her head. Then he'd disappear, get clean, and he'd come back and say it's done, and then it, their relationship would be wonderful again. For the first time, he'd hit her. They were talking on the couch, and it was all fine, but then he was drinking and he was using coke because there was a jar of coke, and she talks about a tattoo that she kind of commented on. And he said it said wino. She thought he was joking, so she laughed, and then he slapped her across the face. She laughed, purely in shock. This entire thing is, is as if she's reading from a novel. She says that she's sitting there looking at the spot on the carpet, which is something that you would definitely see someone in a novel talking about if they were going through some domestic abuse and they wanted to show how in shock the character was. It just feels like she's reading a novel. It doesn't feel like she's talking about something that happened to her. He then says, you think you're a funny bitch, and slaps her again, and she keeps saying, as a woman, she felt this way, as a woman, she felt this way. He slaps her harder, and she loses her balance off the edge of the couch, and she's like, oh no, abuse. <laughs> she tries acting, it's really bad, not one tear. It's interesting, because let's say Kyle Rittenhouse, for example, everyone in the woke media was trying to say that he was faking crying, but you can see that he's specifically trying not to cry. He's crying and he's trying to hold it back because he doesn't want to cry. When people cry in front of others and they're actually crying, they feel embarrassed. If you're crying in front of your friends and people who know you when you're going through something, it doesn't matter how well you know them, you feel embarrassed to cry in front of them because it's so pathetic and intimate, that's how it feels. And you can see that he's actually crying and he's trying really hard not to because he's on the stand, he's humiliated in front of everyone that he's crying this way, but he went through something horribly traumatic and he can't help but cry. Amber, on the other hand, is trying so hard to cry, but it's not happening the way she wants, so she'll just keep pushing it. It's a huge difference. Again, I'm not an expert in anything, I'm just looking at what I'm seeing. She says that he started crying after he hit her, and she had never seen an adult grown man cry before. There's these kind of emasculating comments here and there that she makes on the stand, where every now and again she would be like, well he, this grown ass man, was doing something pathetic, and it's kind of disgusting seeing her do that when it's proven that she was the one who was abusing him, and even on the stand she's trying to emasculate him. Apparently, after this incident, he had grabbed her hands, crying, and said, I'm so sorry, I thought I put the fucker away, I thought I killed it. And then she went out into her car, stared out the window, and thought for a bit. She brings up her breath on the window. So we got the carpet, we got the breath on the window, there's a bunch of, like, anchoring things. Then afterwards, he came to talk to her and he promised that he would never do this again. He bought her bottles of expensive wine, and she acts like he was the one who kept referring to the monster when he testified that she was the one who would call him a monster, but she believed him, and she went back to him. Then the cycle would repeat, and he'd randomly show up to try and catch her cheating, and then the littlest things would set him off, and she didn't know why. He would drink and constantly punch the walls next to her head. This would escalate, and he'd push her. She'd get up, look him in the eyes to defy him and not show fear like with the horses, and then he'd push her again. <laughs> it so s it's seemingly so stupid, so in like insignificant. I will never forget it. I changed... It changed my life. I was sitting on the couch and we were talking. We were having a, like a normal conversation, you know, just there was no fighting, no argument, nothing. And um, he was drinking and um, I didn't realize at the time, but I think he was using cocaine because it was like there was a jar, a jar and slapped me across the face. And I laughed. I laughed because I, I didn't know what else to do. I thought, this must be a joke. They tried to bring up a random picture of her and try to move it into evidence without laying any sort of foundation for it. Then they just kind of move on. He would apparently constantly accuse her of cheating and, and trying to leave him, and he would have to be reassured that she wasn't going anywhere, which is basically his testimony, but she's flipping it around. She then said that she would go to her happy place or something. She says depending on the drugs, he would have a different personality, which is kind of similar to how Dr. Curry diagnosed her. Even though everyone else said 
that he wasn't different on drugs, I guess they're all lying. In 2013, Johnny wanted to send her dad some support after her dad fell off the wagon. He had taken a picture where he raised a glass of spirits in the picture for support, and she thought it was weird because he was supposed to be sober. He then went back to the accusations again, and she kept waiting for the sober time to happen where she would be able to not be hit or something. In March, there was the painting incident, where he had stayed up and had coke and liquor, and he was babbling and suddenly the painting was the worst thing ever to him because he was having delusions and he tried to burn the painting. They bring up the bloodbath thing that they were talking about before, and Johnny had accused her of a bunch of shit and screamed at her and all that crap. Then she got backhanded. She mentions that he wears rings, so it hurt really hard, and her lip went into her teeth. She then minimizes everything. She said that she, as a person, minimizes everything she goes through because she has this tough exterior that she needs to hold up. So she made a joke of it even though she was wounded. There was no evidence of any sort of blood in any of the pictures, even though she claimed that there was a lot of blood, so that's kind of interesting. She took a picture of the bruise on her arm and Johnny had slapped her when they screamed at each other. She could tell that he was gonna hit her, so she picked up a vase and threw it so that she could run. Then he got to her and held her down, so the bruise on her arm is apparently evidence of that. But she says that in this incident, he hit her on the face so many times that she was basically battered and bleeding, yet why did she only take a picture of her arm and not her apparently bleeding, bruised, and bloody face. She says that she never did coke, not once. She was trying to get Johnny out of the house, but no one could, not even his assistant, until late at night, he wanted her to go to a shoot and she reluctantly agreed. And then they got the dogs in the car, he was smoking with the window down. He starts howling out of the window like a fucking furry, grabs the dog and holds him out the window while howling like an animal, like he was gonna drop the dog, and everyone in the car froze. Everyone is stressed out, but no one reacts because they don't know what's gonna happen next. Even the driver himself said nothing like this happened, and if anything, there was an allegation that came out against Amber that she apparently held a dog out the window. So I don't know what she's going for here. They bring up the picture again with the coke box. The white lines are coke. It's a very staged, neat kind of picture. In May 2013, there was an incident at a place that they were staying at named Hicksville, a hotel trailer park. She and Johnny were gonna do drugs with friends. The friends did some MDMA, and one of her friends didn't handle the M MDNA so well, so she rested her head on Amber's shoulder, leaned into her, and Johnny got really mad and started screaming. He says that she was apparently trying to flirt with Amber, and that's his girl. Then grabs a hold of the woman's wrist and says, do you know how many pounds it pressure it takes to break a human wrist. This is a crowded campfire and there's no corroboration of this event whatsoever. And then after this event happened, Johnny claimed that Amber was the one who started the whole thing and he started smashing up the trailer and he was babbling and going mental. He even ripped her dress, there's no ripped dress in evidence by the way, and said that he needs to do a cavity search to sexually abuse her. She starts crying again, and this is where it gets particularly nasty. Karen jumps in with a new question, and Amber is instantly okay, there's no tears, there's nothing, it's fine. They apparently dr brushed off the sexual assault in the trailer, and then her dog steps on a bee. <laughs> you fuckhead. That is the stupidest thing you interpreted there. They just brush it off, like, apparently he was, like, sexually assaulting you, bitch, what the fuck? She tries so hard to squeeze out some tears, it just doesn't happen. Honey, please, just give up, you're hurting yourself. Apparently he'd pass out in his own poo and vomit, and then she'd clean up after him, and his crew had cleaned up after him too. They have no witnesses in the crew alleging that any of that happened. But she had written some letters to herself that she could read to him later, and then she never did, and I guess the letters are important somehow, I don't know. She did some MDMA on a plane with him when they were going to Russia. They did it on the plane with more people on the plane who would have witnessed this. There was even a flight attendant who was engaging with them, and Johnny had offered her some MDMA, which she took. He then harassed the flight attendant, who was now on MDMA. The, the wrist thing happened again, where he said that he was gonna break her wrist. So he just does this, I guess, occasionally every now and again. He's like, oh boy, it's been a while since I've harassed a female, and then he grabs their wrists and says that he can break them. She keeps saying that he whacked her in the face. Like, at the hotel room, for instance, one of her witnesses, Depp security guard, Jerry Judge, is conveniently not with us anymore, so he can't even testify, but she claims that he was there. But he would whack her in the face, I guess. She claims a picture of Johnny sleeping in a chair that you'll see here is him passed out from a drug binge, even though he could just be sleeping in a chair because he's taking a nap. 
And then in another picture, it's basically the same thing. He could have just fallen asleep where he was, but she's saying that all of these are evidence that he abused her after a bender full of drugs and alcohol and then passed out and she took a picture of him passed out. But she hasn't taken a picture of any of the bloody, horrific bruises that she got. She had met his kids at the Lone Ranger premiere and went there to Tokyo. He was drinking with her at the restaurant and Johnny was upset at her for judging him for drinking. Johnny then started screaming at her in the actual hotel room and then he passed out, I guess. He fell asleep at the table and she was taking all those pictures to make him look bad, I guess. But the, if you were actually abused, you would have a fuck ton of other pictures that would make him look bad. These just make him look tired. They had had conversations about moving and she said that it was going to hopefully make him less abusey by then by moving in with her. She kept having to justify her job to him and he got bothered by all of the sex scenes in the movies that she was thinking of doing and he soon got more controlling. She had moved in with him shortly after Rocky had moved to the penthouse, the one that Isaac and the other people were staying at. She starts smiling when she says the proposal was amazing, despite the fact that she, you know, apparently was crying and tra traumatized. I don't know what the fuck emotions she's trying to do here. This is like Zuckerberg. Her fake crying is way over the top. She keeps sniffling every now and again as well when she remembers that she has to. Taken, it seemed like, a turn and had decided that the painting was the big the, an offense that he could not forgive me for it meant i was having an affair with my ex-partner whom i had already split with whom i had already split and it made no sense to me so I'm, I'm trying to kind of quell the accusations by saying you know it's been there and what are you talking about and it's like that doesn't mean anything and you know he was demanding i take it down he eventually takes it down and tries to burn it off um and then he <laughs> proceeds to do a cavity search. He was looking, he said he was looking for his drugs, his cocaine, his coke. I was wondering how I, somebody who didn't do cocaine and was against it, that was in and of itself causing problems in our relationship. How could I hide? Why would I hide his drugs from like, I, like he was insinuating that I was doing it or something? It made no sense. She says that if she had wanted to go to a concert, Johnny would threaten to leave her because every invitation was a cheating sex capade. She was calling and texting for hours about this with him, trying to convince him to let her live her life. But she would convince her empowering roles were actually whore roles, so he was good at manipulating her. They pull up some nonsense text that he sent that doesn't actually mean anything, like, I, I don't actually know what this means. But she alleged that he was passed out and had to be carried through the door by his assistants and security guards, even though there's no testimony of that happening. She also does not answer the fucking question. Karen is trying to ask her questions to help her lie, but she's not answering them. She always has to paint him as a bad father. It's another one of those things, like, imagine someone abused you and then claim that you abused them, and you're sitting on the stand in court, and they have the nerve to still dig at you and make horrible comments about you on the stand while they're trying to pretend that they're a battered housewife. She says that so many people were apparently around when he was drinking and being violent, but none of these people have any testimony like this. She tries to say that Miss James from earlier was drunk on the job and was difficult and troubled to try and dis credit Miss James and honestly I uh, listen I, I believe her over you Amber. She claims that she was the one who brought up the prenup and he didn't want it. The only way out of this was death so you give him a knife as a present? Johnny and her dad were at a party and they had left to get some more drugs and then Johnny hid away afterwards. This is their engagement party. Johnny then shoved her and grabbed her by the base of her neck and then he threw a bottle at her. They struggle and he whacked her in the face and she got a broken nose. I was otherwise unscathed. Where's the picture though? So they went to Boston at one point and Johnny had already been upset that she didn't tell him she had a romantic scene in a movie. So she gets on the phone the next day and there's talk of a full detox that he's going through. He's drunk and high on the car on the way to the Boston flight incident. So he's drunk and then he's gonna get on the plane and be drunk on the plane. On the plane, he starts antagonizing her. He stinks of alcohol and he starts throwing shit at her as she's moving around the plane to try and escape him. He then slaps her and his friend 
there's no witness and then kicks her in the back and then no one did anything because they're all on Johnny's payroll even though there's apparently many witnesses to these events. She then texted someone that she needed help but it's a very ambiguous I need help kind of thing. Everything else was also redacted so we don't know what she was asking for help for. She says that he would text her asking for forgiveness, but there's no texts. She also went back to him because this was the, she thought that the detox was a turning point and he wouldn't abuse her anymore. She acts like he had a fucking narcolepsy problem during the Kipper saga where he was detoxing. He had passed out and screamed and pooped himself and whatever. <laughs> the evidence of this are pictures of him falling asleep in chairs. She goes on about how much she was doing to support him and she was constantly doing things for him during the detox or whatever, but again, there's no evidence of this. There's no witnesses anyway. Apparently, Johnny was trying to force her to stop working as well during this point. There's some more shit that's honestly kind of useless and boring. She repeats a lot of these incidents like, oh, he punched me again, by the way, <laughs> like kind of thing. So they take his substance abuse struggles and they spin it to make it seem like every time he was doing physical abuse things, he was drunk out of his mind and there's absolutely no context for anything. She talks about all of these horrible injuries and blood splashing everywhere, but the only pictures that they have are either like, very strange looking, very sus looking bruises or things where there should be blood. Like she testified that there was blood, but there was no blood whatsoever. This is driving me nuts. She keeps saying all of the abuse happened and made her feel embarrassed. Not shameful, just embarrassed. She sprinkles in things to make him sound possessive, yet emasculated, and other random jabs to avoid answering the question. Her response to MDMA is, I would never. At least Johnny's rambling was interesting, man. But then she claims that she was being thrown around, like a rag doll, I guess. Where are your bruises? She hit her head hard, but didn't need any medical attention and whatnot. He apparently teleports behind her colon three, and then told her he'd carve up her face. But she forgets other important details that could probably lead to some evidence, if it actually happened. She was naked, slipping on beer and broken glass, but her feet were never reported to be scratched up. She never sought medical attention. There was no pictures of her feet actually being scratched up or anything. She could have gotten a concussion, but she didn't seek anything out. Her head was bleeding, but there's no evidence of this. She then says that she had a panic attack and doesn't even remember if the bottle that he raped her with was broken inside her vagina or not. He, he apparently stuck a bottle inside her. She did not not even think to check whether or not it was broken. It was something that would have been cutting her up inside her body and she would not even know. Then she never got medical attention after being raped by a bottle that could have been broken or not. I'm fucking mental. She then does not elaborate on any of this. Oh my god. Like I said, I'm pretty passionate about this case, but one of the things that makes me super fucking angry beyond belief is I've been to trauma therapy. I've known other people who have also had the same issues and this is not what it's like. This is horrible. This is like this is like a pantomime of someone who's been through something like this. And again, she keeps bringing up as a woman. Well, as a woman who has had to go through therapy for trauma. Fuck you, Amber. Seriously, you're the reason why it's so hard for not only females to come out against this sort of thing, but male victims. Because people like you crush them. After he raped her, she left the room. And then she apparently didn't know how his finger got busted. She just moves on to talking about how she doesn't know how his finger got cut off. I guess it just decided to hop off and go on vacation. It wasn't her fault. He then raped her in another incident, saying, I'll kill you over and over again. And then she said she didn't feel any pain because she was too shocked that the rape was occurring. She uses panic attacks as time to think of new lies. Like every now and again, she'll pause and like breathe and be like, oh my God, I'm fucking... And then she'll like, just come up with some new shit afterwards. She said that she first mistook the bottle for him punching her in the vagina? And there's no blood in any of the pictures. There's no sign of the bottle, which would have some evidence. The only blood that's there is from Johnny's story. They then go over the same evidence of like smashed bottles and there's not interesting shit going on really. She left while Johnny was in the hospital for his finger and she didn't go to the hospital for her slashed up vagina. She really wants to hammer home that he's constantly on coke to the point that he wouldn't be able to even get his surgery or something because he's so coked up. And then he's openly like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go cheat on you and have sex with some random lady, lol. She says Debbie, the nurse, and the other people were there during the difficult parts of their relationship, but no one had ever testified to the, any of this happening. 
she had thrown the Red Bull can at him, but she is saying that it happened the other way around and that Debbie was there to witness this, even though Debbie did not say that this happened. One time, he apparently randomly just headbutted her right there. There's no sort of struggle, nothing. He was just like, lol, watch this. Then there were hair chunks that had apparently been ripped out of her skull and these were apparently covered in blood because if you rip hair out of someone's skull, there's gonna be a lot of blood. There's gonna be a lot of blood. Yet, a picture on the ground looks suspiciously like when you clean out your hairbrush and you just dump the hair on the ground and take a picture of it on the carpet. People with long hair. Y you can back me up on this, right? She never mentions a metallic taste in her mouth as well when she gets hit in the nose. This is something that I notice when people lie about getting broken noses and like stuff like that. Like when your nose breaks, you have like a metallic taste in your mouth and people who have actually had their noses broken can talk about this. Again, this is not from personal experience. I've never had that happen to me, but this is something that I saw a lot and a lot of people I saw mentioned it, so I went into the topic a bit further, and it is quite interesting. When people fake their noses being broken, they don't mention that metallic taste. They, they bring up the pictures, and they're like, so you see, this is where the horrific bruise is, and then it's just like a small dot, and I can't even see it. Like <laughs> People had said that they saw her without makeup. This is some pretty strong makeup that has to be not only incredibly strong, but also invisible. She said that she was heartbroken at the time that she was missing Christmas on the island, and I don't know why, because wouldn't you feel traumatized if you had to go back to the place where you were bottle raped? Anyway, and at another point in time, she was being grabbed by the vagina and being thrown around. I don't know if he was like holding her at, on the vagina and like picking her up and throwing her around like a rag doll, or if these were separate things. <laughs> I don't know. She said that she forgot what the first act of violence was, yet she says that she never could forget the first act of violence. Which one is it? So they spend a lot of time making excuses for why her memory don't work so good. Her entire case is that substance turns someone into an abuser, but I guess when she drinks alcohol, she doesn't turn into one. She seems to completely ignore any PTSD triggers regarding location, even states that the house didn't give her any PTSD. Wow. The glass cuts also look very meticulous and this is when, well, something that you'll find out later, she has says that she had experience with cutting herself before. Now, this doesn't exactly look like glass slashing someone's arm. This looks very meticulous. There's no clear timeline during her testimony either. I guess that's on purpose because the vaguer you are, the harder it is to kind of pin you down on things. And there's so much... There's so much violence in her story that the violence stops being shocking because you're kind of overexposed to it in the story. Like, if I was reading this as a novel, like she is saying it out like a novel, she makes it sound like it's something that I would kind of get bored reading because I'd be like, this, this is not true. There was also a folder on his computer called No Fun for JD that would have all of these inappropriate pictures of Amber where she would wear something revealing in public and then he'd zoom in to the part that was showing like her boobs or her side boob or her back and then zoom in on them and take pictures and she she also reframes that infamous I hit you you were not punched line to say that she would hit him back and he would punch her and it means that there's a size difference so her hits would not do anything to him. It's coming back to what Don Hughes was saying with like it doesn't matter how much violence the small woman commits, her acts of violence and what that means shouldn't matter if the guy is apparently bigger than her and can just shrug it off, even though it clearly shows that she's being aggressive towards him, you know? She also straight out admits that she thinks that all the staff are lying because they're all on Johnny's payroll. They then try and discredit the nurse, Erin, who had said that her own notes had said that Amber, you know, didn't have any bruises or anything. And Amber, even though Erin was a live-in nurse and had seen all these things firsthand and is a registered nurse, Amber was like, nah, she don't know nothing. She also tries to make it sound like Johnny is the one who shat in the bed. And Johnny was screaming about how she had shit in the bed and then she had no idea what was going on. She also emphasizes that Johnny was yelling verbal abuse at her LGBT friend, I.O. something something. He threw a phone at her eye. There's no pics of this whatsoever. There's no pictures. It also is not consistent with a phone being thrown at her. Like, I'll give you an example. You know, like a Samsung tablet? One time I had one of those. I was holding one of those and I was walking to the kitchen and then I bumped into something and I dropped the tablet. The corner of the tablet hit me directly on the nail of my big toe. Like where the nail meets the skin, it hit me directly there from when I dropped it in my hands. Instantly, there was red like under my nail 
And when that happens, it's incredibly painful because the blood is pushing up against your nail. So you have to literally like make a hole in the nail to try and alleviate the pressure. And even after that, it was fucking horrible. It was like throbbing. It, it kind of like how Johnny described his finger, it was like hot and throbbing. And when I was walking, I would have to tilt my foot and lift my toe up because even that kind of pressure would just make the pressure under the nail even worse and it was just horrible. <laughs> but if that sort of thing can happen, someone throwing a phone at you, that would leave a big bruise, especially if it's by your cheekbones and stuff, like around your eye. Your eye is a very delicate area, but there's no evidence of this. She says that no one saw bruises because they were standing too far away, even though I guess she forgot her own Amica cream excuse because she doesn't even bring up Annika cream once. I don't even know where Karen got the Annika cream thing from because Amber doesn't bring it up. She also says that she has a bruise kit and she starts talking about the bruise color theory as if that gives her credibility and she says that she always wears makeup, always. She also said that Johnny would ruin her and no one would have believed her and it's all about these PR team like hitmen that are trying to make some conspiracy against her. She then starts fucking melting down and no tears, they just vanish. She says she doesn't make the donation payments because she wants to pay it in installments and she said that she allowed people to pay it on her behalf even though if she was making installments there would definitely be more installments from the time that she had first paid to now even though there aren't any. She also talks about strong female issues and she's a strong female and men don't understand because women are oppressed. Also blaming the ACLU for all the references to Johnny in the article even though there's email evidence that shows that they were like well Johnny's in the article, god damn it, like they didn't want her to do that. She also claims that she was the one who lost work and she got fucked up and dropped from Aquaman 2 purely because Johnny. And Johnny was totally fine, she's the one who got shit because of the patriarchy. We then get to the cross-examination, which is one of my favorite parts of the entire trial. <laughs> Johnny had promised that she would never see his eyes again and if you'll notice for the clips that I've been playing, he looks down a lot. He's really keeping out his word. Obviously, you can't do that every single second of the day when you're, you know, looking at someone in a court trial, but he's trying his best. For some reason, that seems really effective to me. This entire cross-examination is just Amber getting reamed by Queen Camille Vasquez. She is very bothered by it, and Amber is- Amber, in the recording that plays, clearly says that no one is gonna believe him because he's a man. Amber said that Johnny had rings on every finger, and if this was true, it would have hurt and left a lot of bruises. She even gets Amber to admit that, according to Amber's testimony, he wore these rings all the time. Yet, as soon as she starts probing into why the pictures of bruises don't have any blood or there's no, you know, type of evidence of this and the fact that he apparently hits her a lot wearing rings, she starts walking it back and saying, well, it wasn't, you know, all the time and stuff like that. No. Oh, no, a hug will save it all. Oh, all this, no, all this, wanted, everything. I just, just wanted, wanted, I just wanted to touch you. Just say, really? After all the shit you just said? I just wanted to give after you all a hug. Shit, you just, fucking yes, yes, me up, yes, you please. Touch me. And there's no injuries to your face in this picture, are there? Not that this picture shows. And there's no medical records reflecting that you sought treatment after this alleged incident either. I did not seek medical treatment at this time. So there's no medical records reflecting any injuries to your face after he, he hit you several times. I did not need to go to the doctor at the time. Despite hitting you several times that so you lost count with rings on, your fi on his fingers. That's correct. I did not seek medical attention other than my therapist. By to another incident in March of 2013 13, where Mr. Depp hit you while he was wearing a lot of rings. Do you remember that testimony? Yes, ma'am. And you testified you felt like your lip went through your teeth and it got a little blood on the wall. Yes, I remember that. There isn't a picture of you with injuries after that alleged incident, is there? I don't know if I've seen one. Um, I, ha I can't recall. There are a lot of pictures. She also then says that there are a fuck ton of evidence in photos that she was not allowed to submit to the trial, even though you're supposed to give all of your evidence over to the lawyers immediately. Just give them, give them over all of it, all of it, and then they sort it through. So she's directly throwing her own lawyers under the bus by saying, well, I do have pictures of all the blood, but they're not allowing me to show it. <laughs> Like, this happens to the point where there is a sidebar, because I, I can only guess that the the t Johnny's team is like, where are these pictures? We need to see them. We were denied seeing this evidence. And 
the other team was like, we don't know what she's talking about. She didn't give us any pictures like this. She also keeps contradicting herself in the same fucking instances. There's so many pictures the day after these instances apparently occurred where she is seen without any bruises. Yet Amber claims all of this was very careful makeup with color theory, even though it's very clear that there aren't any bruises or caked on makeup that would hide these bruises. Where are the pictures? Why are the pictures that provided not proving anything. Why are there withheld pictures that apparently prove everything? When he had kicked her in the back and stepped on her back, she wore a backless dress that night to some award thing and there were no bruises and no makeup. After the event to see, to make sure that nothing, that you couldn't see anything. Your testimony was that you were checking in the car on the way to the event to make sure that there were no marks on your back. Perhaps I misspoke or I misunderstood. It was on the way back from it was after I was concerned. After, you know, concerned that there would be marks in any photographs since we were being photographed at Johnny's press event. You didn't show this jury a picture of you in that backless dress though, did you? Um, I don't know what you mean, I'm sorry. You didn't show this jury a picture of you at the Mordecai premiere wearing a backless dress, did you? I haven't had the opportunity to. I assume you have it. I do. Bruises or visible marks on your back in this picture. No, not that I could see. She says that she didn't need to seek any treatment for the rape and all of the cuts to her face, even though a bottle had broken inside of her. She had then testified that she was certain that she had a broken nose, but I mean, she's no doctor, so she doesn't know. And she also says that she had two black eyes and there was blood everywhere, but there's no evidence of it. She was also on the nightly show the day afterwards and, and, and she's just having a good time and there's no bruises or cuts on her face. There are zoomed in shots of her talking in that show and there's nothing. That's a photo of you opening your mouth on the right, right? That's correct. And again, an, a, a larger view of the same photo. I grew up That was you on the James Corden show. And they also show evidence that Dr. Kipper said that she's fine and there's nothing going on when she get, went to see him. She also says that after she was with Johnny, an EMT, some random EMT, like the Tooth Fairy, just came over to her and told her that her nose was probably broken. So how many years after this occurred? Only now is she seeking medical attention for a nose being broken. She had also taken the embarrassing ice cream picture and had sent it to a friend and there's text in it in evidence that Karen tried to prevent from getting in because she really doesn't want the text to get in. She also claimed that the monster wouldn't know she took the picture or get upset about it. I don't know what that means. Camille then reveals all of the shit on the table that was changed and staged for the picture. There are other pictures showing that these things were staged to look a certain way. The line of coke was too clean and it looked like no one was actually taking any. No one had actually smoked at all in the ashtray. The ashtray looked like no one had used it. Amber had claimed she wanted the charity payments to be done in full, but now in this testimony claims that she was paying it in installment. Suddenly, she doesn't recall any of these prior statements. She denies constantly bringing up the charity thing in the media, so they play evidence of her bringing it up constantly in the media. She says that the first year was magic when she was with Johnny and that he was sober, but she is now already trying to walk back this statement. She says that she gave the knife to Johnny during the time after he had allegedly started abusing her, so it's a big scary knife, why would you give it to your abuser? She says her phone was smashed, but she also says that it's conveniently not in the pictures that Ben King showed, the pictures that he had taken off his property the night that the finger thing happened. She also claims that there was a wall-mounted heavy antique phone, but it wasn't in any of the pictures in the bar. She claims that all of this is because of the angles that the picture was taken at. She also says this is my best guess that his finger came off in this way, when he bashed the phone. And Amber is... You know how before Amber had mentioned that Johnny had grabbed her neck and then smashed a bottle? So Camille is basically trying to say you need to talk about the time, the time frame. Like was he holding your neck and smashing a bottle at the same time? Did he smash the bottle first and grab your neck? Afterwards, what's going on? And she won't commit at all to what order these events happened in. She then walks everything back and she realizes that she looks slimy as fuck. She then claims that she has never ever made any timeline of events. But the way that we all speak, we kind of naturally do that. She says, 
this happened and then this happened and then this happened when she was doing her testimony. That's a timeline. At some point he's on top of me and there's no phone. That that's a that's a timeline. Amber then denies the timeline when it's written down. She also starts walking back how Johnny wears his rings so often, again, and she says that she never sought medical treatment for any of these things, yet Dr. Pepper saw Dr. Kipper, I actually called him Dr. Pepper, oh my god, said that he had looked at her the next day and there was nothing wrong with her. None of the people the days after the bruises and the rapes happened said there was anything wrong with her, and Amber is desperately trying to walk all of these claims back to make her have the slightest bit of credibility. It's not working. She says that she didn't take any of the pictures of the injuries because, she, you know, she didn't think of it at the time, and she dodges the questions about why. When Johnny had walked around his apartment writing with his bloody finger, there were specifically red lipstick replies to the things that he had written. Now, this is very bad because it essentially makes it sound like while Johnny was in shock and bleeding and going mental, instead of helping him, Amber was going around finding what he had written on the walls and mirrors and writing messages back to him and having a bit of a laugh. This makes her look incredibly bad. Specifically, it's a bit strange because she's denying that the lipstick responses were from her, yet it kind of matches her handwriting a little bit and it's kind of strange that Johnny would reply to himself in this kind of manner and then apparently be upset with certain things that he had then replied to himself with. It, it's just a bit strange. Amber keeps interrupting to try and explain some bullshit and not answering the question. She also lies that she doesn't recognize the texts from her and Dr. Cohen. Karen just kind of stalls the entire time. She's constantly objecting and not getting anywhere. And she also says that she has mic issues every single time she tries to say something. The mic issues never happen again. They specifically have Happen when Amber is being cross-examined and then never happen again. That's a bit strange. Amber claimed that Johnny Jupp tried to attack her and Whitney after his finger was starting to suffer from the flesh-eating infection. Debbie Lloyd apparently was there, but she never testified that this happened. Why would Amber bring in a witness and name the witness when the witness never said that any of this stuff happened. Amber also testifies that Io, the LGBT trans man friend, was lying for Johnny Depp during his deposition, even though he's clearly lying for Amber when they actually play the deposition later. They pull up Amber's 2015 letter to Johnny in a love journal that they had. It was a journal that both of them took turns writing and writing love letters to each other. They look at Amber's last letter in the journal. She wrote about how she had fucked him up and she can get crazy and she's sorry. The therapist said that Amber cut herself as a teen, but now Amber says that she only felt like she had cut herself but she didn't actually want to do it. She also claims that the nose picture where Depp's nose is clearly broken and he's clearly injured in some way is photoshopped. All the notes that Amber writes look suspiciously like the mirror writing, I'm just saying that. The notes also seem to contradict some of the shit that she has said during the testimony and there's definitely an apologetic vibe in this book. She claims that Johnny one time broke the bed with his boots. He was kicking it and stepping on it and stomped on the bed and there's like a break. But the break looks way more like someone was hacking at it with a pocket knife. There's even some experts in woodworking and whatnot who have talked about how this looks like a knife and not like a boot. There's also a knife in the picture. There's also a photo shoot weeks later and uh, there's no bruises. Her testimony is that everyone else who was testifying was lying about their testimonies to protect Johnny. She even tries to gaslight the jury of what they heard in the recording. Not a good look, Amber. Next, they nail her down on her lying about not drinking or doing any drugs that much when she clearly was doing drugs. They pull up a wedding schedule. Even though it's a draft, Amber in the draft still wrote that they were gonna do drugs, so she was intending for them to do drugs. Even if they didn't actually, you know, have it written down in the official schedule, she at some point had written that she wanted them to do drugs. So. Whatever she's saying here is irrelevant. But during this timeline, Johnny was struggling with his detox and his drug issues. So it's kind of mean for her to have drugs around him all the time when she knows he's struggling with it. She also claimed that Johnny had assaulted her during her 30th birthday. And Camille says that Amber has never brought it up before. It's a bit strange. Amber says that she has brought it up before, but there's evidence that she has not. She also tries to gaslight everyone in the room when she's yelling in her recordings. <laughs> she also suddenly changes her testimony to say that he does drugs in front of his children. 
They pull up what appears to be a bruised photo shoot the day of the domestic violence court stuff. So she and her sister rocked up to court to try and get some restraining orders and all that sort of stuff that, that day. And uh, they, they had a little photo shoot afterwards of them looking really sad and taking pictures of themselves looking beaten up. Amber tries to say that she did not publish the op-ed, but still says that in this tweet that she did publish it. So uh, she also claims that she never noticed the title, so it wasn't her fault. Camille then pulls up that Johnny Depp being an abuser was trending after the op-ed and Amber claims that every negative article against her and every negative incident that proves that Johnny's correct is all a PR team that is being paid by Johnny to be do defamation things. They pull up some audio from in a recording that impeaches Amber and Karen tries so hard to object to it. <laughs> Amber in the recording is super disrespectful and just kind of eating while she's apparently talking about how traumatized she is for things. She's trying so hard. She also got caught saying that she had basically known that something had been leaked to TMZ and she had been part of leaking it to TMZ so that she could, you know, be able to pose and get pictures of bruises and things. And in the recording, she is she shuts herself up and she's like, oh shit, but that's in, that's in evidence now. So, after this brutal cross-examination, we then get a redirect where Karen tries to softball some questions and it, she can't recover from this. Karen basically just lets her waffle on making excuses and she claims that they saw each other after the divorce and Johnny would kiss her hand and write her notes about love and it was still in love with her. They then try to add in a note but Vasquez doesn't let it get in so I have to wonder what type of note it is. She also tries to bullshit that she didn't think to take any photos besides the ones that she did take because she just, you know, wasn't thinking about that at the time. Karen keeps making some leading questions and Vasquez is on the case. Karen gets really flustered from this and starts getting mad. Amber also says that she's putting off surgery for her broken nose even though this is like years ago now and apparently she had trouble breathing every night so I mean why wouldn't she seek any sort of medical issues earlier? She'll come back for the rebuttal. We're not done with it yet. Up next we get Amber's witnesses. These are experts that Amber's team are calling in and Amber's friends. We first have I I O till Hi Ho Silver. Amber's friend who was before mentioned is apparently having some bigoted statements thrown at him, I don't know. The thing that's immediately interesting to me is that he looks confused at his own statements. He's also trying really hard to say nothing. I mean, he's not exactly defending Johnny, but he's not exactly doing anything super good for Amber's case. He also claims that Johnny is a misogynist when he takes drugs. Johnny had also offered him drugs to get through a nasty breakup. He says, well, this isn't Amber's preferred drug, which implies that she does have a preferred drug, yet says that she doesn't have a preferred drug because she doesn't really take drugs. Right. There's also no reason to go into all of these, like, apparently the bar that the finger incident occurred at was a full stocked bar, even though he then mentions that it only had whiskey and some wine that's not a full bar. And there's so many things up here say, like, he says that the glass is a large pour, but it doesn't specifically say how big the glasses are. He only says that the glass was full. He uses a lot of vague words and doesn't really answer when he needs to, especially because he's here to help Amber. It would help him if these events were true, to go in really in depth in what he means, what happened, the details, but this is a trend with her friends. They say a lot of vague type of things. They look annoyed to be there when someone tries to question them to get more details out of them. It should help her case to get more details out, but they seem very angry when you try and question them on certain things. He also says that all of these pictures that we've been shown are very accurate to severe bruising. He gets really testy with the cross-examination. He also says that he never saw Johnny get violent, but then says he's seen him throw dishes and doesn't know the dates of anything, there's nothing specific. He also contradicts himself in the same testimony and says that Johnny didn't get violent when he smoked, but then says that he does. Next up is Rocky Pennington, another friend who basically does the same thing. She can talk for a long time and not really say anything. Rocky even says that she won't say why she's not best friends with Amber anymore, but also says that she's not not a friend. It's confusing. Rocky takes so fucking long to respond to everything and says that Amber had small cuts on her feet and long cuts on her arms, but Rocky wasn't there. She only heard it from Amber, so why is she testifying as if she saw this in person? She also keeps acting like the lawyers need to refresh her memory on everything when that's her job. She doesn't even remember taking the dumbass photo that's being used in court. She says a bloody scalp 
was what happened when Amber's hair got pulled out, and there's no blood in the photo, so I don't know how she can say that this is evidence. She also says that she was shown all of these bruises and the missing hair that seemed really severe, and yet the photos are all wildly different than what was described. And especially since Rocky did take some of the pictures, why didn't she take some of the pictures that showed more severe injuries if she witnessed seeing these injuries in person? How do you so easily forget broken glass and horrible injuries and broken furniture? She seems not to remember anything when it's convenient. She also switches up words and starts crying when she's being soft-walled by the defense team. She's all cold and stone-faced and then when the plaintiffs are talking to her, but as soon as these guys are, she's just crying. She says that she put her hands on Johnny's chest to stop him yelling or some shit, and she keeps acting like Johnny was being violent, but there's no actual violence in anything that she witnessed. She is careful to try and make shit sound violent, but in this case, she was the one who touched him and pushed him before he even did anything wrong. After this, we have Josh Drew, who's a really boring video deposition. He does say that he doesn't recall or see anything that happened either so we can't back them up. They then have a damages expert to try and counter the claims made by Richard Marks and Doug Bania and all those other people. Their damages expert says that Johnny can't count Pirate 6 as something that he claims damages for because it hasn't happened yet, and then immediately goes to say that Amber can count Aquaman 2 as damages even though that hasn't happened yet. To Mr. Walman. Is that correct? Well, now we also look at the timeline because those those campaigns were not active prior to the Waldman statements and then they started appearing, so there is some connectivity there as well. Mr. Depp bears no responsibility for, for the social media campaigns. He doesn't... If the social media campaigns caused Ms. Heard to lose her ability to generate income, that's not the Waldman statement, okay. that's a social- She has a really shaky answer about the timeline of how Amber had a decline in popularity and money, but also did not take into account what happened beforehand. Now, the incident that they're talking about here is something called the Walden Statements. Now, there was a lawyer involved with Johnny, his name was Adam Waldman, and initially I think he was involved more with the UK trial and stuff, but he is not with them in this trial. And the reason that they're bringing him up is because he went to the media and made a couple statements. The statements were saying things like, you know, Amber's an abuser, blah, 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 blah. They're trying to basically counter the defamation claim and say that it was in fact Amber who was defamed because this lawyer went to the media and said some statements that then apparently caused Amber's career to spiral. So this is what the damages expert is trying to bring up here. However, she admits that she did not check what trajectory Amber's career was in before the statements were made. So how can she say that she knows that these statements are a direct cause of Amber's career going to the dogs? She also claims that she didn't see any tweets that said mean things, but then claims that she does. She also refuses to acknowledge that the hashtags that she claims are ab abusive to Amber because, you know, people on Twitter were being mean, doesn't have anything from the Walden statements. Like, no one cares about them. I didn't even know about these statements before I started researching this. It doesn't seem like any other, anyone else cares. These are all hashtags that mention the 2016 allegations and stuff that Amber was caught doing, and Walden didn't say any of these things. There's basically no evidence to what she's saying. She also brings up timelines, even though she doesn't want to use timelines for her evidence and analysis. She also then starts getting super snippy and talks over the lawyer because he's trying to call her out during the cross-examination. Stopped was at the same time that those def defamatory statements came out. So, But there was a lot of other activity that happened following the defamatory statements. You said every time Mr. Depp files a lawsuit, it ignites the fire around the both of them. Right? No, I actually said it, it ignites the fire mostly around Mr. Depp. That was no, in well, context. That was, excuse me, please. I'm sorry. That was in context. He even brings up the Amber Turd incident being one of the major hashtags. And I keep saying Walden, his name is Waldman. Waldman didn't say anything about that. So like that hashtag wasn't called by, caused by him. He didn't make statements to the media about this. Amber basically confirmed that she wasn't contractually oblig obligated to appear in Aquaman 2. Johnny would have been for pirates because he is the main character of the series. He has been impacted and defamed from this and was dropped from something that he was contractually obligated to appear in. Amber's expert admitted that she didn't look at some of Amber's contracts 
even though her job is to assess Amber's contracts and her career. The plaintiffs briefly have a hand surgeon after this, uh, explaining that he treated the hand after the finger thing. To summarize, Depp was pretty fucked up. So after this, we have a really, really important thing. We have Whitney Heard, Amber's sister. Amber's sister, who, through some testimony we've seen, has been abused by Amber, so I don't know why she's lying on Amber's behalf, but here she is. She is immediately trying to paint the picture that Johnny would be violent on substances, and there was a cycle of sobriety and abuse. Also, Amber was getting depressed and looked different. She says that Johnny was overtly protective and controlled what Amber wore. Again, there's no specifics, but generalizations. Repeating the same shit over and over, she says that Amber had no friends in reach, yet she had friends living next door in their penthouse apartment. Friends including Rocky and I.O. Hi-Ho Silver, who were both lying for her in this trial. Whitney makes it sound like Johnny forced a nurse and medication on Amber. As if Amber didn't want a nurse and medication herself and Dr. Kipper is being controlled by Johnny to abuse Amber. It's a weird conspiracy thing. Whitney has done substances with him, but she had previously claimed that he turns into a violent, horrible person on substances, so why would she do coke with him? She says that he often got super mean on alcohol, and there's still no violence in these claims. She would say he got violent, but when she was asked to go into specifics, she would specifically not mention violence. She also can't name any specific scenarios until Karen tries to direct her to in the softball questioning. Whitney also says that she recalls observing injuries, but says that they were never focused on the injuries or to get medical attention, because they were dealing with other shit at the time and it wasn't appropriate. They go back to the dog story of Johnny holding the dog out the window, and, and there was also a joke about putting the dog in a microwave. There's no evidence of this incident, but there's evidence of Amber doing these things. She's also trying to pass off a lot of what she was told as evidence or testimony when she can't give the testimony herself. Now, if you'll recall, one of the incidents was a red bull can. There was a big emphasis on this because it was thrown, the Red Bull can was thrown at somebody's chest and a lot of emphasis was put on it, yet now, apparently it was barely noticeable. The entire story is just different and in this story, Travis, one of the security guards who witnessed the event, apparently had to pull them apart and Johnny was yelling and trashing everything and completely destroying everything when Travis definitely did not testify to that. She also says that Amber was punched in the face by Johnny during this incident repeatedly. Amber never testified to this herself, ever, for this incident. Whitney is just making this shit up. And it's particularly interesting because she's lying to condemn an innocent man even though he paid for her apartment to live in. He was so generous to her and he didn't do anything wrong yet she's here yeah, lying for someone who abuses her. It's sad. During the cross-examination, they bring up arguments between Amber and her and how she said she wanted to run away from Amber sometimes for days. Metaphorically. Um, but yes, I have, I have been in arguments with my sister. And you have wanted to run away for days, right? Sure. And not have her there fighting with you. Sure. You talked a little bit about the incident in March 2013, right? Which one? That was the one before um, you went to the Keith Richards yes. documentary set? And you were present with Mr. Depp at Orange that day? I was. Um, didn't you do cocaine with Mr. Depp that afternoon? Yes. And you said Mr. Depp's already intoxicated? He was by the time I got there. And he was fighting with your sister? He wasn't doing much of anything. He was sat at the table. He was telling me about the fight that they had. So, so he was been kind fighting. of He'd been fighting with your sister that day when you arrived. That was my understanding. And you said she had a puffy face. Yes. And despite all of that, you decided it was a good idea to do mis cocaine with Mr. Depp at that juncture? I hadn't yet connected the dots. I hadn't yet understood what that meant. Whitney has also done coke with Johnny, even though she had walked in on and apparently seen Amber's swollen face and incidents where Johnny was punching Amber. And Johnny had apparently admitted this to her when he was drunk, so why would she do substances with him? She also says that she had become aware of the abuse at the time, but was making jokes with Johnny over text about hitting Amber, so... 
Why would she do that when it's clearly not appropriate? After the Red Bull incident, she continued to stay close friends with Johnny, even though apparently he's a horrible abuser. In her text messages, it also implies that there's no abuse. Next up, we have Elizabeth, who says that Johnny was more sloppy than competitive and then says the opposite a minute later. She isn't even taking it seriously. She just keeps smirking. She says Amber's right side of her face was swollen, yet Amber was icing her face before the cops arrived and Elizabeth seems to not remember the ice or who gave her the ice and where the ice went afterwards. There's no details about the ice. She straight up doesn't remember anything. She keeps walking back random statements because she's so transparently lying. So the details get all mixed up and she doesn't make up shit fast enough, I guess. She has to read her own deposition to get her details right again. Th then there was one time where she said she was scared and she ran out of the apartment to hide and there was this whole thing about that. What's going on? She also says the frame on the bed was broken, It, but it, it isn't in a picture. Sure. So, I don't know. They then go on to Amber's makeup artist. She uh, doesn't say anything interesting. There's like some boring shit. They get like a band member and then they get, you know, random agents and things who have nothing to say. And they clearly don't really like Johnny because they bring up shit that they don't like him and they don't have any information. So they bring up this guy who analyzes tweets and he is basically here to counter the forensic digital analyst people. He says that the Waldman statements made the media and Twitter pile millions and millions of me mean tweets onto Amber. He also says that he selected 2,000 of them at random and they were all mean tweets. Also, when you use a hashtag, it counts towards the hashtag's numbers of how many people are using it, but it doesn't mean you agree with the hashtag. The hashtag could have someone saying, I disagree with this hashtag, it's shitty or whatever. So he doesn't address that either. There are more hashtags like justice for Johnny and in comparison, almost none of the negative Amber ones even have any big numbers because the justice for Johnny ones are the really big popular hashtags. He also didn't take the court case into account. He also contradicts himself saying that he looked at more than 2,000 tweets when he said that he looked at 2,000. Afterwards, there's Erin who basically says nothing interesting. They also have a doctor who they're basically trying to show is saying that Johnny is lying about his finger, yet the doctor admits that they had a telephone con consultation and he did not ever see Johnny's finger in person. He only saw pictures and read the reports. How the hell is this guy reliable at all? He also is one of those people who can't answer anything without looking at his stupid notes. There's also Eric George, a lawyer that reviewed the op-ed before publication. His entire thing is, it isn't defamation because I'm a lawyer and I say it's not defamation. So he does nothing as well. <laughs> All right, so this guy's name is Dick Salt and he's the one in the, the, the hand doctors. He has not seen Johnny's finger, just pictures of the finger. When Camille Vasquez cross-examines him, she immediately points this out and the guy is wrong about everything. He's wrong about the position that Johnny's hand was in because Johnny's fingers were hanging off of the counter when this happened and this guy thinks that Johnny's hands were flat on the counter, so showing that he doesn't know what the fuck's going on. He also suddenly starts walking back everything he's saying and can't recall specifics. He also earns a thousand dollars per hour during the depositions, And he knows these guys, he's worked with Team Turd before, so he's on the payroll. He's not even aware of half of the information he apparently read. When it's read back to him, he's like, well, I don't know. So we have David Spiegel, who is on meth. This man is fucking mental. He looks high. He looks like he's on crack and suffering from the palsy at the same time. Why are you shaking, dude? Is there an earthquake? What the fuck are you doing? Many other cognitive functions are gonna follow. You're going to be impaired attention, concentrate off to kind of get to the point of the question, which happened throughout most of the deposition. Um, and so you could see there that there was obviously some form of cognitive issue that should not be happening in someone in their mid fifties. I think probably due to the alcohol and substances. What if any observations did you make about impulse control? So, the deposition? Or, yes, or, okay. and, or any and other, other record evidence e either. Um, so... He starts talking about abusers and everything he says can be applied to Amber, honestly. But then he goes on to say that he doesn't have any fucking experience, especially compared to Dr. Shannon Curry, yet he acts like he's superior to her. Is he high? What is he doing? 
This guy basically does the same thing that Don Hughes did, and he does fuck all. He rambles so much, I don't know if he answers the question. I don't know what he's saying. He also has never met Johnny Depp, and he's rambling about substance abuse and not like anything, anything about Johnny in, in general. He, he talks like a fucking goblin. And they start throwing the book at him, basically. They start saying that it, it says in, in the organization that he is a part of, one of their rules is it is unethical to, to do an examination of anyone without a personal meeting. This guy is on the board for this and he doesn't know this? He argues that he doesn't have to follow the rules of his own association. He also doesn't want to comply with the association. Judging Excuse yours me? right now, you're judging mine. We all judge processing speed as a baseline because of what we know about each other, I would say your process speed right now is not slow. So, Thank I you. mean, we're judging processing speed, I'm just saying to you. Yeah. Um, so, but no, any of Mr. Depp's other portrayals in movies, did that affect your analysis of processing speed? Only I've seen him interact w on interviews, right. and that was it. Right. When he wasn't in movies. What, right. But Willy Wonka doesn't matter to you? You, you see him in that movie, Charlie and Chocolate Factory? Did you look at that one when you were comparing his processing speed? Is, is that, do I have to answer that question, Your Honor? You have to answer questions, yes, sir. No, you'll be happy to know I didn't see Willy Wonka as a- Please answer the question, please, I'm dying. He keeps basically diagnosing Johnny and then claims that he isn't diagnosing Johnny. He also keeps going on about trait clusters. But how would he know about Johnny's trait clusters professionally without seeing him? He doesn't even know the rules of the organizations that he's a part of. The professional opinions you rendered were um, inconsistent with the Goldwater rule. Yeah, my first was inconsistent. If we're saying that I, if the Goldwater rule says, and I very much said that during deposition, that the Goldwater rule was made for presidents and public figures such as that but regardless of that because that's what it was made for it's not made for hollywood but i'll even take that mr depp's a public figure what i'm saying to you is that the goldwater rules say we cannot do any expert witness testimony in our field that is exactly what the goldwater rule is saying based on exactly what you read and i'm just telling you what you are saying that rule encompasses what i'm asking you sir is did you comply with the ethical requirements of the APA when refer when rendering the professional opinions that you've rendered today it is a it is a requirement and he used movies to diagnose Johnny he just said that he watched the Pirates of the Caribbean movies to diagnose Johnny does he know what acting is? He calls Johnny an idiot, and then he says that he examined Johnny on the court footage. And if he is examining Johnny during court footage, he should know how important it is to just not go around calling people idiots during court footage and acting like a meth head. He also admits he has no idea what state Johnny was in during these cognitive tests, so he has no idea about anything. He doesn't know anything, he just admitted it. He talks so fucking fast, but he just admitted he isn't saying anything. He also asks the same question several times to get an answer and forgets what he said. During the redirect, it's constantly getting objected to because this guy is just mental and Karen has no idea what to do. They call out Johnny for doodling and eating candy during the trial. What's wrong with that exactly? So, we continue. The plaintiffs then have their own counter witnesses on. They're basically like uh, experts that are revisited to debunk what Amber's witnesses have said. Experts and whatnot. Plaintiffs then have a hand surgeon on to briefly talk about how he treated Johnny's finger. To summarize, Johnny was pretty fucked up. Whitney had said that he punched Amber repeatedly, but this time frame was during when Johnny could not even make a fist because of the cast around his hand because of his finger and how much pain he was in. They have the producer Richard Marks back on and he debunks everything the damages lady said because the contracts that she had were the things that got her taken out of these movies. She wasn't in Aquaman 2 because before any of this happened, they had decided that she wasn't really good in Aquaman. They didn't want her in Aquaman 2, they wanted someone else, so they were gonna drop her anyway. During Cross, 
team turd is like, well, you're not offering any other figures, so she, you can't say that her figures were wrong because you don't have your own figures. Doug Bania, the internet expert, also the debunks the expert that they had. Bania has some demonstratives, which are proof, basically. He shows that Amber has the lowest interest in the public, way lower than any other actresses, so her career wouldn't have really taken off anyway because no one likes her. During the cross-examination for Bania, they say that he's not using enough things like spaces between words and whatnot, and he he's not a damages expert. Team Turd basically tries to make it about online bullying campaigns and completely ignore the entire reason that they brought the damages expert in being about the lawyer's statements. They just don't care about that shit now. They bring in a psychiatrist to debunk the crazy crackhead and he does a pretty good job. There's also Shannon, who appears again, to debunk some of what Donna Hughes said. She confirms that the, the tests that Hughes used were simply checklists for symptoms and not any examination type stuff. She also left shit blank on the CAPS test and only two out of the 12 tests she performed were even remotely relevant during this examination. So Hughes gave Amber a checklist of PTSD symptoms, which is basically allowing Amber to just fake PTSD by checking off everything and saying she had all of these symptoms. And she was not having to talk about this stuff in specifics on her own. She also did the same thing for the abuse and the violence text. The cross-examination is about the dinner that she had with the lawyers. Johnny had only seen the Waldman statements when they were brought up as evidence in the trial, so he had no idea what this lawyer had been going around saying. It's not his fault he wasn't putting the words in the lawyer's mouth. He also confirms that Amber didn't entirely get the Aquaman gig on her own. Johnny had actually went to talk to those people in Warner Bros to get that to happen. He testifies that Whitney was also abused by Amber, so it's very sad to see how she lied on the stand. During cross-examination, I get the feeling that Rottenborn knows this is the very last time that he'll get to cross-examine Johnny. He knows that he's in a really, really bad place with this this court stuff. He's not winning, so he's incredibly nasty and weird to Johnny. And none of the stuff that he's saying proves anything of value. He's like, do you actually have a black eye in this picture? And tries to pass off other pictures as like being photoshopped and shit. I don't know. There's no foundation to any of these. He doesn't even let Johnny answer any of these things as well. Also, the train company took this picture and photoshopped Johnny to make him look like he wasn't injured, which is something that I can understand that companies would do because they wouldn't want to make it look like he was injured on their train trip. And even after this photoshop, the bruise is still on his face because they couldn't photoshop it out. That's how big the bruise was. And if anything, pointing this out shows how much Johnny was hurt during this trip. So Rottenborn did the opposite of what he wanted. He also brings up how Johnny was in pain and rambling about drugs as if he was actually wanting people to bring him drugs. We've gone over this before, but it was brought up again. Rottenborn also got testimony that he was trying to bring up as impeachment wrong. He tries to pass off the wall-mounted telephone thing as Johnny lying. Johnny didn't lie that the phone didn't exist. He said that the wall-mounted phone was a plastic modern phone, whereas Amber said it was a heavy antique phone that didn't work. Johnny was simply correcting her. He did not say that, that it wasn't there definitively. He just said that it wasn't that type of phone and he didn't remember because he was in shock at the time. They take a quote from an interview about how he was angry at the paparazzi as him being violent. And then Rottenborn just ha makes up some quotes. There's some texts and Johnny says that they're fake texts and they... I don't know what's going on with these texts. There's some weird ass poetic shit that he didn't write and a lot of redacted info, so I don't know what the context of this is. Rottenborn tries to make it sound like Johnny was making his assistants apologize to Amber because he abused her and he didn't want to apologize to her face when, as part of his testimony, Johnny had left the room and he was trying to do everything possible to placate her. So again, this doesn't contradict anything he was saying. After the divorce and the allegations came out, Johnny was talking to someone who doesn't work for Warner Brothers and just venting about Amber and Rottenborn is using this as him trying to get Amber fired. He's talking to his own sister and Rottenborn's like, you were trying to get Amber fired by texting your sister 
somehow that makes sense. It's just a roast text message, like calm down, man. There's the redirect where he is able to clarify that the UK trial was not televised and now this one is televised, so he's finally able to tell the truth. He also clarifies that Amber was a topic of contention because she was in some controversy over the allegations and Johnny felt responsible for getting her into Warner Brothers and putting Warner Brothers into this kind of position. That's all he was saying. They next have this TMZ guy. He was talking about how he got tips for gossip and the testimony and whatnot. They were trying to get a shot of the bruises on her face in a picture and a tip in 2016 had come from a news producer about Amber. Somehow the news producer had known that Amber was leaving a building and she had bruises on her face and TMZ would know to show up at this time to get these bruised pictures. So how would the news producer know about these things unless it came from someone on Amber's team? Karen keeps objecting to shit that he, she thinks he's gonna say. That's not how that works. So he continues to say that they got the leaks as a TMZ exclusive. You know how there was that video before where Amber was sniggering and she was trying to goad Johnny on camera? That video was leaked to them somehow and the ending part was cut off. So this guy says that the first time he's even seen the full context of that video and the part where Amber is giggling at the end was today. He has never seen that before. So they were somehow handed a video that had context cut out of it and presented as if it was a full video that they then had exclusive rights to. And they were tipped off at when Amber was leaving her apartment so that when Amber was going out and had her bruises on full display so they could take pictures of it. During the cross-examination, Karen argues that the only reason the TMZ man is here is because he wants to get fame, to which he turns it around on her and says that she's only here <laughs> because she wants fame from Amber's case. The plaintiffs then have a forensic digital analyst man as an expert. He shows that the photos that Amber took of her bruises were in fact edited. They were moved into an editing software and then the photo size file was bigger than it was when it was brought in, so clearly some changes were made. They also have evidence for all of these. During the cross-examination, however, Karen just goes on and on about how he's he's not actually qualified or some shit, and they pull up photos and were like, these random photos I just pulled up aren't photoshopped, so your other ones as well, they're not photoshopped. They then have a very important and brief, devastating witness, Beverly Leonard. She is a cop who pulled Amber up for lesbian domestic violence all those years ago. During this time, she had said Amber was drunk in the airport, and the wife, who was taller than her, was basically stoic and just trying to defend herself while Amber was assaulting her. When the cop stepped in, Amber was angry and dismissive. Karen then says during cross-examination that you're gonna get your 15 minutes of fame. This happened in 2009, it's not even relevant. We then have the finger surgeon back on. He shows and explains in the x-rays of the finger that the bone had shattered and explains how the bottle shattered the finger. He also explains how the bottle is specifically what caused it because a knife would not have done this. He basically debunks the other so-called experts who hadn't even seen the finger firsthand. The cross-examination is th that he's on the payroll. They then try to impeach him for saying that the finger injury couldn't come from the phone or something. Amber had implied that the injury came from the phone, so Riches were just doing his job to rule that out. I don't know how this is impeachment exactly. They have another forensic digital analyst, and he, like all the other experts on Team Turd, have worked with these guys before and is directly on their payroll. His entire argument comes crashing down during the cross-examination as well, and he can't even answer the questions. Oh no, they, they, brought, they brought Dr. Hughes back. All she does is waffle on. All she does, like there is nothing of value. During her cross-examination, she admits that she didn't read the manual that says that she needed to diagnose people a certain way using the CAPS-5. She gets really snippy when she's caught out, and he also points out that she didn't administer the test right and didn't follow the manual. Which is interesting because you remember how I told you about the manual, you need to remember that? Her entire argument before was that the manual told her to do the things she did, but now she admits that she didn't read them. Also, something that was not brought up enough, and I'm actually really disappointed, is that she said that the test was somewhat collaborative. I- that is never caught, and like, she's never asked to explain what that means, but I think that that's incredibly suspicious because somewhat collaborative implies that Amber wasn't answering all of these things on her own. Does that mean that this therapist lady helped Amber answer the questions? 
that's never brought up again and I, I'm fixated on this, like that sounds really fishy. Anyway, after all of this, Amber is then brought on as a rebuttal. She turns on the waterworks even more, I guess her PR team told her to do that, and she comes out with more sub-stories about how she's being bullied by the media. She claims she has panic attacks nightly and wakes up screaming. She also claims that she wasn't smirking in court, but she totally was, and she turns off the waterworks as soon as she has to listen to the judge. She's like, oh, I'm crying, no, I'm not. <laughs> she also continues to fail at shedding tears, but she's really trying, guys. As soon as she's like, stop talking, she's just stone-faced again as well. It's quite creepy. Camille Vasquez comes on to do a cross-examination, immediately roasting Amber. This is one of the most entertaining things I've ever seen in my life. You've seen this photograph as well, right? I have. On the third day of your direct testimony, you testified that this photograph reflected spilled wine in Penthouse 5 on May 21st, 2016, didn't you? I, again, I don't know because I'm looking at a partial picture of a floor, so unless you remove the metadata you've covered up, we could then tell. If you I didn't remove, cover it up, Your Honor. Could I, we unredact them Honor, so we could get context? That's, that's how it's in evidence. That's how it's right. in evidence. Next. Question. Well, the metadata next to it is so that Ms. Heard, to avoid this Ms. Sort of Heard, confusion. there is no question pending, and I would appreciate it if you wouldn't be making argument to the jury. Sorry, it's I thought you had asked me about it. No, I didn't ask you about anything. Amber says that all of the witnesses are just people who want to be famous and are being paid by Johnny Depp. Camille then proves that Amber knew TMZ would be there to take photos of the bruises and she did not wear makeup that day. Everyone is lying but me. There's also a picture from the next day of her with no bruises and no makeup. Amber then gets caught in a lie, testifying that this same picture was actually from two different occasions. And Camille specifically caught her out on it and then told her to shut up <laughs> because she got caught out. Amber continues saying that everyone is lying because powerful men in the patriarchy are trying to stamp out women's voices or something. Everyone's out together. As you've noticed, I started explaining every single testimony very, very carefully. But as time went on, there's a lot of repetitious stuff. So I've just kind of been talking as best I can with, you know, trying to keep things as, as clarified as possible. I don't want to repeat things too much. So... This was kind of a long testimony, but there's not much involved because Amber knows that she's done. She was just ranting and trying her best to steamroll the people who were questioning her, but she can't do anything. So that's really all there is to it. At last, we get to the closing statements. Now, the closing statements don't have anything new, so I won't really spend a lot of time on them, but there are some key things to mention. Firstly, Rottenborn returns to saying that all of this is specifically about the First Amendment even though that wasn't really brought up at all. This was something that he, he kind of didn't bring it up during court. I forgot when I was writing my notes, I forgot that this was even about the First Amendment. And then when he brought it up during his closing statement, I went back through my notes and I was like, holy shit, he didn't even bring this up. Karen is genuinely somehow like she, she's taking this personally she's really vile towards johnny she even says stuff like this man has never taken responsibility for anything in his life and she's like jabbing her finger at him she's taking this personally Some, something's going on with her in this concept of a hoax for the defamation that he has committed that you have heard so much about that just took wildfire and went off into negative media and has made amber's life pure hell up to this day we're asking you to do that, to compensate her, to, to be fair and hold him responsible so he stops. We don't want another lawsuit. We don't want anything else. We want to leave Amber alone and let her get on with her life and raise her child. So let's talk about the counterclaim for a moment. These are Adam There's like some rebuttals afterwards. Of course, the rebuttals from Turd's team are actually very short because they don't have anything to say. But afterwards, the jury gets up and it's time to make the decision. Wow, Amber fails hard. <laughs> the stuff that you were thinking about how she was lying, the jury were thinking that too. And they saw past all of the bullshit. Finally, the actual truth came out. Now, it doesn't just end there. 
Because yes, some of the internet may have forgotten about this, but Amber's lawyers, despite the fact that they just lost a defamation trial, then went on to media interviews and continued to say that Amber was an abuse victim and Johnny was the abuser, despite the fact that the entire defamation trial was about this and they lost. So that's kind of interesting. Now, I guess there's some other things that could be said in the future. I mean, it's still kind of ongoing. The entire trial happened about four months ago and the way that the law works, everything takes so slow that, you know, a million other things could happen in the future. But as of right now, I have to stop this video here because it needs to end at some point. I didn't really intend for the video to be this long, but at the back of my mind, I kind of thought that it must be because there were so many things to say. There were so many notes in this trial and especially because I think that it needs to have a certain type of impact when you talk about it. I could have split this video up into different parts, but I felt like it wouldn't have the same impact as it would if it was just all presented right now. Because yes, uh, probably the majority of you have, have broken the video into chunks to watch it and not watched it all at the same time, but it being in one video is very important because of the impact that it has and you've seen how passionate I am about this case and it needs to be shown that way. If you somehow watched this entire thing, the, the longest video that I've ever done, I don't know what words to say to really express how grateful I am for that and how and much it means to me that someone cares that much about me talking about something to listen for the entire time. Over the course of the rest of the year, during December and January, I actually have some stuff to do that are to do with family. It's okay, it's just family stuff, so I won't really be as active. Right now I'm not that active in general because I don't post super frequently, but I'll have a couple of videos prepared in advance so that I can release them, but other than that they might you know, things might slow down a bit and at the start of December, my shop will close. So I'll have all my Halloween stuff on the, sh on the shop, I'll have all of my happy mail will still go out even December and January. I'll be free to still send out mail for people who have, you know, Patreon tiers and stuff like that, who have the happy mail subscription tier, but I won't really be doing a lot of other things and I think I'll be like ready to be active again and open my shop around February. I'm not entirely sure an exact date, but uh, around that kind of time. Anyway, I've definitely taken way too much of your time, so I'm going to try and end this video here. Um, bye for now.